question about the amount of tax revenue gained from the sales of um, vapes or um, if you will, flavored tobaccos, fill in the blank, whichever choose. Um, do you have any idea what you collect in sales tax gain from those items of which you sell in a given year? Yes, I do. Um, I usually don't allow it on a public forum uh, of what- You don't have to give us a specific. If you would like to generalize it, that would be fine. So there's three things here. We need to separate cigarettes and tobacco and vape. Okay, they're really three separate categories and three separate things. In the cigarette revenue department, there's no way that the internet sales have access it. We have to stamp the product. And for that, I would say in general, um, we're talking about 400, probably 360 million a year combined in the state of Connecticut from cigarette revenue. Okay. That's specific, um, not the vape and the, okay. Uh, so, so I'm a good percentage of that. And what we do is we take a check, we write to the state of Connecticut, and then they give us these stamps that we have to put on to the actual mm -hmm. cigarettes. And what happens is you cannot sell in the state of Connecticut cigarettes unless those stamps are proper. Now, that doesn't mean there's illegality that people have found some ways to get around it. That exists today, which we've been screaming about for years about more regulation. I, I'm encouraging it. Um, I would say vape for me is, is very limited, okay? I sell maybe three different kinds from the main manufacturers. And, and it's kind of ironic. Today, when I walked in, I had someone email me or mail me a catalog of all the vape products, which I don't carry, that's allowed in New York, and it's highlighting for me to buy with flavors of cotton candy and flavors of, I was appalled by this, okay? This is something that is so unacceptable, and it defeats the problem of what we're doing here. In other words, this is how I believe that youth is getting access to this. And um, I asked my 14 and 17 year olds and I sat them down and I said, what's, what's the problems in schools? And they told me, dad, you can get marijuana like through gummies and they have one or two guys in school that can do it. You can get flavored alcohol, peppermint schnapps or you know, different types of beers and they grab them out of the cabinets, out of their liquor cabinets of their families and they get vape, which is a huge problem. Agree hundred percent about it. I said, where do you get it? They go online. And I've heard a lot of people saying that the retailers are the main focal point of having a, an elusive way of getting into the hands of 14 and 15 years old. Now we have, from what I was told, a 91% chance of carding, of accuracy. That doesn't mean there are some individuals in this state that, that do that. That doesn't mean there, there's 99 doctors are good, one doctor may be bad. It doesn't mean that we just say, you know, everyone is bad, whether it's a chain, whether it's an independent store. Um, but the cigarettes are probably the base of the actual revenue from the Connecticut. The vape there is um, based on how much liquids you have. And you have to understand there's different types of things. There's mm -hmm. closed systems and open systems. And these systems that are open are, to me, I think that can be a potential problem. They're just throwing them in. The systems that we buy are closed, which means you can't take the pods out. I would say that's probably, as far as the tax revenue, very little. I think tobacco is um, another revenue, but what we've seen in tobacco, which is Skoll, Copenhagen, cigars, mm -hmm. that is so highly illegal as we speak. They go to Pennsylvania called trunk slammers and they drive there in, in Pennsylvania, there's, let's say, a 1% tax, whereas the state of Connecticut has a 50% tax. They go in and they sell on the streets, whether it's Lucy dealers, whether it's anyone in, in the community, at 50 cents to the dollar. So the tax revenue in that particular aspect, we do not give a lot because that is so heavily illegal that you will not see it. So cigarettes are probably the most regulated with the most control in which I think the most revenue is generated. Um, and I think if you take menthol as part of that, you will lose between 130 and $150 million a year of, of actual revenue of that. And again, I, I'm not saying that that should be the focal point of what we're talking about today. I, no, I agree. absolutely not. It, was I think more... it has to come into the conversation that I'd rather take $150 million and put it to something that goes to youth initiation to education or 
put it into something that could help other people to do it. If you're going to just give up 150 million, might as well give it a try to do this and, and, and put the money where it really could go. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you that this is not about the money for me. It was more along the lines of a clarification and, and it sounded like you had a pretty good handle on that. So I thank you for your expertise on that information. I do find it very interesting that you're talking about the difference between the closed system and the open system. Um, I too have a couple of, well, now they're young adults. Um, and so, you know, 21 and 22 years old. And so obviously they are, have been in the thick of this system since they were in high school as well. Um, it, it troubles me to see the amount of kids that just, you know, anywhere and everywhere, it doesn't matter that this is just the thing that happens. And I think that, you know, a lot of kids don't often understand the the complications or the dangers that's in an open system as opposed to the closed system. I do agree with you that that is vitally important for us to look at. You said that you had um, some potential thoughts on how that this could be done a little bit of a better way. Are you interested in sharing any of that with us? Absolutely. So the first thing is, I think enforcement is also very helpful, okay? We have laws that we protected to be 21, which in hindsight, it's a good thing because you're, you're evening it out with alcohol, you're making the playing field there. Where's the controls consistently to stop the seven or 8% retailers where the youth say they can even get their product from, okay? So again, most people say that are coming on here saying that they, they, they're smoking at 13. Where did they get that product from, okay? This marketing, and I don't really wanna name the name of the company, is getting just marketed to me as, if it's getting to me, it's getting to anywhere else. The, the amount of the internet sales of illegal product from China, from Korea. In other words, you have to separate that there's some main manufacturers such as Reynolds and Philip Moores and ITG that whether you like them or not, they have been working with the federal government, with the PMTAs and trying to regulate the use of this. Okay, they didn't come up with bubblegum flavors. I don't sell any of that, none of that. I mean, I think that is really a, an important issue to be had. It's coming from such a demand that people are making it and the product is not safe and it is not regulated. So I think if we start, why are we allowing UPS and FedEx and all these people to allow to come into Connecticut and, and, and email and, and, use, and use that transportation system to come into this? Um, I, I think that, you know, there was another gentleman that gave a lot of other issues from a retail perspective of what they can do. Uh, I, I think in order to help this problem, okay, we really need to stop and think about what's causing it, okay? And I know people don't really understand that you have a system set up, but I am someone that, that is legitimate. I am here to be audited. I am here to have records. I can show you where every piece of tobacco is sold to every individual customer. OK, and they are also the ones that are being audited as well. So um, I think the Internet sales is, is a big thing to, to really focus on. I think education is a big thing, because if we're using the money to, to start off young, maybe the youth won't start smoking. Cigarettes have gone down. Um, I don't recall seeing that menthol is a direct derivative of people smoking, okay? Now let's be honest with you. Nicotine is probably a problem. It's Marlboro's, which is a non-flavored, or Newport's, which is a flavored, both have nicotine in it, okay? Does the menthol really make it more addictive? I, I don't think there's been factual proof based on that yet. Um, and, and that's a concern of mine because, you know, you're, you're, you're taking from bubblegum flavors from vape, which needs to be addressed, and then you're taking an adult smoker who is saying that, well, this nicotine is done. You know, and I'll make one other little point that I know people have said, the price structure in the state of Connecticut is regulated. So everyone in the state that I sell to has a formula that we have to sell. I cannot sell in a specific urban market lower in one price or in a nice higher upper class market that has more money at a different price. Those prices are all regulated the same. In fact, my physical price of, let's say, a menthol cigarette like that's popular at Newport is on higher than a Marlboro 
based on the manufacturer they give to me and then what we sell to them by law. So the state of Connecticut has a system set up in place for an equal playing field so that it isn't targeted to specific areas. So I thought that's something that people aren't really aware of and know. Um, look, I've been doing this since I was a little kid and I understand that what we sell is a product that is very questionable. I don't think it's any more questionable than alcohol or questionable than, than guns or questionable than marijuana or even having a lottery from the state of Connecticut that advertises on that. I think we all are in agreement that there's vices in society that exist. The problem is if we just focus on just one little aspect of one little vice, and say, this is how we can fix it. It didn't work for alcohol in the 1930s. Does it really gonna work if you abolish menthol and have to go to a different state? Now, if the federal government went and said, okay, we're gonna get rid of all of menthol, okay? Maybe you're gonna put all the states, all the businesses, all the kids on the playing field. You still will have some illegal aspects, but I think that you know it's different when you're taking a few states that are doing it and someone asked me, well, where's your data? Where's your proof? Massachusetts has not been successful. Forget about the monetary aspect of the hundreds of millions of dollars that they've lost. They have videos of surveillance of people selling on the streets illegal product, making $5,000 a day because New Hampshire's laws are probably maybe I don't know, 50% difference in the sales tax. So in other words, the state of Connecticut, it's $43 on average that we have on a, set, on a carton of cigarettes. You can buy in New Hampshire because their tax of Connecticut is different. So they drive to New Hampshire, buy it cheaper and come back, mm -hmm. they'll either use it for consumption and, and sell it. And the question comes down, are we helping as a public health, those people, are those people gonna leave Connecticut and, and go out and live in New Hampshire so that that liability comes back on us? And, and look, at, I've heard some extremely heartwarming scenarios from people. And I agree with them. It's awful to have your child start smoking. It is awful to have people die from this particular product. But this particular law, the way it's written, it needs to be, in my estimation, amended. It needs to have some people that understand both sides to make it enforceful and to make an impact so the youth doesn't continue to smoke and even start. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate your time and your information. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm sorry I was long winded. Thank That's you. Uh, no, I appreciate it. We're, we're going to move on to the next person, Representative Pettit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schoenfeld, for your testimony. You ventured a little bit into the last questioning with uh, Representative Cook, and you've been in this game a long time. Uh, I just wondered your per perspectives on the the Massachusetts experiment which has been going on eight months. You've commented on a little bit. Anything else to add in terms of what you've seen the impact of what Massachusetts has done just right next? Yeah, I think it's been a complete failure, failure. And I think we can back that up for some data. And the reason is you can measure the amount, first of all, that is done through the cigarette tax stamps. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when I purchase from the state of Connecticut, we buy the physical st stamps. I could like show you and show you what one looks like in a second. Once that happens, you will see that in Massachusetts that their tax stamps dropped significantly, but the bordering states, whether it was even in Connecticut, uh, New Hampshire, and uh, especially you know New Hampshire, it has gone beyond the expectation of what Massachusetts lost. So I think what you're seeing is that it may rise of an easier way because you've allowed people to maybe be inconvenient, but to be able to have that access. Um, so I think that has been, they have video, like I saw, I even saw it on channel eight of, uh, of people taking, you know, cigarettes and selling them in Lucy distributors. They sell them. Now, I don't know if everyone understands what those are, but you have Lucy's or when people go out on the street, they open up a pack of cigarettes and they sell them to individual people. Now, does that happen in convenience stores? I would say 91% no. That doesn't mean every convenience store might do it. But that's where the regulation comes in. They shouldn't. But the majority of them do it because they're buying from me and I can justify that through my revenue and through my sales. Um, so yeah, I see that Massachusetts has not worked. I think there are some other people that I could refer to to give you specific data on that, to specific data in relation to the menthol ban and 
to show that, you know, what, what's going to make that person really say, well, I gave up menthol, so I'm not going to smoke anything. If, if you take that choice away, are you assuming that person's just going to stop and quit? We've heard testimonies that people are addicted to a specific product and you don't want them to start. Well, if, they're, if the laws are 21, they're not going to start. And what you're seeing is a decrease in this. And you're seeing the main manufacturers have control and do things. The problem is it's coming from Massachusetts and it's starting to become an issue that they can get more illegality and more internet illegality. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. I don't see any other questions, so thank you very much. Thank you very um, much, Michael. For your, for your time and your, for your testimony. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Holly Mullins Hart, number 61, followed by number 62, Rebecca Lott uh, Lautenslager. So if Holly Mullins Hart is here, I see you there, but you're on mute. Holly Mullins Hart is on mute. I don't know if that's something that our administrators have to take her off. But you're still on mute. Go ahead. Good okay. afternoon. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee members, and thank you for allowing me to speak this afternoon. My name is Holly Mullins Hart of the Sarah Leff Mullins Funeral Home in Trumbull, Connecticut. I have submitted written testimony also, so I will be brief with my additional comments here today. I think I'm speaking on behalf of the proposed bill SB 327, allowing food and beverage in the funeral homes. I think it's important to note that this bill is not being brought forward by our association, the Connecticut Funeral Directors Association, which does a great job representing the needs of Connecticut funeral homes and the families we serve, such as lobbying to increase the amount an individual can set aside to prepay for their funeral before going on Title 19 and helping to pass legislation allowing unclaimed cremated remains of our veterans to be interred in the state veterans cemetery. The reason this is not being brought forward by our association is that the silent majority of funeral homes are not in favor of this. Most of us only learned there was a hearing last week, so had little to no time to prepare as we are all busy doing our jobs as funeral directors during this pandemic. This bill was brought forward a few years ago and the decision rendered at the time was to offer prepackaged foods to our families during the arrangement conference. Why this is being brought forward again and during a pandemic of all times is suspect. I believe it is because there are a select group of firms who want this to increase their profitability while the restaurant business is hurting badly and our local health departments are currently overwhelmed serving the needs of the community during this pandemic. The public is not asking for this bill to be revisited. Therefore, I believe the decision rendered a few years ago should remain in effect. And I was also um, surprised to hear that there was testimony on this last year, I'm not sure if that was correct, but if there was, our association did not notify any of us. So I'm, I'm sure there, again, there's a large majority of us who were completely unaware that there was testimony held on this last year. I've been a lifetime member of the Connecticut Funeral Dr Directors Association. Uh, my father was past president. And I know this uh, meeting was scheduled today starting at 9 a.m. when many of us have funerals on Monday mornings. So um, it is my belief that there were a number of people who would have liked to speak today, but either were unable to during um, you know, conflicts or just weren't aware of this. So I, I thank you for listening to me today. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, yes, we did hear this bill last uh, um, about a year ago. So, so that is correct. I'm sorry you didn't know about it then. Um, we have a question from Representative Dauphine. 
Hi, good, good um, afternoon and thank you, Madam Chair. Just curious as to what your opposition is to this bill specifically. Uh, specifically, I think, um, again, this was uh, many, many years ago. There was not food and beverage allowed in the funeral homes. There was no legislation on this. I'm going back many years. And the Connecticut funeral directors put that into effect um, because they found that um, it really was not the place to have food and beverage in a place of reverence. Uh, many of us are small uh, mom and pop funeral homes and are not geared up to be in the restaurant business. And again, just from health concerns and our, especially now during this pandemic, I think at a minimum, it should be revisited at a different time. Um, we are overwhelmed as funeral directors during this pandemic, and so is our local health department. Uh, so again, I think that the timing is, um, is uh, just uh, very uh, disturbing. I guess I'm, I'm just, my, my thought is it, you don't have to do it. It's, it would be available there for those that would want to do it. So I'm just wondering why you would be opposed to allowing some that do want to do it, to do it. Because I think it would put local restaurants um, out of business, many of them, if people had an opportunity to do everything at the funeral home, I guess it would be like stop and shop with the local bakeries from years ago. So sometimes when we get too big, it's um, the little guys are at an unfair advantage. And I think um, that is, I'm sure, part of the reason in Connecticut, we have not been in the food industry. We did not come into this business to serve food. We came in to serve our families. And um, again, I believe that this is being pushed from large corporations on a nationwide scale who are doing this for their own profitability um, under the guise of doing it as for what's best for our families. So I'm, I'm questioning that. I haven't heard any of our families asking for this. And again, the Connecticut Funeral Directors Association is not bringing this forward. I would think that that would be the appropriate association to be bringing this forward, representing the needs and interests of funeral homes and their families. So I, I find it odd that um, it's not being brought forward from them if it's so good for the funeral directors in Connecticut at large. You know, my thought is that it would help small businesses. I know in the world of COVID and the environment that we're in, so many people are doing takeout and catering and that sort of thing. And it would eliminate the um, uh, need to go from one place to another and make accommodations at another place. I, I guess I'm still trying to understand why anybody would be opposed to them doing it. And I don't really think I've heard you really say, you sound like you're defending the restaurants, but. I don't know why you would be against um, a funeral home that might want to do it. They're not forcing you to do it. Well, again, I think at some level it puts you at an unfair advantage if families are able to do it at one firm. Most of us, obviously not during the pandemic, but we'll have multiple wakes going on at the same time. And so to have um, food and beverage being served in an environment where there would be very loud conversation during a prayer service, um, you know, I, I think that that um, would not be advisable. And um, again, I think the next level would be, we, we did have a hearing on this many years ago. And as I said, um, the outcome of that was to have prepackaged food given to our families during arrangement conference. We had a full hearing on that. Um, I believe it was maybe 2014, 15, I'm not exactly sure, but that was the decision rendered at the time um, and everyone was in agreement with that. So I'm wondering why it's being brought forward again. I don't hear the public asking for this. Okay, thank you for your remarks. Thank you. Is that it representative? What's that? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions. Um, Senator Armour, did you have a question now or? 
Yes, thank, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Actually, for some reason, uh, my ability to raise hand doesn't work anymore. So we are going to figure out what's going on. Yours too, uh, Representative Arnon. Oh, we maybe we were asking too many questions. So the principal took the <laughs> privilege off. <laughs> um, oh, no, 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 no. There's a time limit of how many questions we should ask. Uh, I've, thank you so much for testimony. I, I, I think, um, uh, I just wanted to understand, uh, do you think that the fact that 49 other states have this, I, I, I think you're, I don't see you anymore here. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I thought that my testimony was finished. I'm sorry. No. Um, uh, do 49 other states have this uh, um, uh, rule or, 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 or opportunity for the families to be able to uh, get nourished uh, while they are grieving, um, but the only state in the country that doesn't have it is Connecticut? Ticket and you feel that all 49 are on the track or we are different in our conditioning in state. I, I'm just trying to understand the, the, the extreme opposition that you come with uh, on, on a concept which is uh, accepted by the entire country except one state. Um, so are they wrong or we are standing on the right? I, I'm not speaking on behalf of other states. I think that's the beauty of our country, that each state can do what's best for uh, the families they serve or constituents. I, I guess I'm wondering why something like this would be passed when the majority of funeral homes are not in favor of this. Again, we, we took um, you know, a polling on this years ago, and it was over two thirds of the funeral homes were not in favor of that. Those are those who did respond. There were other people, I'm sure, who either didn't respond for whatever reason or had no opinion. But so, do I ask you a question about your study? Which year was that study done? Um, again, I apologize. I'd have to go back on when we had the hearing back in 2013 or 14. It's when a decision was oh, rendered to, to uh, the prepackaged scheme. So eight years ago, you had the study done. And and um, and then you, you your perspective is that uh, um, right now um, the people don't want it. But I have had from my district, the third Senate district, about four or five uh, funeral homes that have reached out and they have said, "Please do this. We need this." So just in my district alone, and then I asked some of my other colleagues, and they're. Uh, um, so, so I want to also understand: Are each and every funeral home in the state of Connecticut is your member? Uh, members of the association, no, that not every member is a member of the Connecticut Funeral Directors Association, but a large majority of us are members of the association. I believe some of my colleagues who will speak later can give you specific numbers on that. But again, I'm wondering, just as we, as the Connecticut Funeral Directors Association has brought up so many issues that are important to our state, I listed two of them briefly. I'm wondering if this is something that is good for Connecticut, um, why the Connecticut Funeral Directors Association is not bringing this forward, but instead it's being brought forward by, in my opinion, a uh, select few who are uh, corporate owned. Okay, so, so um, I'm just gonna make a quick little statement. My, my, I'll share my thoughts. This, first of all, this is not bad for restaurants. It's actually going to be good for restaurants, uh, if I understand this right. The other thing is, uh, obviously, I, I, I has, I'm hesitant to accept blanket statements. And, and when your study is about eight years old and you don't even have all the, uh, the, the funeral homes as your members, uh, and, and literally every single one that I have spoken to, they are supportive of this. So uh, your membership study needs to be repeated maybe, and, 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 and maybe we need to have a better understanding. But uh, if you look at the testimonies in the last year, you would see there was only one testimony that was against it, and there were many uh, funeral homes that spoke in favor. So it's worthy to to look at some of that aspect just to 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 have a broader understanding. But I want to thank you for your testimony and, today. And Senator, if I may, add, if I may comment on that, um, to that point, the testimony that was held last year. Again, I believe if uh, many of us were made aware of that, you would have had further testimony. Our association, the Connecticut Funeral Directors Association, who regularly informs their members of when hearings are going to be held, new legislation coming up, we did not receive any of that in any of our literature. So I believe we were completely in the dark on this. And again, the timing of bringing this up 
in the middle of a pandemic here in January and February, two of the worst months for funeral directors when we're overwhelmed serving our families and the local health department, I think it's suspect. That's that's my opinion. I think the timing on this was in very poor taste. I'll, I'll, I'll agree to disagree. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Appreciate your time and perspective. Thank you. Appreciate you listening to me. Thank you all. Of course. Um, we're at number 62, Rebecca Lawton Flagger. Rebecca? Yes. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Lautenslager. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Shaughnessy Banks Funeral Home in Fairfield. And I am also testifying in direct opposition of Senate Bill 327, an act concerning the provision of food and beverage in funeral homes. Um, I'm gonna echo several of Holly's sentiments um, on the matter. You know, we as, um, well, we here at Shaughnessy's uh, feel that the topic of food and beverage in a funeral home is just not important at this time while we're experiencing a global pandemic. Um, we feel this bill directly contradicts CDC recommendations of keeping indoor gatherings at a, at a minimum, not to mention serving food in the vicinity of a deceased body, which could be viewed as unsanitary. Um, it's also my strong view that the Department of Health and the Public Health Committee should be focusing on getting the public vaccinated and getting proper personal protective gear to medical workers and other health facilities, including funeral homes. Um, the Department of Health uh, seems to be very overwhelmed right now with the vaccination process. Um, and the proposed, proposed bill is simply not a priority at this time, in my opinion. Um, so I went to mortuary school to learn how to guide grieving families, as well as how to prepare a deceased person for viewing, burial, and or cremation, not how to properly handle food for large groups within my business. Restaurants have so many regulations, as does the funeral business, um, but none of which I'm an expert on, nor do I want to be. And we're kind of wondering who's going to monitor and police issues that may arrive with food in the funeral home. Um, the state inspector has been told recently that he only needs to visit each funeral home once every three years versus every year as it always was in the past. Um, this is due to state budget cuts. So we're just kind of wondering who is going to monitor, um, you know, any regulations having to do with the actual food in our building. Um, is the, the, the local Department of Health going to be burdened with this task? Again, we feel that they are already overwhelmed. Um, also, who is going to be liable if someone chokes to death or has a severe allergic reaction? Would that be the caterer or would that be us? Um, you know, we would have to increase our liability insurance causing a greater financial burden to our business. And um, I do think that this bill hurts restaurants. A lot of restaurants really rely on um, the profits from funeral receptions. And these businesses are severely struggling during the pandem pandemic, not to mention the state will also lose tax revenue from alcohol sales at these restaurants um, that they sell during funeral receptions. Um, I personally feel the majority of CT funeral homes only want to focus on their clients' immediate needs when losing someone they love, um, such as celebrating their loved one's life and laying them to rest in a respectful manner. Um, and that is my testimony today. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. We appreciate you taking the time to be here. If any committee members have any questions? If you are having trouble getting in, you can either, um, or raising your hand, you're welcome to text me or um, the administrator, and we'll make sure you get a chance to answer, to ask questions. We don't see any, so thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Next, Next we have Seth. Lapook. Hello, uh, my name is Seth Lapick. Uh, first, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Abrams and Representative Steinberg for uh, allowing me to testify. Um, uh, speaking in support of SB 326. Uh, like I said, my name is Seth Lapick. I'm a pediatric cardiologist at Connecticut Children's, associate professor of uh, pediatrics at University of Connecticut. I'm also the past president and current board member of the Connecticut chapter of the American Heart Association and past board member of the Founders Affiliate or now Eastern States Board of the uh, AHA. But most importantly, I'm a concerned citizen of the state of Connecticut and I urge 
uh, your support in this bill. Uh, tobacco use is not just a professional concern of mine. Uh, this is a personal issue as well. Both my parents began smoking in their early teens at that time. We had no information uh, as we do today regarding the devastating health effects and costs of nicotine tobacco use addictions. Of course, now we have had this information for 50 years at least, um, but due to savvy tobacco advertising and tobacco companies and their greed, uh, nicotine addiction still is an enormous health issue and we all pay the cost. Uh, I watched my father's quality of life deteriorate significantly over the last 30 years of his life, resulting for his, from his long time addiction to smoking. And he had tried numerous times uh, for about, from about the age of 40 on to uh, quit this habit. Uh, he tried all sorts of cessation uh, techniques, but uh, he eventually uh, ended up with debilitating uh, chronic obstructive lung disease, uh, COPD and bladder cancer. Both these severely impacted his life limiting uh, his activity to brisk walks for the last 20 years of his life. Now I'm watching my mother suffer through uh, extreme shortness of breath secondary to tobacco related COPD. Uh, she was able to quit over 40 years ago and still she'll never uh, regain any of her uh, original lung function. There's strong, uh, there is strong data that if a person does not begin smoking before 18 or now 21, uh, they virtually will never start. Uh, this is because of the image. This might be because of the immature brain is more susceptible to the effects of nicotine, or immature decision-making capabilities, impulse control, or susceptibility to advertising and peer pressure. Uh, of course, the uh, tobacco companies take full advantage of the, uh, these developmental immaturities. Given that upwards of 80% of youth uh, smokers uh, will continue smoking as adults, the obvious time to intervene is in adolescence and young adulthood. The use of electronic cigarette products has skyrocketed amongst our youth. Uh, the last study I looked at went from 2011 to 2018, and the use of electronic uh, cigarettes among high school students had, had skyrocketed. Uh, as we've heard earlier, up to 50 plus percent of uh, high school children, probably even higher uh, at this point. Uh, the use of designer flavors, make no mistake, you know, this isn't for the adults trying to quit smoking. Uh, as was indicated before, the use of these designer flavors and these products is, of course, slowly to increase their sales and to, to addict our children to these, to, to these high levels of nicotine uh, that's ubiquitous in these, in these products. Um, despite the FDA's ban on flavored cigarettes, the overall market for, full, for flavored tobacco products is growing and growing and growing continuing a long tradition of designing products that appeal explicitly to new users, tobacco companies in recent years have significantly stepped up introduction and marketing of flavors of other tobacco products. We've heard about all the ones that are out there um, and particularly in e-cigarettes and cigarette uh, cigars and cigarettes or whatever you call little things, as well as uh, smokeless tobacco and hookahs. These include menthol flavoring. The rate of menthol cigarette use has been increasing tremendously and is truly uh, uh, marketed to the African-American black community of, of our country. With their colorful packaging, sweet flavors, uh, today's flavored tobacco products are often hard to distinguish from the candies they display, uh, which other people have brought up. Uh, and I'll reference the name of the company as our one of the earlier uh, uh, presenters just had. Uh, there's growing strong evidence uh, that it's significant. Interrupt. You've hit your three minutes. Do you think you could conclude? Uh, yeah, real quickly that um, there's good data to suggest that uh, uh, that um, vaping is a gateway to um, combustibles. Yes, combustibles are worse. We get that for the long-term health quality, uh, issues, but to use that as a, as a, as a bridge to, uh, to just say we shouldn't use, um, uh, we shouldn't ban any, any of these things that addict our children because some adults might use these products to quit smoking, I think is a, is a, is a straw man argument. Um, if you want to quit smoking and you're an adult and people have been uh, pressing this today, you should have the right to you know, use these products to quit smoking. I don't think having it flavored is going to make that big of a difference. And Thank I think you. I'm going to have to stop you there because you're over your time. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much you. for your testimony. Um, let's wait a minute and see if any committee members have any questions for you. 
Nope, I don't see any. So thank you very much for your time. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, Senator Wong. Senator Wong, did you have a question? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to thank Dr. Lapik uh, for your work um, every single day um, and on the front line. That being said, I, I think you share some of the personal experience. And, and as a medical physician, you, you have seen the challenge of it. So in, in your testimony, you, you've articulated before you were stopped was the, 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 the real explanation as to some of the rationale for it, uh, despite the economic challenge that, that may be confronting with revenue loss. Uh, can you kind of elaborate a little bit from a medical basis, uh, your, your explanation and continue on if I may? Well, one, the just tremendous addictive nature of nicotine and that, that some of these products or a lot of these products have tremendous amounts of nicotine. And the idea is you wanna get these kids early. And we've heard eloquently how, how family members have just can't get their kids to quit. Um, as far as the economic point, if that's what you were bringing up, uh, the healthcare costs, uh, and as a pediatric cardiologist, I don't see a lot of this, but the healthcare costs of smoking and just look at the COVID, you know, the, the, you can get a, a vaccination early for COVID if you're a smoker because they get sick. People that smoke are in poor health. We all pay that. Uh, earlier on, um, someone mentioned that the smoking costs of uh, Medicaid from smoking related uh uh, smoking-related illness in Connecticut alone is $2 billion a year. Um, and I'd also question the, 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 lack, the, the drop in, in um, tax revenue if we get rid of these flavors. The people that are smoking, the adults that are smoking are, are addicted. They're going to continue to smoke and buy those cigarettes uh, and give you and, and contribute to the tax uh, rolls of, uh, of, of Connecticut. And even if they didn't, even if everybody quit smoking, that would be terrific. I mean, if we lose some tax revenue for that, but then save it on the other end a few years down the road, because we're not paying, walk through any ICU, man, the, the, or, or walk down the street and watch smokers, they're costing all of us enormous amounts of money. And, and yes, they have the right to do that, but you know, I'd rather that money go somewhere else. And finally, uh, there are the education component, the Heart Association, school districts, towns are, are doing their very best to educate kids. But when you're going up against these enormous companies that have marketing departments that will far out uh, uh, spend any of what, what, what towns and, 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 and organizations like, my, my, like the American Heart Association, it's, it's, it's a, somebody else was talking about level playing fields. That's the unlevel playing field. No, I, I thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Anwar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, uh, Dr. Lepuk, thank you so much for your testimony. Earlier, there was somebody who was very articulate, spoke about uh, how a ban is going to actually not necessarily impact the behavior of the current smokers who are using menthol-based tobacco uh, products. And, and I, I know there's no published data to say that, but, but this was anecdotal based on some videos and so on from Massachusetts. I, I just wanna make sure that because you're cheating, dealing with children, the real issue of this bill is not about the current smokers. We actually have to have different mechanisms for addressing it. The, the current bill is about the future smoker, the next generation of smokers. Can you allude to that and then make sure that all of uh, the legislators and, and the community hears that argument and understanding? The, the the addiction rate and so on some of our boards of uh, we have uh, superintendents in schools and teachers and we we've, we've heard from other uh, people already today the 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 severe addictive nature of this and how early it gets in the schools and how the flavors market toward these children um, is immense I mean you can be wearing a hoodie with a little uh, on the string there's a little vaping uh, uh, heater, uh, thumb drives that, you know, if you're in the middle of school, but even if it, even if you were able to, they were able to leave school to, to smoke, the addictive nature, they, 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 this isn't a, a, uh, a way you can, um, uh, educate or, or, uh, punish kids out of, they are addicted. And we're, we're addicting in a whole new generation, just like 
the cigarette companies did to the World War II veteran, uh, World War II uh, folks when they gave them free cigarettes. They didn't want to be nice to these soldiers. They wanted to get them addicted. These, the, the, um, the school systems and talking to my friends that are school teachers, this is a ubiquitous problem that uh, is, is um, going to uh, just you know, pay dividends well into the future, or pay costs well into the future. Uh, not to mention what the net, which we haven't studied very much of what this addictive nicotine is doing to the developing brains. Now that's not my field of expertise, but I've heard people discuss it. And we have no idea, you know, what these high levels of nicotine do to, uh, to uh, pre-adolescent, adolescent, and even young adult brains. Um, so Thank I hope you. that answered your Thank question, you so much. Senator. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative uh, Kavros DeGraw. Uh, yes, thank you, Doctor, for being here today. And to that last point, I guess my question would be, you know, we don't know the effects yet on um, the, the nicotine on the brain. My other question would be, and perhaps you're not seeing it yet, but have your colleagues or uh, perhaps any other doctors you know sometimes, you know, I have heard anecdotally about, you know, a child having a collapsed lung. Um, I, I know that when people are coming in with COVID, they're asking if you're a smoker or if you vape. So I guess I, I would just like to hear, are there any specific medical issues that concern you or that you've already heard about in reference to uh, the vaping? I've read a few articles. I don't know if I would, I would consider it super, you know, solid facts, we don't know, but that it does appear, uh, there were some European studies that the people who were getting sicker, uh, there was a subgroup of people who were getting sicker uh, when they vaped. Uh, if they were vaping from COVID infections. That was at the beginning of, I think it was back in March or April. I have not seen anything since, but I haven't been looking either. Um, that's not my field of... Uh... Okay. And just in terms of general health, you know, as a pediatric cardiologist, what are your concerns about these young people who are, you know, vaping as young as 12 or 13? Um, like long-term? Long-term, there was some data Again, we haven't had a norm, a long-term, we haven't looked out far enough, but there does seem to be a direct effect on the endothelial or the lining of the, the vessels from nicotine and their reactivity. Uh, I haven't studied, I'm not an expert of that. I did read some things about that. We do think it will likely uh, cause in, increases in, in overall heart disease, nowhere near as much as others have pointed out as to combustibles, but it is a it's been shown earlier on, uh, about uh, five years ago, three years ago, as a as it definitely increases the rate of combustible smoking later on. So that in and of itself uh, translates to worse heart disease. The leading cause of preventable uh, heart disease in America is is tobacco. Uh, period. To combustibles. Um, I think it, people were making the argument that well, people should have the use of that to, or maybe even flavored cigarettes to. Uh, flavored vaping to use it as a cessation aid. Well, you know, perhaps that could be uh, done through uh, uh, prescriptions or, or cessation centers where you get a, you know, you, you, you can get these products as a medication. Um, there's, there's a whole kind of literature on that or thought on that. Um, so there's other ways of, of, of supporting the bill and then still allowing the adults the cessation ability uh, qualities of the of these uh, products. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the second time. And I'll just be quick. Uh, I want to extend to you and to the American Heart Association uh, uh, my appreciation for the tremendous work that you have. Uh, done and will continue to do. And, and please extend to Mr. Williams that our prior exchange was by no means uh, a challenge to him. It was an encouragement that the incredible uh, role that you have in, in raising awareness and, and public health wellness uh, was one where I would encourage you to explore the other issues that we may explore in the General Assembly and provide leadership role in that. Uh, but I wanted to be clear that the American Heart Association and the great work that you do and the history that you have in, in raising the awareness when other people did not needs to be allotted and, and complimented. So I wanna thank you 
and and repeat and reiterate my support of the American Heart Association, the great work that you do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Thank you Senator. Uh, I see no further questions. Uh, you've gotten your full money's worth. Uh, and thank you for your testimony today. Uh, by the way, I was joking. There is no cost to <laughs> try to be clear. Uh, next up is number 65, TJ Clark, followed by Darnell Goldson. I see it. I see TJ is here. If you could just unmute. Okay, we're going to give you another 20 seconds. There we go, TJ. I'm sorry about that. Uh, technology camera issues. Uh, thank you, Representative Steinberg, uh, to you and Senator Abrams and the members of the Public Health Committee of the Connecticut General Assembly. Uh, my name is TJ Clark, City Councilman here in the city of Hartford. I'm a resident of the city of Hartford, and also uh, I serve as the majority leader for the council. I'm here to express my support in favor of bill, Senate bill number 326 raised, an act prohibiting the sale of flavored cigarettes, tobacco products, electronic nicotine delivery systems and vapor products. I would like to make you aware of the tobacco related issues associated with COVID-19 and unhealthy lungs that are affecting many communities in our state while we continue to live in this pandemic. Emergent studies suggest that COVID-19 patients who smoke have a higher chance of experiencing severe symptoms or death than non-smokers because smoking often leads to severe respiratory afflictions and is detrimental to the immune system. COVID-19 makes clear that our lung health is so tied to our public health and how we're going to get back to our feet in this country to build back better for our collective future. Stand with me with policy for policies that will during and after COVID-19 make our community stronger and healthier, believe in the promise of the next generation. In recent years, 4,900 adults in our state have died each year with our own smoking in Connecticut. When the medical data all, all comes out from COVID-19, how many of how many more of how many more of than 7,000 deaths in Connecticut will show some association with smoking? We need to prohibit the sale of all flavored tobacco products now at a time when COVID-19 has dispropor disproportionately, excuse me, devastated the lungs and lives of communities of color. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Clark, for your testimony. We're very glad we were able to make it all work. Uh, you make some very good points. Uh, I don't see any questions, so thank you for your testimony. Next up is Darnell Goldson, followed by Andrew Solner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, the committee for allowing me to um, speak to you today. Um, I am Darnell Golson. I'm from the city of New Haven, former alderman in New Haven, currently an elected member of the Board of Education and formerly the president of that board. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking to you today um, in opposition to um, Senate Bill 326. I was specific, specifically um, opposed to the um, the cigarette ban. Um, let me. I'll tell you. I've, I've, I I have some points, just like everyone else, about the about all the different issues around um, revenue loss and, and so on. But I want to tell you a personal story. When I was about eleven or twelve years old, um, my myself and a few of my friends um, ended up with several um, large boxes of cigarettes. I won't tell you how we got them, but we got them. And um, during that time, I started experimenting with smoking because we had these cigarettes. We were sitting in a, in a garage and just smoking away. And when my father sent me to the store to get him cigarettes, I um, always um, took his money and, and gave him the cigarettes we had in the garage and made a little bit of money off of it. So um, he was aware of it, of course. Um, so I, I was smoking. I wasn't really enjoying it, but everybody else was doing it. So I figured I'll do it also. So um, one day uh, we had someone from the, uh, I believe the health department probably, I was in the sixth grade at that time, come to our school, Lincoln Bassett School in New Haven. 
and give us a lecture. And, you know, it was, we we're sixth graders sitting around, you know, hearing hear somebody talk to us. But then he took out a display, which included the lung of a smoker and the lung of a non-smoker. And I never touched a cigarette again after that. Um, why? My father was a smoker. Why did I stop smoking? Why did I stop smoking cigarettes and never touch a cigarette again? It's because of the education, because I was educated by a professional um, on why I should not be smoking. And I think that's where we're missing the point. I don't understand this whole concept of how um, banning adults from smoking cigarettes will stop children from smoking cigarettes. I just don't understand that logic. What I do understand is education. And what's been frustrating for me is to see all of this money come into the state from this tobacco settlement and a very small portion of it going actually to education. Um, and and, and that's, that's where, you know, my concern lies. And, and I think if this legislature was very serious about stopping um, youth from smoking. And I, and I don't think anybody who testified today thought that that was not a worthy cause. Why wouldn't we put more money into education as opposed to criminalizing it? I mean, would it have been easier for someone to slap some, some handcuffs on me when I was in, in the 12th grade? I mean, in the sixth grade? Maybe it would have scared me straight. But what scared me more was, was that lung that I saw and understanding that I could be going in that direction. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe. Mr. Colton, sorry, yeah. just uh, your time is up. Just if you can oh. give a closing statement. Thank you. Right. All right. So, so uh, criminalizing, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a saying that I'm going to twist around a little. It says the road to jail is paved with good intentions. And when you criminalize this, you're going to be hurting people in my community, people that I know who are going, who, who smoke and are going to, who are going to continue to smoke no matter how they have to get it. So I, I hope that um, at the very least you strip the cigarette ban out of this. Um, I, I'm, I don't have any issues around with the vaping stuff. I, you know, what I hear it's, it's, it's really terrible, but um, I, I would hope that you would strip the cigarette ban out of this. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. And, and I agree with you that uh, it's unconscionable that we, do, we divert funds from the tobacco settlement fund and aren't doing enough on education. I think that's something we should all take seriously. Uh, I don't see any questions. Thank you, sir, for your testimony today. Next up is Andrew Solner, followed by Andrew Harapal. Mr. Solner, or Dr. Solner, perhaps? Yes, thanks, Representative Steinberg and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. Um, I'm pleased to offer testimony to support Senate Bill 326. I'm the medical director of the Hartford Healthcare Cancer Institute at Hartford Hospital, where I direct the Helen and Harry Gray Cancer Center. I'm a practicing oncologist, and I'm proud to be a long-term volunteer for the American Cancer Society. Flavored tobacco products are luring kids into a lifetime of addiction, which they otherwise may very well have avoided. Uh, we must do everything in our power to stop that. That means ending the sale of flavored tobacco products. Tobacco 21 is one part of a comprehensive strategy that helps reduce, reduce youth access to tobacco products. And we truly appreciate the leadership and action of Connecticut leaders to pass that legislation in 2019. It was an important step in the right direction. Flavors are what makes these products so appealing to youth and are driving the e-cigarette epidemic. Given how popular flavored e-cigarettes are amongst youth, if retailers are still allowed to continue selling them, kids will find a way to obtain them. Entirely removing these products from the market is the only way to curb their use by kids and create a tobacco-free generation. Although this legislation may impact some adults who wish to have flavored products, the unflavored products will still be available for those adults who are attempting to quit cigarette smoking. On balance, the banning of flavored products will do more to enhance the public health approach in limiting, limiting product accessibility to kids and a lifetime of addiction. Mint and methyl, menthol flavored products are a major contributor to the epidemic of use of these products by teens. There is no public health justification to exempt them from any policy proposal. A majority, 57% of youth e-cigarette users use mint or menthol flavored e-cigarettes. And these flavors are only second in popularity to fruit flavored e-cigarettes. 
amongst 10th and 12th grade Juul users, mint is the most popular flavor. And by the way, one Juul e-cigarette has the same amount of nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. Here's a little bit of re recent Connecticut data. 3.7% of high school students smoke cigarettes. 5.7% of high school males smoke cigars. 27% of high school students regularly use e-cigarettes. 12.1% of adults smoke cigarettes. 4,900 adults die each year in Connecticut related to tobacco-related disease. Smoking kills more people than alcohol, AIDS, car crashes, illegal drugs, murders, and suicides combined. And thousands more die from other tobacco-related causes. This is really a public health issue of major proportion. Massachusetts became the first state to ban all flavors. We ask you to join our neighbors to the north in setting the pace nationally to keep our kids and our communities safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Senator Alwar. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Solner, for your testimony. Thank you first for being here. I know how busy you are because when I try to get you paid to see patients, it's a long wait. So truly appreciate <laughs> you uh, taking care of the patients. Um, I, I, I think there was an argument that was made on the financial cost to the state. And somebody has said that we will lose about 100 to $150 million if we do the right thing to reduce the exposure to the next generation of children. Um, the way I see this, you either lose money now or you lose it later. Could you tell about the cost of cancer treatments uh, per patient and, and how many that is impacting the Medicaid and the taxpayers between Medicaid and Medicare? Well, our, our, our available data would suggest $2 billion a year in state Medicaid dollars. Um, the, the Medicare, amount would be much higher than that. Um, and that's related to all healthcare costs related to tobacco, not just cancer, but treat treatment of heart disease and lung disease and all of the other issues related to tobacco use. Um, we won't lose all of the tobacco related income because those smokers who are going to continue are going to smoke unflavored cigarettes. Um, so they'll, they'll be able to get them and, and we won't lose all of that revenue. But I do believe that the trade-off will pay us um, at least four, between four and 10 to one in dividends by um, uh, us taking this preemptive action. Th thank you, this is very powerful. So, so for, for every dollar that we lose on this end, we are going to make a lot more, four to, how many times you said? Four to four, 10? Between four and 10 to one, yes. Yeah. This, the, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful everybody hears this part because this is relevant because we are selling our community short by giving a dollar value to the children by saying that, oh, we want to save that $100 million, so let's poison our children so we get the tax money. And, and uh, we are not only not making money, we are losing far more and losing our children in the process as well. So right. thank you so much for your very valid and important testimony. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions? I don't see any. Thank you, doctor, for your testimony today. Thanks You're very much. Waiting for your opportunity. Much appreciated. Uh, Andrew Harapar, followed by number 71, Daniel Cowan. Okay. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Andrew. Andrew. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. I'm asking to oppose Senator Bill uh, 326. I am first a parent and second a retailer in the state in the Hartford, Holland, and New London County, uh, representing both retail gas convenience as well as liquor stores. Um, I agree with the good intent of protecting the youth from nicotine initiation, but as a licensed retailer, it is our duty to make sure that my staff is trained to ID and identify anyone who appears to be under the age of 30. We have an ID checker and our registers also ask um, for the age to be inputted. And also, uh, we train our guys, when in doubt, we deny the sale as our livelihood isn't worth the penalties of selling to a minor. And just so you know, this is what the uh, ID checker looks like. And we're able to scan any state ID and it will tell us then if it's a fake ID, if it's a real ID and if they're of age and if the ID is expired. Um, it is against the law for anyone uh, under 21 to buy or someone else to buy and give to a minor. That's where enforcement should step in and target that. 
I believe that education, both at home and in school, should be pushed to maintain our youth to making their own decision. In regards to vape and uh, ban on vapes against, uh, flavors rather, um, again, it falls on our end to make sure that we don't sell to minors. Uh, flavor or not, there shouldn't be a judgment. Um, you know, just a little side note, you know, many of you guys drink and it would be, you know, the question is, would it be right to ban Chardonnay versus Merlot or tequila versus scotch? Or is the point that all alcohol is bad for you and should be banned? Um, we all choose our poison in this life. Uh, we live, whether it's smoking, gambling, drinking, eating unhealthy, deciding to drink a sugar versus non-sugar uh, item, and many other things we choose. If you consider banning one type of flavor versus the other, then maybe the bill should focus on stop selling in total and not one or the other, specifically menthol versus menthol or flavor versus non-flavor vape. Um, and people generally with an addiction um, will generally leave one addiction and pick up another. So maybe in the case of a flavor versus non-flavor, they will sacrifice the taste and move across. Um, our retail industry is very beat up and torn pre-COVID and now more so than before. Gas margins are down, cigarette margins are limited, store sales are down, wages are up, as well as many other expenses. Our business creates jobs, stimulate our economy and provide a living to many others and many other entrepreneurs included. Um, I think this bill needs to be studied more in detail and not focus on one aspect to be fair. Um, just a side note, we don't sell candy besides cigarettes to compel any minor to make a decision to buy cigarettes or any flavor cigarettes at that. Um, nor do we say to every customer, would you like cigarettes today? Whereas you go to some food services and say, would you like fries with the purchase? Um, product availability in nearby states and online purchases will not disappear. If somebody wants it, they'll figure out how to get it. And with the Massachusetts ban on flavors and such, all of our sales have uh, spiked and whether it's flavors and Newports and the menthols, uh, Newport being one in particular. Um, so they've all gone up, meaning people are now leaving Massachusetts and coming into Connecticut to make those purchases to take back home in their travels. Uh, um, your, believe... your three minutes is, has been up if you wanna go ahead and give your final remarks. Thanks so much. Sure. Um, this kind of leads me to believe, I don't know if this is necessarily a racist situation or not, but you know, if you're saying that one race is uh, more prone to going to one flavor versus the other and maybe not the other race, then maybe you might be raising a race situation rather than the overall situation of an addiction, whether it's a flavor or not. Thank you for your time. And once again, I uh, hope you take my thoughts into consideration. Thank you, sir. We certainly will. I don't see any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Next up is Daniel Cowan, followed by number 73. Josephine Kalachi. Good afternoon. I'm writing in response to Senate Bill 288, an act concerning indoor air quality in schools. As a professional engineer in the state of Connecticut and a board of education member in Woodbridge, I find the effects of this bill to be concerning. I submitted written testimony with links and some attachments for your use, but I'd specifically like to emphasize a few points. Um, I specifically desire that this bill be removed from legislation this session. My conclusion, uh, my concluding statement holds the most compelling reason why. At this, at the, this bill at its heart desires to solve a real problem in schools. Ventilation devices, HVAC systems break and are not repaired. And I agree, I agree this does not provide the environment that we want for our students or staff. However, the strategies outlined in this bill are overreaching, unrealistic and represent a desire to make a go no go lever to close the educational buildings in the state to in-person learning without good cause. In reading much of the testimony from the teachers and the staff that occupy these buildings that is attached to this hearing, the issues they raise have nothing to do with meeting or not meeting ASHRAE 62.1. Most of the things described come from faulty DDC sequences of control, failure to repair existing mechanical systems. Focusing on just meeting ASHRAE 62.1 will not address these root causes of these issues and will only exacerbate the very real problems these teachers and staff face. There is no body of evidence to support that not meeting ASHRAE 62.1 makes a building instantly unsafe. In fact, there is a body of evidence that demonstrates natural ventilation can work and does work in many environments and has been allowed in building code for many years. As we all know, buildings are better if you try to ventilate them more often as, and as much as they can be. But 
ASHRAE 62.1 was designed for engineers to use at the time of building. A very simple bill could be drafted wherein the staff of a school could certify that the ventilation equipment provided to the school as part of the original construction process certified by a professional engineer is running, not um, so if the goal of the school is better IAQ or indoor air quality, let's target that and fund that, not just throw ASHRAE standard 62.1 and hope it makes the problem better. Many schools have invested in better filtration, which is a great first step in solving IAQ problems. There are many emerging technologies that treat viruses, mold, and other indoor air uh, contaminants. We have already have tools for schools, which was mentioned earlier on today, that reduces VOCs in the school. And it's a wonderful website. I'm actually on it right now and has tons of resources for everyone to be used. So let's incentivize and better fund these programs and allow third party engineers to deeply dig into retro commissioning of these buildings. Um, with specific regards to the text of the bill, section 1.A.4 speaks to 62.1, speaks to 62 it does not reference 62.1 or 62.2, which indicates to me that the person that wrote this bill does not have the experience to be citing this standard. Additional, the lack of knowledge of 62.1 by the bill author is in 1.a.5, where it says routine indoor air quality monitoring program, which refers to the IAQP procedure in 62.2 and, and is not the only way to comply with the standard. Finally, the credentialing portion of this is very concerning. Given that it obviously, given by the obvious support letters by specific groups, I think it's important that the state, it's important to state that we need, we do not need a new voluntary credentialing program because the state requires all people who work on these systems to be licensed already. Human comfort is not merely a dry bulb temperature issue. Humans sweat for a reason and human comfort is a function of temperature and humidity. So ASHRAE standard 55, 2017 thermal comfort of humans is a much better guide than just an upper and lower threshold. Finally, Mr. Cohen, if you want to go ahead and wrap up, your three minutes is over. Thank you so much. Okay. Finally, the most compelling reason not to move this forward, this bill forward, is there is already Public Act 03 220 uh, that has the same flaws of this uh, cited above and does have some better parts than this bill. It is already part of our law. Um, and there, it's listed on tools for schools. And so we need to do a better enforcement of the existing laws and not just write new laws that will be ignored. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You've made a lot of points in a short period of time for which we're appreciative. It sounds like you're, you're well informed on many of these issues and we would very much appreciate uh, your input. And we will look at your, uh, your written testimony carefully and the links that are attached because it sounds like we could improve upon this bill and that is indeed our intent. I will say though, that your, one of your initial statements about this being some sort of effort under COVID to keep schools closed, uh, couldn't be further from the truth. This bill was first broached before we knew that COVID existed. And the bill is roughly the same as what we talked about last year. So I can assure you that uh, COVID has absolutely nothing to do with this bill, other than perhaps to have given us some greater insight as to issues with HVAC systems in schools. Um, any questions? I don't see any. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I hope you stay engaged. You obviously offered a lot of uh, fairly expert uh, input. We appreciate that. Next up is Josephine Kalachi, followed by Gregory Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Josephine Kalachi, and I am Director of Government Affairs for the Association of Surgical Technologists. We're here today to express our support for Senate Bill 285, which allows medical assistance to administer vaccines. And we actually would encourage the committee to expand it to include surgical technologists. Uh, AST has over 40,000 surgical technologists as members of our association. We have, there are approximately 1,090 surgical technologists in the state of Connecticut, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Surgical techs are under the direct supervision of uh, a surgeon during an operating room procedure. They serve as the surgeon's co-pilot and among many other functions, provide instruments and supplies to the surgeon during, surger during surgery. They operate complex surgical equipment such as robotics. They handle uh, specimens such as kidney stones and biopsy tissues, and more importantly, they uh, perform precise actions known as sterile technique in order to provide 
and keep the immediate surgical area sterile. Um, the certification portion, which we would ask to also be included uh, with the, the language allowing surgical techs to uh, administer vaccines is very similar to uh, a profession that's already in state statute in Connecticut. It was put in state statute in 2015 for central service technicians. And also Massachusetts has very similar language for surgical technologists. The proposal that we're offering allows a grandfather clause. So anyone currently working as a surgical technologist would be grandfathered in and would not have to obtain the certification. And it also exempts out nurses and other healthcare professions. Um, we understand if the committee doesn't feel that uh, this is the right venue for us to uh, amend our language in, and we're open to having discussions with the committee on what a possible uh, avenue would be for us to uh, put our language uh, in legislation that is moving. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious, what is the urgency of having surgical technicians be entitled to uh, vaccinate? Um, are they in a setting where that is likely to come up? Um, uh, it, it, Frankie, as far as I'm concerned, it came a little bit out of left field. Uh, uh, we just felt that it would be another healthcare profession uh, that would be able to administer vaccines for the state. I'm sorry, I cannot hear. I have to work on, on the mute button. Sometimes I hit it and I don't hit it the right way. So thank you for uh, letting me know. Any comments or uh, questions from any other members of the committee? If not, I also want to commend you on having perhaps the most serene background of anybody that we've had on so far. <laughs> and, Thank uh, you. We'll see how the competition goes for the rest of the day. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. Moving along, we have uh, Gregory Conley, followed by number 77, Craig Olin. Good afternoon. I apologize for the lack of serenity in my background. My name is Gregory Conley, and I run a nonprofit based in the state of Connecticut called the American Vaping Association. And we advocate for pro vaping policies with the end goal of redu reducing cigarette smoking among adults and youth in America and improving public health. We're here today to strongly encourage the committee to reject Senate Bill 326 because its enactment would actually end up harming public health by discouraging adult smokers from quitting, all while, as, we, as we've seen in Massachusetts, simply send Connecticut citizens across state lines or through other means to acquire their tobacco and nicotine products. Earlier today, you heard excellent testimony from a Yale professor by the name of Dr. Abigail Friedman. Dr. Friedman has had never had any connection to the tobacco or nicotine industry. She is an academic and a respected one. And she gave testimony highlighting her own research, finding that adults in the real world who use flavored vaping products are more likely to succeed in quitting long term versus those using only tobacco flavors. Dr. Friedman should be a resource to this committee. Her Yale professorship brings her a great deal of respect and her research, which has been funded by the FDA, really should be read by members of this committee because she is a serious academic that has looked at this issue not, emo not as an emotional tool. She recognizes, yes, we should ban, they, she believes in her personal capacity that menthol cigarettes should be banned for public health reasons, but with vaping products would still, still, many people in Connecticut continuing to smoke cigarettes, we need alternatives. Uh, and lastly, I'll note the FDA's PMTA process is underway. The FDA in the near future, every vaping product will either be approved and authorized by the FDA under an appropriate for the protection of public health standard, the entire public health, including children, or they will be denied and it will be a felony to continue to sell the products. So great changes are coming. This industry that you've heard from today wants to work with legislators. I'm glad to answer any questions on the federal side. There's also uh, internet sales regulations that have just gone into effect at the congressional level. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for uh, your service. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Yes, to your point, we've heard testimony from a number of individuals uh, who suggest that uh, vaping remains an important tool perhaps for ses smoking cessation. <coughs> Would you be supportive of the bill if we were to carve out vaping to be used uh, 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 under a doctor's prescription 
as a cessation product? No, because the standard, there are completely different standards. What the FDA is reviewing now is this PMTA, a pre-market tobacco authorization from the FDA Center for Tobacco Products. And that has a standard of, if we release this product with specific marketing conditions, conditions, will it benefit population level public health? That is what companies in Connecticut and across America have spent on each individual product, some of them hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions. They haven't tried to put the products through the pathway at the FDA Center for Drugs because that's a prohibitive path. Pharma, big pharma itself with its record profits, they aren't really putting new nicotine replacement therapy products through the approvals route because it's just not a realistic option without changes. That's unfortunate. Uh, if we really want to encourage smoking cessation, we should uh make that path more reasonable. Uh, um, and what, I, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I would just add, what Dr. Friedman is advocating for is this concept of tobacco harm reduction. The idea that not every smoker, even though we want them to quit, not everyone is willing or able to quit. So if we can get those adult smokers onto harm reduction products, which is what the FDA is looking at, then if we want to encourage them to quit that, let's wait to encourage them until they've moved down to the product that isn't killing 400,000 people each year. Uh, and so as Dr. Friedman said, it's not 100% good, 100% bad. There has to be middle ground. That's what I was seeking was uh, some middle ground. Representative Foster. I, I, just, I do want to let you know that I've taken a lot of the academic um, research advice from Dr. Friedman to heart in what we're talking about, but I do believe that there is, there is a likely pathway that will significantly decrease the access of these products at the easy access point that they exist where children are very frequently getting their hands on them and forming new addictions. Um, and there is like this behind, you know, like perhaps an over the counter behind the counter option that might be a pathway. And so I'm, I'm hopeful, well, I'm asking if you are interested in hearing or having conversations about what potential options and modifications to this bill would make it possible to reduce the harm of starting new addictions with products that are being pretty intentionally marketed and, and taken up by young people. Um, and then also allowing it to be an, uh, in, in essence, an adjuvant, right? Like it's something that is a set, it's supporting reduction. From what I've seen in the study so far, it is almost always in conjunction. And I, I, I plan to learn a little bit more about this, but it looks like all the studies to date that I have seen have looked at it in conjunction with um, a smoking cessation evidence-based program. So if it's always used in conjunction with a program, why wouldn't it work for it to be behind the counter? So first, in the real world, not clinical trials where they're letting people also use the gum and patch and comparing it against people that don't use the gum or patch. In the real world, virtually all usage is either people who use it in addition to smoking cigarettes to reduce smoking, or they make the switch fully, and they're not using nicotine replacement therapy alongside it. Keeping the products behind the counter, if that's not already the law in Connecticut, it absolutely should be. There's no purpose to have any tobacco or nicotine product around candy. Uh, restricting products to adult-only stores, there are some negatives to that because you can go to any 7-Eleven state and purchase a pack of cigarettes, so you're making it harder for adults to access the products, but you could have until the FDA actually issues its PMTAs and says these particular products are appropriate for the protection of public health after exhaustive study, until that comes, the vaping products have to be only sold in adult-only environments. That would better protect public health and still allow adults to access these products and protect youth than just a ban altogether. So there's definitely room for, for movement on this. And to be clear, I meant behind the pharmaceutical counter, not behind a counter, because I think a, 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 like a cash register behind the counter is very different from behind a pharmaceutical counter. If, you ha if we lived in a theoretical world where the manufacturers today could supply their products to pharmacies and only people who came into the pharmacy with a doctor's note could pick up that product. That's something that would be a nice world to be in. That would restrict access to youth, but that's not the world we live in. No pharmaceutical, uh, no pharmacist is going to dispense a non-approved, non-FDA through the medical approval process that would take five plus years if we started today. Um, that's not going to happen in the United States just with the way the system, pharmacists do not dispense non-FDA uh, through the medical route products. 
Understood. Thank you for working through that with me. I appreciate your expertise. Thank you. Senator Omar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Connolly, just wanted to clarify. So, so you're saying uh, Dr. Friedman's studies have compared the existing pharmacological um, uh, treatments for smoking cessation and compared them uh, directly with uh, the vaping process? And, 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 and she found that they were equally good or better? Is that what you suggested or? Senator Amar, no. What uh, Dr. Friedman did, her one of her studies, which is cited in my written testimony that you likely have, is she compared in the real world, smokers who try to quit with flavored vaping products and smokers who try to quit with tobacco flavored vaping products. And I believe she also just looked at smokers who didn't try to quit with anything, just followed them in the real world. The conclusion of her study was that, and other studies, is that flavored vaping products, adults who use those products are more likely to become smoke-free. When we're talking about comparisons with the nicotine gum and patch, that's in published clinical trials. So for example, about 18 months ago, the New England Journal of Medicine published a groundbreaking clinical trial comparing the nicotine patch to vaping products. And vaping products were about twice, uh, adults who were using vaping products in the study were about twice as likely to be smoke-free six months but into who, the study. Who funded that study though? Do you remember uh, that? That was New England Journal of Medicine. It wasn't funded by the New England Journal of Medicine, but it was not a tobacco or nicotine industry funded study. It was government funded. I would stake my sure? reputation on that not being a tobacco or nicotine industry study, nor anything involving Dr. Friedman. Okay. Okay. All right. We'll talk more about that. Okay. So, um, but, but hear, hear me out. So, so yes, your argument, your, your argument uh, from your industry, you're obviously representing the vaping industry here. So, so your argument is that we should continue the vaping industry to flourish with the uh, flavored products because of the theoretical uh, benefit of smoking cessation in a subgroup who were never compared with the standard of care that has been FDA approved um, at this time, but but at the same time, the same product is being used to incite the next generation of children to take on nicotine-based products with the, the next going over to the combust combustible products and so on. So if I look at the pros and cons of the two options with the limited data that you have, I look at the potential of suggestive benefit to the long-term damage and I, I say from a public health point of view, it does not make sense to me. Again, this is just me. I, I, I just practice medicine but, and see people with diseases and, and also have, have been trained in public health and, and, and deal with public health issues. But Completely understand. Great questions. First, uh, we are a 501c4, so we do not represent the industry. Sometimes our beliefs on what is best for public health conflict with what the industry is seeking in legislation. Second, uh, the evidence on vaping products in the real world and clinical trials being better than the nicotine patch and gum is supported by the Cochrane Group, which you're likely familiar with as a doctor. Their published report, while they say there's more evidence needed, they are very bullish on vaping products, the evidence showing them being better uh, than the NRT in the real world and in clinical trials. And yes, when you're looking at the Food and Drug Administration, accepting and reviewing applications for all these products for manufacturers across America on a basis where each product needs to show to the FDA that marketing it would be appropriate for the protection of public health, taking into account adults and children, users and non-users. The FDA is going through an intensive multi, multi-million dollar process right now with these products where in a year, 18 months time, it will be a federal felony for products to be sold that contain nicotine that are not uh, approved through that FDA PMTA process. So what we are arguing is when the FDA, who got us through COVID and approved vaccines in a fast and efficient and safe manner, when they are going to be going through all these products and regulating on a very strict uh, basis, why are we rushing to just enact prohibition that would ignore any future findings of the FDA? Um, well, we'll talk more because uh, what Looking forward the FDA has done in the last four years is very interesting at, at best. Uh, I, I believe years are over, at that. So we're looking at some differences. Well, I take your, your euphemism of the use of the word interesting, Senator. <laughs> uh, are there any other questions? If not, thank you for your testimony today. We really appreciate it. It was very helpful. We'll take a close look at your uh, written testimony as well. 
Uh, next up is number 77, Craig Olin, followed by David Hancox. Good afternoon, uh, Representative Steinberg, uh, Senator uh, Darty Abrams, and other members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Dr. Craig Olin, and I'm before you today as the current president of the Fairfield County Medical Association. I've had the privilege to practice internal medicine in Fairfield County for the past 25 years and greatly appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today. On behalf of my 1,300 physician colleagues, I'm here to join the chorus of other physician voices you have heard today from around our state to express our strong support for this bill, uh, Senate Bill 285, which would finally allow certified medical assistants to administer vaccines under the order, and importantly, as been, has been emphasized all day, direct supervision of a physician or advanced practice registered nurse in the outpatient setting. Uh, my predecessors, as they've reviewed with you today, have been coming here for years, trying to get a similar bill passed. Um, I have not had the opportunity to listen all day, as most of you have, um, but from what I have heard, um, much of the Q&A and testimony seems to all come back to an underlying issue um, of what is really the appropriate scope of practice um, for a medical assistant. Um, as we've heard testimony, they are trained and certified uh, with many hours of education on vaccination, and they're just simply not allowed to practice at this level in our state. I think, and our member physicians feel the time is long past due to put our past behind us and do what 48 other states do and increase patients' access to vaccines while easing the burden on our medical practices of administering these vaccines. Um, our protracted emergency we find ourselves in now has caused many patients to postpone care and vaccinations and it makes this all the more urgent. Um, everyone is stressed to their limits, catching up on physicals and uh, vaccines, and we need as many people as possible to safely do this in our offices. I'm not gonna review uh, medical assistant training. You've heard that many times today, but we physicians feel that's more than adequate under the specific guidelines in this bill to assure that there's no safety issue um, to our patients. Um, the state and we physicians are really, I think, looking at this as a way to get vaccinations to as many patients in our state as possible. If we're going to close the gap we have on healthcare disparities, we need lower cost methods to get vaccinations into patients' arms. Uh, there's a growing shortage of physicians coming. Um, nurses are absolutely critical to our roles, but this is not a function that only they should be able to perform. Um, time that medical assistants will spend giving vaccines, as you've heard, many offices cannot afford an LPN or an RN, so the physicians do it themselves. For thousands of patients, those couple of minutes add up to a lot of time. So any time we can free up for physicians to do other things while their medical assistants under their direct supervision giving vaccines, will allow them to do other things. For these reasons, we really implore you to pass this bill and ask it can become effective as soon as possible to greatly expand the number of people able to vaccinate our residents. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Olin. Uh, I'm not gonna address the, the issue you raised with regard to the current emergency with COVID because what we're talking about is a statutory change that would have permanent impact uh, you know, you, you touched on something we've heard from the nurses, which is this is a matter of uh, finances, profitability. You know, the average person out there figures all doctors are wealthy. So what's the problem? You know, why can't you afford to use an APRN or an LPN to do the job? Uh, why is it that you are comfortable and uh, uh, in, intending to focus on MAs to provide this function as opposed to nurses? Well, one of the settings um, I have the privilege of working in is AmeriCares, which is a free clinic. Um, I have many colleagues that are providing services in similar environments, community health centers. Um, these are not-for-profits. 
um, and all of these uh, places in our state cannot, you know, they have to pay a nurse. It's essentially double uh, the rate of a medical assistant uh, to perform this. So it's not a matter of a doctor trying to make an extra $25,000 a year uh, by having an MA or an R or instead of a nurse. Um, there are many settings where there are in nurses, as Dr. Miller and others testified, uh, medical assistants are already here. They're already in our offices throughout the state. Um, there are, I, I don't have the numbers, but I can't imagine there is an LPN or an RN that could staff every private physician and clinic office in the state. No way, no how. We have the MAs, they're trained to do this. We need to let them do it. Thank you, doctor. And I also agree, AmeriCare is, is a wonderful program. My father participated after he retired from private practice and take care of a lot of people that way. So uh, what gives you confidence that MAs working with you under your supervision are, are ready to provide vaccines? Would you just automatically uh, confer that uh, ability on all of your MAs? No, I, I don't think so. I think this bill um, does a very good job of, of listing out the requirements for retraining. Um, you know, there are people who call themselves medical assistants. Um, there is a certification process. There are national certifications and, and you outline those um, in this bill. And I, I think we, you know, we would be happy to see um, some form of extra uh, training as many of the MAs in our state may have trained 20 years ago and never been able to give a vaccine. I think whatever, uh, you know, I think each physician may feel comfortable with some in their office, but I think it, it would behoove public health in our state to have the standard of certification and perhaps extra education um, or, and or an exam. But I think new graduates get this in, in their education and they're taught to do it. So I think it would really be more of an issue for people that are long out of school. Thank you for your testimony, doctor. Uh, and congratulations on taking over the Felford County Medical Society. I know they're a, a fun group. Um, any other questions? If not, again, thank you for your testimony, for your patience today. We move on to uh, number 78, uh, David Hancock, followed by number 80, Don Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I'd like to thank the committee for allowing me to speak. I'm David Hancox, and I was the Director of State Audits in the New York State Comptroller's Office. I've written and taught on issues focused on assessing government programs and policies, such as Senate Bill 326, banning flavored tobacco products before you now. Um, first, before I start, I'd like to point out that R.J. Reynolds has compensated me for my time preparing these comments, but the opinions expressed are my own. I have also submitted written testimony to your website. While banning all flavored tobacco products may appear to be an expeditious and politically safe step towards achieving public health policy goals, the evidence from other jurisdictions reveals that a prohibition will not reduce smoking. The case in point has already been made, but in the first three months of Massachusetts statewide flavored tobacco ban in 2020, Menthol cigarette sales in Massachusetts neighboring states consumed roughly 70% of the banned market. The remaining 30% converted to in-state non-flavored cigarette sales. There is no evidence that smoking rates declined. Furthermore, a ban on all flavored products will be detrimental not only to your state budget, but as has been already pointed out, also to retailers and small businesses. These products account for 44% of tobacco product sales in Connecticut, generating more than 168 million in sales and excise taxes in 2020. Menthol cigarettes alone generate nearly $150 million in taxes. Tobacco retail sales in Connecticut, which occur primarily in convenience stores, are over $800 million annually, slashing that market by nearly half will cost retailers in your state more than $360 million, not including the loss of sales of products commonly made along with tobacco purchases. The result will be lost jobs, decreased wages, and perhaps a shuttering of small businesses. 
and legal sales lost to these retailers will fuel the state's already significant black market for cigarettes. Finally, a flavored tobacco ban will undermine public health policy conceived by the FDA and already supported in your state's tobacco taxation schedule. When the tobacco taxes were last raised in Connecticut, legislators slashed by 50% the tax on products approved by the FDA for marketing as modified risk tobacco products. Nearly half the currently approved MRTP products are flavored. Along with the MRTP designation, the FDA also is currently assessing thousands of pre-market tobacco applications for new tobacco products, including e-cigarettes and other vapor products, many of which are flavored. Denying your state's adult tobacco product users the benefit of the FDA's consideration of tobacco harm reduction simply is not in their best interest and subverts Connecticut's existing policy on this issue. Thank you for your time and I welcome your questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your time. Thank you. Moving along, we're going to uh, move on to number 80, Don Williams, followed by Leanne Ducat. Uh, welcome, former state senator and former president pro ten Don Williams. Uh, please continue, sir. Thank you very much, Representative Steinberg. Uh, and hello, and thank you for this hearing to the members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Don Williams. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Education Association. Uh, used to be with you in the legislature, was also first selectman of the town of Thompson before that. And it's very nice to see you, even if it's by Zoom. Thank you for raising Senate Bill 288, an act concerning indoor air quality. You've seen this legislation before. It was raised last year, had broad bipartisan support, and that was before the pandemic brought everything to a halt. Few things are as important to the health of students, teachers, and staff as the quality of the air that they breathe. I'm sure you're aware of news reports regarding the challenges of schools. Some have been forced to close because of high temperatures, humidity, mold, and poor air quality. The importance of the issue is obvious today, especially to help stop the spread of disease such as COVID-19, but also childhood asthma and respiratory problems. The bill provides standards for improving and maintaining HVAC systems, heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems. That helps prevent the transmission of viruses, mold, and other toxins. The bill would require boards of education to implement an air quality monitoring program by June 30th, 2023. Regional councils of government could be used to help regionalize and oversee the program in an efficient way. Uh, the bill really should contain clear standards for temperature and humidity, specifically um, starting on July 1st, 2024, give some lead time there. Uh, it would call for temperatures to be maintained at 65 to 78 degrees in schools. For perspective, that's the same standard that's required by our Department of Agriculture for pet stores. And to underscore that point, uh, we should provide clearer temperature standards and protections for children in our schools, at least the same that we do for pets in pet stores. And my final and most important point is that in order to address this problem, Towns need resources. This legislation would allow towns to bring HVAC systems into the 21st century by accessing school bonding construction funds. It's a logical use for the funds. Connecticut needs schools that are safe and accessible to students and the community throughout the year. Improving schools to support and protect the health of students, teachers, and staff is a proper and sensible use for bonding funds. So thank you very much for your time and consideration of this important legislation. Be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you for your testimony. I'm sure uh, you can appreciate from your former role how challenging it is to have sufficient bonding funds for all the needed uses. Uh, but certainly we've always prioritized school construction uh, as a major use of bonding funding. And this is something uh, I would agree is equally important is to maintain schools in a healthy environment. You may have heard testimony earlier with regard to the significant process hurdles that are involved in uh, providing schools the opportunity to do the appropriate assessments, 
to, uh, to engage the appropriate professional consultants and to uh, obviously uh, implement it should the funds be available. Um, you made some mention of, of uh, 2024. Do you have some thoughts about how we could uh, logically and fairly roll out a program of this sort? Well, you know, as a former uh, municipal official and also someone who worked uh, on the, the Council of Governments, I think doing it on a regional basis through the COGS is a sensible way of, of doing it in an efficient way where we can save some money and provide services to towns. We don't need to have 169 towns or all the school districts that are out there kind of reinvent the wheel. I think it should be done on that kind of a basis. Thank you for that. Uh, that might require some additional talent at the COG level if they're gonna carry this on. Uh, obviously we also have the, uh, the educational uh, centers as well that might be of some help. Uh, any other questions? Representative McCarty. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Mr. Williams. Um, I well, just would like to go on the record by saying we all certainly recognize the importance of maintaining safe and healthy schools for our students and our teachers. But as we learned today, this is a little more complex. And I just, uh, and we're committed to finding the appropriate solutions. And I certainly really um, appreciate uh, Representative Chairman Steinberg's comments that we were looking at the best ways to approach this issue right now. So I'm just wondering if CEA um, has any position on the ESSER two funds coming out that do certainly allow some of the funding to be used if we have schools that are in uh, need, uh, immediate need, would you would CEA be amenable to using? I know we have lots of other needs uh, for those funds as well, but I, I just wouldn't want to see a district go uh, unattended to currently if it was an immediate need. If you would maybe just respond, I hate to put you on the spot. Sure, that, that's a great question. You know, I, I would want to make sure that any funds that are earmarked for educational purposes, specifically for the education of students in the classroom, that those funds uh, remain for those purposes. If there's other funding um, that's really for infrastructure and that can help with our schools and public buildings, then that's uh, certainly appropriate. But you know, coming out of this pandemic, we're gonna need to do a lot uh, to rebuild connections and, and mostly the human connection uh, when all students are back in schools um, and we have some sense of normalcy again. Uh, so anyway, um, that's, that's, uh, that's a long answer to your question, but if those funds can be used for infrastructure as opposed to being there for education in the classroom, then we're open to that. Otherwise, carving out some of those dollars that are already earmarked for school construction, this is Foursquare right in the, the purpose for that kind of funding. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I agree with both of those comments. So thank you very much. Thank Are there you. any other questions? If not, always good to see you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you Next very much. Thank you. We have Le uh, Leanne Duca followed by Mukhtar Ahmad. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. I'm here today to speak about a few bills on the agenda, all but one. The first one I would like to oppose is SB 285, Medical Assistance and Vaccines. While I appreciate the state's interest in expanding access to vaccines for those who want it and freeing up valuable time with doctors and nurses, the medical assistant simply is not versed enough in how to respond to adverse reactions properly. So I would request that the committee consider leaving that up to more trained professionals. The next bill I would like to address is SB 288, the air quality in schools. While I think that the title and the concept of the bill sounds great, it will only grow big government and take the responsibility off of the towns. I believe this is a town issue and they need to decide where the money comes from. Uh, any state mandate on the towns would force decisions that could adversely affect the student population. Next, I would like to oppose SB 326, the flavored vapes. If I choose to kill myself with Whoppers, Diet Cokes, and flavored vapes, that's my decision. You are only going to encourage a black market um, to emerge because this market is very big and it is not going away. 
Uh, and lastly, I'd like to support SB 327. Funeral homes offer a unique experience for those grieving their loved ones and people take comfort in food. I say, let them eat cake. Uh, I would just like to make a procedural objection and wonder if in future hearings, the committee would consider leaving the view on the Zoom call gallery view for the remainder of the hearings so that we can see which legislators are engaged and which ones are not. The public really appreciated that in the in-person testifying experience and we would, like to, um, we would like you to consider the same experience on the Zoom call. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I, I'm looking at gallery view. I, I assumed everybody else was as well. So uh, I, I do believe we're within the, within the limits of our technology. Uh, any other questions, comments? If not, thank you for your time. Next up is thank Mukhtar you. Ahmad, followed by Bill Garrity. Mokhtar, I believe you, we see you walking to a vehicle and maybe you're about to talk now that you're in the vehicle. It's all yours. If you'd like to begin your testimony, Uh, Mr. Ahmad, if you're going to speak, we, we're going to ask you to do it now or else we'll have to move on. I guess we're going to move on. Um, the next up is Bill Garrity, followed by number 84, Paul Angelucci. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Representative Steinberg, uh, and members of the Public Health Committee. Um, while I'm getting used to Zoom, it really stinks, and I miss being able to be in front of all of you guys. Uh, to have these conversations in person. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to provide testimony against Senate Bill 285, an act allowing medical assistance to administer vaccines. My name is Bill Garrity. I'm a registered nurse with more than 25 years experience in bedside nursing. I was elected president of University Health Professionals, Local 3837, and I'm serving my third term in that capacity. I'm also an AFT Connecticut vice president and divisional vice president for healthcare. As a UHP president, I represent over 2,800 members in that membership. There are more than 600 nurses, 100 advanced practice registered nurses or APRNs, 30 physicians assistants or PAs and 200 medical assistants. So I do feel I'm uh, fairly qualified to speak about this bill. Uh, this bill looks very much like HB uh, 6025 of 2017 and HB 5214 of 2018. Um, read through much of the support and I listened to a lot of stuff today. Um, and I don't even have to wonder what's different this year, COVID-19. Uh, individuals have pushed multiple years trying to get this law passed in Connecticut and now see an opportunistic path trying to play on the public fears. DPH has already reported there are 11,500 eligible professionals that have volunteered to be part of the teams to do wide scale vaccinations this year. Um, this is not a bill that's talking about just doing this, you know, short term or for this year. This is something that they're trying to get done and have been trying to do for many years. No matter what, how you look at it, vaccinations are medications and medication administration is a duty and skill that should be done by a licensed professional. At UConn Health, our medical assistants are an integral part of our healthcare team. Many of them would like to do more for our patients, but even applying oxygen is not allowed because it's considered a medication. Assessment is the second aspect of this bill that concerns me. Nurses are trained extensively to look for these issues and problems that may arise. They're educated in anatomy and pharmacology. They are trained and taught to be assessing before, during, and after any medical patient, any medical treatment for a patient. Um, I believe that just looking at this as, medic as medication administration as a simple task is a mistake. On a number of occasions, I've had conversations uh, with members of the healthcare committee. And one of the big questions I, I get asked is, why are um, 48 other states, and I wanna make sure I get that right, 48 other states, because on a number of occasions I've heard people say, we're the only state that doesn't do this. New York also does not have a law like this. 48 other, other states are allowing to do this. And it took me some time to think about that for a little bit. And unfortunately it's a, um, 
a divide and conquer mentality among pretty much everybody we deal with. It's having to go ahead and look through, okay, this is the weakest area that we can start. Let's start here and let's start chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. At what point in time are things going to change where uh, nurses will no longer be giving uh, other medications on top of it? At what point in time will nurses no longer be giving pills? At what point in time will nurses no longer be giving IV antibiotics? These are, you know, every, you know, anybody can do this. That's what that's what we're saying right here. And I do not believe that's the case. And I will uh, say thank you for letting me testify today and ask uh, if I can answer any questions, I'd be happy to try. Thank you for your testimony. You know, I, I'm sure there are probably physicians uh, in the audience who can ask the same question about how their career arc has changed somewhat. And whereas they spend a much more time dealing with insurance paperwork and many other things and, and less time in direct care. Um, certainly I think uh, nurses would have a reason to expect they would continue to do many of the things they do. Um, it's an interesting speculation. Let me ask a question. If medical assistants were required to take additional educational and experiential uh, training, would you then be supportive of having medical assistants uh, provide vaccination? Again, I'm a nurse and I've always felt, and for 30 years, it's always been administering medications is the purview of a nurse. So um, I might be a little uh, bit of a tougher sell on that. You know, at one point, doctors objected to nurses doing all sorts of things that they're doing today. You're right. Uh, I, I find it very curious sometimes. Uh, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Moving thank you along, all. we have uh, Paul Angelucci followed by Corey Peggs. Did I have that pronounced correctly? Yes, Paul Angelucci. Please continue, sir. I'm here in support of Bill 288. I appreciate your time and, and your work on this. Uh, you have my testimony, I won't submit it. Uh, I won't read it, but, um, and I'm here wearing many hats too. I'm an educator. I taught in the classroom for 11 years in the technical high school system. And I'm also a plumbing and heating contractor. I teach in our technical high school system. I teach, I taught plumbing and heating. Today, I'm the vice president uh, and I represent 1,150 teachers throughout the state, you know, all four corners. And um, I feel strongly in support of this bill. But my fear is it, it, it's gonna get pushed and it's too aggressive. Some of the temperature highs and lows are aggressive to reach. Um, and you know, with the pandemic in mind, I just can't see our state going another year where you know the temperature is regulated in a pet store and a kennel and it's not our schools. I've been in our schools, our state schools, when and they're all high schools of the 17 uh, conference of high schools. And I'll be in a town where some of the schools are closed because of high humidity and heat, 98 degrees. You know, our students sitting there dripping and the school right down the street is open. So um, limits are needed. I am in support of construction funds being used for this as well. I really see this as an investment in the most important infrastructure we have, which are today's students and staff. Um, and I thank you for your time and I would uh, answer any questions you have. Thank you for your testimony. You know, you use the word infrastructure. It seems to be a common refrain in the state of Connecticut, whether we're talking about transportation or energy or water infrastructure, housing infrastructure. And now we've got school infrastructure based upon a lot of really old buildings with ancient HVAC systems. Uh, it's tough to have enough money to go around, but I, I take your point that this is uh, certainly should be a priority keeping our kids and teachers safe and healthy. Any other questions or comments? If not, thank you for your testimony today and your patience and waiting for that opportunity. We much appreciate it. Next up okay. is Corey Peggs, I believe, or Peg, you can pronounce it if I've got it wrong, followed by Sterling Osborne. Hello, can you guys hear me? We can, please continue. 
Yes, hi, I'm Corey Pegues. I'm a retired executive from the New York City Police Department did 21 years in policing. Uh, also have two degrees, a bachelor's and a master's in criminal justice and a postgraduate certificate from Columbia University from Police Management Institute and was a professor at two different colleges. And I'm calling to oppose the ban of Bill 326, the menthol ban. And so I told you my layout because I want you to know, you know my expertise. And I can assure you that there will definitely be unintended consequences by banning these cigarettes. But we could just look at a few national cases that involve cigarettes. The most glaring was Eric Garner, who was selling Lucy cigarettes. He ended up dying at the hands of the police. Sandra Bland, who was told to put a cigarette out by the police officer, she ended up dying in a cell. You have a 14-year-old from Rancho Cordova, California, just within the last seven months, that was accosted by a police officer because he was smoking a swisher, which is unregulated out in California. You also have the most, the biggest case in America this past summer was George Floyd. He was supposedly going into a bodega to buy untaxed cigarettes. So this is a major problem in the black and brown community. When you speak of the ban, when you look at bans, all the bans that we've had in America, the war on drugs, it didn't work. Three strikes out, it didn't work. Bans usually don't work in America. 50% of cigarettes sold in New York state are illegal. And so what's gonna happen is you're gonna open up an underground market. You could just look at your next door neighbor in Massachusetts, what's going on. The, the, the underground market is going to explode. So the gangs, the Bloods, the Crips, the Yetas, the MS-13s, all of those gangs are going to switch from selling drugs to going to selling cigarettes because there's minimal fines and very, very small jail time. <clears throat> When the America is talking about criminal justice reform for black and brown communities, basically, why would you impose a ban that's going to impact the one segment of the community that America is actually now, including Connecticut, is trying to help bridge the gap between the black and brown community and police? Me being a police officer for such a long time, I do know in black and brown communities, police hunt, and in non minority communities, they protect and serve. And this is going to give the cops one more tool in their tool belt to pull out when they want to use it. And it might not be just for the cigarette. There's other things that cops can do. When you make a ban, you're going to open up that underground. But the only way for the police to find out who the big cigarette sellers are is to get the little fish. You, you know, when you're trying to get the big fish, you got to get the guppies. And the guppies are going to be the black and brown people that sell it illegal cigarettes, smoking illegal cigarettes, and you have to interrogate them to find out where they're getting their product from. I really hope that you guys look at this really hard, especially with marijuana on the slate to be legalized oh, soon. In your, in your, uh, yeah. Sorry, you, you hit your three minutes. If you could just conclu conclude your remarks, please. Okay, I want to leave you off with it with this, uh, with marijuana being legal in 13 states, and you guys are probably going to be talking about it soon. Just look at this picture. In a few years, if it's legalized in your state, your 22-year-old son will be able to smoke marijuana, but your grandmother that's 65 been smoking menthol cigarettes for 45 years won't even be able to take a cigarette smoke. That's something for you to really think about. Thanks again for having me. Again, my name is Corey Pegues, and I'm representing the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, better known as LEAP. Well, thank you for your testimony. I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Uh, I would like to believe that your uh, suggestion that uh, drugs, uh, gangs would stop selling drugs and might start selling cigarettes instead might be a, a boon to society. Um, but I don't think that's really what you intended. Uh, are there any other questions? No, thank you for your testimony, sir. Next up, we have Sterling Osborne followed by number 87, Neil Patel. Uh, good evening and thank you everyone very much. I know the day is late, so I will keep my remarks brief. Um, I have already submitted my testimony um, written, so I just wanted kind of to touch on a couple of points. Um, I wanted to first mention that one of the things that we talked about a lot today was that um, the greatest concern seems to be around youth vape, and I can absolutely understand where, why that is, um, but I'm concerned that um, the bill is all encompassing to all products that are flavored and within my industry alone, that makes up about 50% of our sales. 
Um, and for the majority of time, responsible manufacturers and retailers don't sell the products that are mentioned. Um, but there is an underground market that does sell some of those vape flavored vape products. Currently in my store, in my 22 stores, we are only allowed to sell menthol and tobacco flavored. We don't have any more of the, um, the other flavors, the mango and things like that. Um, so when this happened in Massachusetts, um, I talked to a few of my colleagues up there, their business declined 15 to 28% when the menthol ban went in alone. Um, that's on top of the sales that they were already down from um, the pandemic. Um, we have multiple controls in place that we use to ensure that we sell these products responsibly, including we scan all IDs at the point of purchase to ensure that they're not a fake ID, that they're a real ID. We uh, card anyone under the age of uh, 40 that appears to be that way. We participate in state stings and federal stings, which we pass. Um, we are also even in um, discussions with some of the manufacturers about adding um, software that would limit the number of a specific brand that can be purchased. So for example, you could only purchase three jewel pods or things like that, um, or three packs of menthol cigarettes. Um, so again, I, I know I'm beating a dead horse when I say this, but uh, my concern is that what this bill is going to do is hurt small businesses um, significantly. Uh, and what it's going to do is drive the current market for these products underground, making it that much harder for us to regulate and that much more difficult for um, these controls that we have in place to be controlled. I know that there are places in Massachusetts that are currently selling menthol cigarettes under the counter. You just have to know the guy to get the guy to be able to purchase the product. Um, so that's kind of my, my two cents on the matter. And thank you all very much for taking the time to listen to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We really appreciate your testimony here today. Uh, any questions, comments? Seeing none, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. We really appreciate it. Next up is uh, Neil Patel, followed by Husnain Gandal. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Yes, we can, sir. Please continue. Uh, good afternoon to all the member. My name is Neil Patel. I uh, live in Woodstock, Connecticut. I'm the owner at Thompson Wine and Spirit in Thompson, Connecticut. Uh, my store is pretty much located at, at the quarter mile to Massachusetts line. And uh, I, I'm not a health expert to make any comments or a statement as far as uh, the, the flavor ban or the menthol ban and how that affects the health uh, goes. But as my fellow retailers have said that this is 40% of our pretty much business. Um, I've, I grew from uh, one employee to now having up to 10 employees at my store. This would definitely disrupt our um, uh, industry at, at a, uh, a business level. I, uh, I've, been with, I've been hearing all comments since morning and I've, I've heard a couple of seniors that came along earlier and uh, raised a concern about uh, this product being available at the, the middle school level. I think there should be a restrictions as far as, uh, you know, how, how we sell the products to uh, whoever that we sell it to. Maybe there should be a mandated ID checks regardless of the age. Uh, maybe we should keep the, um, you know, I have robust system where that checks the ID, gets their address, gets their information. And, and, and we know that this is, you know, certified person that buys it, maybe we should make them responsible um, to the people that are giving it to the kids. Uh, second of all, uh, we know that marijuana is still not legal in Connecticut, but not that we can't find it on the streets. I think this will just create this massive um, black market. Uh, a lot of stores in Massachusetts are, are doing it under the table and I'm, I'm sure that will happen in Connecticut. We would lose a lot of revenue. I arrest my case at that. Uh, hopefully, this decision uh, is taken uh, at, a, at a broader view. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patel, for your testimony. Yes, we do take your testimony very seriously and appreciate the potential impact on businesses across the state. Any questions thank or you. comments? If not, again, thank you for your testimony. Next up is Husnain Gandal. I Sorry, I apologize. I, I know I got that wrong. Uh, followed by Donald Balassa. Please unmute yourself, sir. There you go.
For some reason, we can't seem to hear you. Could you check your, your volume, perhaps? Hey, can you hear me now? That, that works. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members for allowing me to testify today in front of the Public Health Committee. I am conversing in opposition to SB 326. My name is Hosnan Gondal. I am an undergrad business student at the University of Connecticut and I'm with my family in the gas station and convenience store industry for quite a few years as well. I believe prior speakers have highlighted the facts and figures together for us very well and therefore I will not be discussing the loss of revenue to the state or any of that. However, I believe I see a side to this bill that most of you haven't seen for several years. I was a high school student not more than a couple of years ago. Many of my peers from high school have ended up attending institutions and colleges in Massachusetts. When they moved to Massachusetts, they did not stop smoking flavored tobacco, vapes, or menthol cigarettes. However, they now just have instant messaging groups on Snapchat, iMessage, and Instagram, where one person who is visiting Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, or any other state for that matter, will take orders for about 50 or 60 different students and ask for a profit on top of the purchase price. That is only one way these products are being purchased. Another very, very common way of purchasing these products is on websites like Craigslist and eBay where a mint vape device will be called a mint stick and it will be hand delivered or available for local pickup only. Please keep in mind that the sellers of these products are not licensed by the state. There is no reason to believe that they will check the age of the purchase person purchasing the product and that these products will be purchased from a reputable distributor and not just from wholesale websites from China such as Alibaba. We are also in business in Rhode Island where flavored vapes have been banned for about a year, give or take. Just last week, I had a young customer who walked in and asked, and I'm going to quote him word for word. Do you know where the guy who sells the disposables in the parking lot of the Motor Inn is today? Because there is a Motor Inn right across the street from us. And he asked, do you know where that guy is today? Because he knew they were not available to us from us because we are licensed retailers. However, they also knew that they can buy the vapes and the devices from a, an a unlicensed and unresponsible uh, person across the street in a parking lot out of his car. My last thought is that in middle school and high school, we were counseled numerous times, numerous times, I mean like once or twice a week about the side effects of drugs, alcohol, and cigarettes which is why the number of drinking and cigarette smoking students is very low compared to the e-cig ratio. And when I'm telling you not once, that means not once we were told about the side effects of vaping, which is why we can see that the ratio is about 27% of high school students are smoking e-cigarettes. My final remarks to the committee today is to keep these factors in mind and think whether approving this bill will actually keep our community and children safe or put them at risk to not only purchase products, but to purchase questionable products from unknown origins. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. It seems you were right on time. Uh, you made some excellent points. I would hope at this point that schools are prepared to teach students about the dangers of vaping, given how the, the, the vaping epidemic has uh, uh, been very problematic for schools and their ability to carry on with their business. But you make some good points. Are there any comments or questions? Seeing none, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience today. We will move on to uh, number 90, Donald Balassa, followed by Kimberly Estes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Donald Balassa. I'm the legal counsel of the American Association of Medical Assistants in Chicago. I monitor legislation and also write legislation and propose regulations. I'm going to bring some additional information on Senate Bill uh, 285. I speak in favor of this. First, I'd like to draw your attention to a report to the Connecticut General Assembly from the Connecticut Department of Public Health dated February 1st, 2013. On page 15, it reads, literature and other information reviewed and evaluated by the Scope of Practice Review Committee demonstrated that certified medical assistants are educated and trained to engage in medication administration under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. 
accredited education and training programs that lead to certification as a medical assistant have been in place for many years in Connecticut and other states and include coursework and clinical training in pharmacology and medication administration. So the education of medical assistants has been mentioned. And there you have a statement uh, that was made by the Department of Public Health. Now, I realize that this legislation is not limited to the COVID-19 vaccination issue, but I think the following is germane. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in their COVID-19 vaccination program interim playbook listed medical assistants as vaccinators. But even more significantly, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, which represents all boards of nursing in all American jurisdictions, uh, released a statement uh, December 15th, 2020, which reads as follows. Waivers by the governor or board of nursing may be necessary to authorize an RN or LPN to delegate vaccine administration to certified medical assistants, medication aides, and emergency medical technicians slash paramedics. So here you have the organization that speaks for all boards of nursing stating that medical assistants can be delegated the uh, administration of the COVID-19 vaccination by nurses. And again, I realize that we're not talking about uh, COVID-19 per se, and yet I do believe this is an important piece of information. If you'd like to find these uh, documents, you can go to our website, which is aama-ntl.org, and you'll see this on our homepage in the right column. Also, I have the scope of practice laws for medical assisting in all states. So if you'd like to do research, you can just click below state scope of practice laws, which is near the left bottom of our homepage and you can see exactly what every state requires for medical assistance, the duties that they allow and that they do not allow. I'd like to go to the legislation itself. First of all, I need to point Sorry, out- uh, Excuse me, you've, you've hit your three minute mark if you want to try to conclude your remarks. All right, in section one, it states that medical assistants must graduate from an accredited program in order to be considered eligible to be delegated uh, uh, in these uh, uh, vaccinations. Also, you can actually go to the website of these two accrediting bodies. And I'm sorry, sir. Uh, I'm perhaps misunderstood. The idea was to conclude your remarks, not to start a new subject. Okay, very good. Uh, you, you've provided us with, with substantial testimony, which we greatly appreciate. Uh, I think to your point, uh, this may not be uh, related to the COVID emergency, but we will have more information as to uh, the uh, level of success of MAs uh, inoculating people once we come out of COVID and we'll be able to actually find out if there have been any problems. So th that's a, an excellent point. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. We go from Chicago, it looks like maybe to San Francisco with uh, Kimberly Estes followed by Jason Prevalege. Good evening. For, first and foremost, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to show my support of SB 326 and to share my family's reality as it relates to vaping. A reality that compelled me to volunteer with PAVE, Parents Against E-Cigarettes, in order to advocate for my son and for all the children of our state of Connecticut. As a healthcare professional, I was open and honest about educating my children regarding the dangers of vaping as they entered middle school. We had discussions about both the risk and the lure of flavorings. Sadly, our efforts as parents did not prevent one of our children by being intrigued by the famous, infamous, the infamous bubble gum scented vaping cartridges. While we did not know it at the time, his vaping journey had begun at the early age of 10 years old. His continued vaping since that time has been dictated by flavors. He will not vape any product unless he likes its flavor. I can quote all the research you want to make the case for why we need to end the sale of all flavored tobacco products to protect our kids. According to the 2020 National Youth Tobacco Survey, over 80% of teens who vape are using a flavored tobacco product. 
in, in a 2020 research article, according to Wang T.W. et al. titled E-Cigarette Use Among Middle and High School Students, United States 2020, among high school students who use any type of e any type of e flavored e-cigarette, 73% used fruit, 55.8% used mint, 37% used menthol, and 36% candy flavored. But while the research is compelling, I would argue that common sense is just and maybe even more compelling. When a highly addictive substance, in this case nicotine, is altered by adding flavorings which mimic children's products such as cereal, candy, or gum, it is inevitable that there will be a bad outcome. Young children will continue to be lured into tobacco use. It is therefore up to us as adults in our society to step up and protect our children by banning flavorings in all e-cigarette and other tobacco products. While my son, while my son has been successful in breaking the vaping habit, I cannot get the vision of my 10 year old child vaping out of my mind. Thank you again for your time and consideration. Please approve SB 326. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Are there any questions or comments? If not, thank you for your testimony. Thank Moving you. Moving along, uh, Jason Prevalage, followed by number 93, Dr. Stacy Taylor. Esteemed members of the committee, my name is Jason Prevalage. I live I live in Fairfield and I work at St. Mary's Hospital in Waterbury. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. I represent the Connecticut Academy of PAs and I'm speaking to raise Bill 285, an act allowing medical assistance to administer vaccines. Um, in concept, we very much appreciate and support the intent of this raised bill. However, as it's currently written, we respectfully ask for physician assistance to be included in the ability to supervise the MAs alongside the already named physicians and advanced practice registered nurses. As you're likely aware, PAs work across all specialties and practice settings. Very often PAs work in environments where they are working in conjunction with an MA only, and thus the ability for PAs to be able to order a vaccination and have the MA administer it under the oversight of the PA is crucial. Such ability will ultimately increase access to care as PAs will be able to care for more patients in the time that would otherwise be spent performing the vaccinations themselves. Medical assistants are currently supervised by PAs in a multitude of settings as delegated by the physicians with whom we work in collaboration with. At the direction and with the oversight of the PAs, MAs have for over five decades acquired vital signs and lab specimens, applied dressings and splints, and performed a myriad of office-based testing. Um, it should be noted that the majority of APRNs in the state of Connecticut continue to work under collaboration agreements with physicians and not in an independent situation. This bill, however, applies to all APRNs, even the majority of whom are still working under agreements similar to those that PAs work under. And as CONAPA has previously discussed with this committee, exclusion of PAs from such statutes allows for interpretation that PAs should not be performing such acts by various workplace administrators. If SB 285 is passed without the inclusion of PAs, it will send a strong and erroneous message that PAs should not supervise MAs and all the care that they can and should be able to provide. If PAs are excluded from this bill, appropriate care will be reduced because of the new and unintentional barrier that will be imposed on the PA profession. And we've learned one thing from this past year during this pandemic is how disparate and limited access that healthcare already is. And I ask that this committee please not add further to those limitations and include PAs in this bill. And with that, we thank you for your time on this matter and your dedication to the patients and citizens of Connecticut. Thank you for your testimony. I was wondering when we were gonna hear from the PAs. Uh, this is why we on the committee so much love scope of practice uh, because everybody has a, a point of view. So thank you for that. Uh, Representative Jenga. Yes, thank you for your uh, testimony. Uh, under this bill, would PAs be required to get additional education and training? Um, not that we would envision, and not that as I see written in the bill, no. So as a professional expertise, you'd be able to do this without any further training? Correct. This, these are things that we do on a daily basis as it is. Um, I mean, I could very well order a vaccination and administer it myself, but instead we are just asking that we have the ability to have the MAs administer that for us. Um, it's not changing our scope of practice at all or our ability to order anything different. Um, we already have MAs providing other tasks to us. This is just one additional task. Um, and it's something that we already you know, could physically do ourselves or would have an RN do 
in place. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Any other questions or comments? If not, we'll move on to Dr. Stacy Taylor. Good afternoon, late afternoon, Senator Abrams and Representative Steinberg and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. On behalf of the physicians and physicians in training of the Connecticut State Medical Society, thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony in support of Raise Bill 285. Vaccines are key to the health and well being of our communities when administered by properly trained personnel with on site direction and supervision. CSMS strongly supports the ability of physicians to delegate appropriate procedures to qualified medical assistants, certified medical assistants who are appropriately trained and have been credentialed by a nationally accredited organization should be allowed to administer vaccines. All the medical assistants in our office are not only trained in performing vaccinations, but also have been trained in basic pharmacology and safe medication administration. However, they are unable to utilize that training. The administration of vaccines would occur under the direct supervision of a physician, meaning that the patient has been evaluated by the physician. The physician ordered the vaccine after determining it is appropriate and safe to administer is present at the site where the services are being performed, is able to provide guidance and assistance when needed, as well as emergency care in the event that an adverse reaction occurs. And that physician knows the medical assistant is trained and capable to give the vaccine. The supervisor must ensure that the tenants of safe medicine, medication administration, the right patient, the right drug, the right dosage, the right time, via the right route, and the right observation afterwards are adhered to. It is when those tenants have been overlooked that mistakes have been made by people of all levels in healthcare. I could find no data indicating that medical assistants have made any more mistakes than others in healthcare. It bears noting that emergency federal regulations presently permit pharmacy assistants with far less training to perform this task. My medical assistant is my right hand and has capably handled a variety of emergent issues from chest pain and fainting to potentially suicidal and violent patients before I've even entered the room. However, a simple procedure such as giving a vaccine for which she is trained, she is unable to do. I would be the one taking the responsibility for ordering the vaccine and understanding the implications of that vaccination and being responsible for the outcome. All I am asking is for the medical assistants and others like her to administer the vaccine while I can continue to do tasks that utilize the advanced training that I have received, including perhaps convincing another patient to get a vaccine. Many physicians, especially in primary care, and especially now, given additional economic hardships, may have difficulty finding much less affording. Uh, you've hit your three minute mark, if you could conclude your remarks. Okay. Um, they may not be able to afford an RN and even an LPN with a mean salary of 48,000, but they might be able to afford an MA with a mean salary of 32,000, who is more readily available. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony, doctor. Really appreciate you taking the time to weigh in on this important uh, bill. Uh, let's see if any committee members have any questions for you. Seeing none, uh, thank you very much for being here. Have a thank great evening. Thank you very much for listening. Of course. Um, next, we have number 96, Cynthia Stremba followed by number 99, Joseph Quaranta. Hi, uh, I'm Cynthia Stramb. I'm the Director of Volunteers for PAVE. I'm reading this on behalf of a PAVE mom from Avon, Connecticut. She writes, my name is Lori. Excuse me one minute. Can you tell us what PAVE it stands for, please? Oh, uh, yeah, I was gonna get to that. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> that's okay, Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes. Thank you, thank you. Um, my name is Lori. I'm a volunteer with Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes here in Connecticut. 
I joined PAVE because vaping has changed the course of my life and that of my son and I wanted to speak out. Today, I respectfully urge you to support SB 326. Our youngest son, now 23, is addicted to nicotine. We had no idea he had been vaping throughout high school and college. And it wasn't until I found the small colorful cartridges in his bedroom that I researched what they were and learned how harmful they actually are to his health. When I asked him why he started vaping, he said he was told that it would help him quit smoking, which at the time he thought was more harmful. He says he continues to vape because he believes it relieves his anxiety. As a prevention coordinator, I know that he and other youth continue to vape because they're addicted. They can't stop on their own. Although I've tried logic to reason with him, the truth is that his vaping habits have been solidified. He now has tremors, breathing problems, and high blood pressure. In my experience as a, as a prevention coordinator in Rocky Hill, students try vaping to fit in, to relax, alleviate boredom. They perceive vaping as harmless. It's not. The big tobacco companies don't think twice about how dangerous chemicals contained in their products will impact young hearts and lungs. It's all about the money. Our 23-year-old has been addicted to nicotine for years. We discussed quitting options with doctors and he's tried those options, but they haven't worked. Now we're even more concerned since a recent Stanford-led study has shown that our son has greatly in, a greatly increased chance of contracting COVID-19 and that the virus has been fatal for some with weakened lung capacity from smoking or vaping. As an advocate for youth, I have educated hundreds of youth and their families for over 20 years. We have learned that punishing students for addictive behavior doesn't end usage. They're addicted. They need to be detoxed and rehabilitated. Unfortunately, those types of programs are cost prohibitive or unavailable for many families. What we can do to end this addiction is to prohibit the sale of all flavored tobacco products. A 2020 Surgeon General report concluded that prohibiting flavors, including menthol, in tobacco products can benefit public health by reducing initiation among young people. Now remember that 90% of smokers begin smoking before the age of 18, 90%. Nicotine addiction is a youth issue. It becomes an adult issue only because youth get older. So please support SB 326 so that we can keep an entire generation of young people from becoming nicotine addicts and big tobaccos next lifetime customers. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very personal and moving testimony. Appreciate it. Um, are there any questions from the members of the committee? Seeing none, um, thank you so much for your time and for being here with us today. Have a good evening. You too. Um, next, we have number 99, Joseph Caranta, followed by 100, Jennifer Benham. Thank you, Senator Abrams and uh, other members of the Public Health Committee. Um, uh, I'm here today to testify in support of Senate Bill uh, 285. Uh, I am a primary care physician uh, practicing in Brantford, Connecticut, and I also am the president of the Community Medical Group, which is an organization of approximately 1,100 independent uh, clinicians, physicians, nurse practitioners across New Haven uh, and Fairfield counties. Um, on behalf of all the members of my organization, I encourage all of you to support this very important bill. Lots of issues have been discussed about this bill today. I won't re repeat them all, but I will highlight a few points uh, from a physician perspective. First of all, I, I, I do want to stress that the uh, ability for the medical assistant to administer the vaccine in this bill is delegated under the authority of the physician uh, supervising them. And, and I think that's an important point in that the physician ultimately bears responsibility for the actions of the person working under them, is working under the direct supervision of that physician uh, in the same geography as that physician, and that physician will have the ability to determine whether the medical assistant has the capability to administer that vaccine going forward. I think it's a very, very important point to understand that you're not just entrusting the medical assistant with the responsibility, but their supervising physicians who ultimately bear responsibility for the work that they do. The, the second point I wanna raise is, is, is an important point that's come up many times today is we are reaching a point where it is becoming very challenging for primary care practices to be able to deliver vaccinations in a timely manner in, in their offices. This is due to the overwhelming strain being put on these practices 
and the financial burdens that we're under. The ability to have uh, the option, and this is just the option, doesn't mean that we don't have to use RNs or LPNs to, to provide vaccines, but the option to use medical assistance will be an important tool in our ability to maintain services to our patients. And what we've learned uh, lately is that vaccine, and not just COVID vaccine um, compliance, but vaccine compliance across the board is a challenging public health issue that we all have to face uh, going forward. And I think the ability to get your vaccine in a trusted, safe, and known place is gonna be one of the key things to ensure vaccine compliance going forward. And the ability to continue to get vaccines in your primary care provider's office under the supervision of your physician is gonna be critical going forward. Um, I think that the, the final thing um, I would just mention to, to, to the group here is that um, there is uh, gonna be a great need going forward for more people to give vaccines and more people to support this activity. And this will really just allow us to continue to deliver a vaccine safely. So um, many other topics were brought up today in support of the bill. I think they're all very good points. I just wanted to highlight those and how important this is to both our patients and our independent providers. And I thank you all for your time today and uh, would be welcome to entertain any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, doctor. It's nice to see you again. And um, I would say, I, I do appreciate you bringing up the point that this would make it optional. It doesn't mean that anyone in their practice if they didn't want to do this would not be required to do it. Um, so thank you for that. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time. I know how busy you are, so I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, next, we have uh, Jennifer Benham, followed by number 103, Ruth, uh, Ruth Kenobi. Hi, thank you. Um, please vote against SB 285. Vaccination carries inherent risks. With the COVID-19 vaccines, as of January 29th, there were 453 deaths in the United States, 383 life-threatening reactions, and 156 people who suffered permanent disability. Medical assistants do not have the training or prescribing authority to administer life-saving treatments when serious adverse reactions occur. The bill also does not indicate what subjects would be covered in the proposed education. It would be encouraging if medical professionals advise patients on how to file a claim for vaccine injury, what side effects to watch for, and how to locate the vaccine injury table. For example, rubella vaccines are responsible for chronic arthritis and patients can be compensated for this debilitating injury. My friend's 20-year-old son has to take powerful immune suppressants to control his rheumatoid arthritis. My own son developed full body eczema and numerous food intolerances the day after his four month immunizations. I assumed the pediatrician would report the reaction as a matter of routine. Years later, I discovered it hadn't been reported and filed the VAERS report. Another friend's husband contracted GBS after a flu shot when he was in his late thirties. He now suffers mental health issues, constant neuropathy and is on permanent disability. His reaction was never reported and he certainly was not aware of the fact that he could have filed a claim for injuries. A few years ago, there was a massive recall of Takata airbags. At the time, there were over 60 million of them in the US. Most of the time, these airbags inflated properly and saved lives. Occasionally, they exploded and killed the occupant instead. Was the government response a mandate that all vehicles should be equipped Excuse with Takata me, airbags? Excuse me? Yes. Um, we, we need you to keep your testimony to the subject that's at hand. Okay, so whatever, with whatever one of these bills that you want to testify to, we're happy to hear your testimony, but we need you to stay on the topic. Thank you. Okay, well, in that instance, the government agreed that something designed to protect people shouldn't be killing them instead. Do you know how many deaths it took to issue a recall? 17. I'm not, I'm, again, I'm not seeing the, the correlation. If you can make that clear for me, perhaps. Well, over 9,000 deaths have been reported to VAERS from vaccination. Mm -hmm. So what number do we have to reach before you will consider the possibility that we need to reevaluate our vaccine program? Well, we're not, this isn't about our vaccine program. So that's what I'm, well, I guess that's what I'm having. Because I think you need to recognize that vaccines are not, not as innocuous this is not, as this, even afterwards. This is not, um, this is, None of our bills have to do with the vaccine program. So 
If, if you'd like to testify on one of the bills we have before us, I'm happy to hear you, but I All think right. otherwise I'm gonna to have to stop you there. Even our physicians may lack the skills necessary to assess a patient's vulnerabilities adequately and medical assistance certainly will be lacking in that expertise. In one government study, one in 50 had a serious adverse reaction and one in 35 developed a new onset chronic disease. And I linked that with my written testimony. I, I don't know so when- much. I appreciate it. But um, thank you. Okay. Are there any questions? Yeah. Um, I don't see any questions, so thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Um, next, we have next we have um, let's see. It seems that the, that we might have some speakers we didn't think we had. So let me go back here a minute. Um, Number 102, John Murphy. Are you available, Mr. Murphy? Yes, I am. Thank you so much for being here. Go right ahead. Good evening, Senator Darty Abrams, Representative Steinberg, members of the Public Health Committee. My name is John Murphy, and I'm here today representing paraeducators who work in Plymouth, Stratford, and Stamford. We're members of United Auto Workers Local 376. We are in favor of Senate Bill 288, an act concerning indoor air quality in schools uh, with amendments. Last March, you heard a similar bill, the same uh, title, and you heard uh, about deplorable conditions our students and our educators have had to endure. And today you've probably heard the same things and probably other things that have happened. Uh, we endure extreme heat and cold temperatures, respiratory problems due to mold, dust, and, and other things. Uh, our paras work one-on-one -on -one with special needs students, many who have underlying health issues and are even more susceptible to unhealthy air. With one in 13 school-aged children having asthma, uh, it's triggered by airborne particles and leads to lack of learning. Uh, and the bill was you know, well-received until, again, the state shut down last year. Now we have COVID to deal with. Um, so I'd just like to urge you to pass air, indoor air quality standards for, for our schools and, and keep in mind what's going on with COVID. Uh, we have standards in pet stores and kennels for minimum maximum temperature standards and ventilation. We think children and educators should have the same. And uh, I know I'm lucky to have uh, both of my legislators serve on this committee, Senator Anwar and uh, Representative Jenga. And Senator Anwar can tell you about the long-term effects of airborne uh, foreign agents and Representative Jenga taught at East Hartford High School and can attest to how extremely hot and cold temperatures affect student learning. So, so we urge you to pass this bill. We urge you to talk to your leadership about it and get the governor to pass it. And I'd like you to talk to our congressional delegation and work with President Biden to secure funding to upgrade all our air handling systems. And if that's, if we don't get it all there, then we really need to think about funding it to the, through school bonding. You know, not only will you provide a safer environment for educators and students, but you will employ hundreds if not thousands of tradespeople to retrofit our schools. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Murphy. Um, appreciate it. I, I too, am a, I'm a retired educator, so I know firsthand what those conditions are. So this is a very important bill to me. Um, and you are well represented on this committee. So um, let's see, uh, Representative Jenga. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Murphy, thank you for your testimony, but you mentioned amendments. Could you expound on what amendments you think should be made? Well, there's nothing about COVID 
in the bill. And I don't know, again, I know that you're talking about uh, omnibus bills or aircraft carrier bills that are going to deal with COVID and maybe they get folded in, but it seems to me it should be specifically addressed, uh, addressed here. You know, if we can open, everyone wants our kids back in the schools and our teachers back in the schools and, and to feel safe about it. I know Don Williams uh, has told me, and I, I'm sure he testified today that uh, when he was first selectman, he found in his town of Thompson, he found that some of the air filters in the schools had not been changed in decades. Uh, you know, we need to have a system that will require regular maintenance. And uh, so it, it's just, we need, we need to think about how COVID fits into all this. And that, again, I found that, that to be absent in the bill. So that's my biggest uh, issue. Okay. Good point, thank you. All set, Representative. Thank you, Representative Jenkins. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, and Senator Kushner. Senator Kushner, did you have a question? Your hand's raised. I was muted on two forms and I thought I was unmuted. I have to unmute in two places. I apologize. <laughs> I was saying how much I appreciate John's testimony today on behalf of these workers. And uh, I used to represent those workers when I was with the UAW. And uh, I think it's so important to recognize the conditions that uh, people work in, in our public schools. And, you know, I appreciate that you also raised the issue of the students and particularly the students that need special attention and how you know this is an area we really need to address and i hope we address it uh, sooner it's, it's gone on for far too long um i, I just wondered if in, uh, i know there are, are many issues that uh, affect the indoor air quality uh and you've talked about a few of them are there any others that you want to bring to our attention as we discuss this in this session Um, no, not really. I mean, we've had, uh, we've had experts that know far more about this than I, like Steve Schrag, uh, that talked about it. But again, we, we need, we need, we need to do a better job, especially again with the paraeducators, like you said, they work with special, a lot of the special needs kids, they can't work six feet away. They have to be in close contact with, with our, with our students that are in special needs and, uh, Sometimes they can't wear masks. So until we get everybody vaccinated, we need we need to increase the uh, the quality of the air handling in the schools. I, I agree with you on that point as well, because my daughter-in-law uh, is a educator in the Meriden schools, and she works with the three and four-year-olds who uh, have special needs, and she often they often don't aren't able to wear masks. And so I think you're bringing this up to us today is really critically important, and I appreciate all the work that you're doing on behalf of these workers and also the students that they are working with. Thank you. All set, Senator. Um, Senator Moore. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony, uh, John Murphy. I appreciate that. You know, you, I, I don't think any of us would disagree that we need to, to look at this, but you did bring up a good point that if it's not going to be uh, bonding, that we need to speak to our federal legislature, le legislators if this passes, uh, because I think it's going to be a, a even larger problem in the future when you consider how many teachers and, and children have gone through this COVID and may have lung problems. So um, I also mind bonding. So if this makes it through, you've got a champion here for it, okay? Very good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Anwar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just wanted to say hello to John and then let him know that uh, obviously we are going to be supporting this. This is much needed. As I mentioned earlier, um, I see um, uh, people from the Department of Correction and the teachers at the same level. It's almost like the in indoor environment for both the places are pretty bad, but, but the teachers are almost at the same level telling us how bad some of the schools are you know, with their indoor air. So thank you again. Thank you. Okay. 
Yes, and I just want to remind everyone that this was a bill that was of great interest to this committee uh, pre-COVID. So it's only become more essential since. So I think that now is the time to really act on it. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Murphy, for your testimony and for being with us tonight. Thanks for having me. Sure. Um, we're going to go to Robert Dudley now. Robert Dudley. Hi, thank you. Thank you. So thank you. And uh, so dear joint Senate and House Public Committee chairs, ranking members and committee members, I'm Dr. Rob Dudley a primary care pediatrician from New Britain and the immediate past president of the Connecticut chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'm testifying on behalf of our nearly 700 pediatric members in favor of SB number 326. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this important issue. E-cigarettes are the most commonly used tobacco products amongst youth and are rising at an alarming rate. As a school medical advisor, I hear about the explosion of vaping at middle and high schools across the state. Many schools now have to close or monitor their bathrooms due to e-cigarette use, and data through 2020 indicate a continued sleep, steep climb in teen vaping. Currently, about one in four high school students in Connecticut use e-cigarettes. E-cigarettes contain a liquid solution that's usually flavored, and the flavors can come in and include gummy bear, cotton candy, cherry crush, and many others that appeal to kids. These are often marketed in bright colors using popular imagery. Studies show that favors play a major role in youth use of tobacco products such as e-cigarettes and cigars. And a government study has found that over 81% of kids who have ever used tobacco products started with a flavored product. Um, tobacco companies have a long history of developing and marketing flavored products as starter products to attract kids. Flavors improve the taste and reduce the harshness of tobacco, making them more appealing and easier for beginners, often kids to try and ultimately become addicted. Since most tobacco users start before the age of 18, flavored tobacco products play a critical role in the industry's marketing playbook. Flavors can also create the impression that a product is less harmful than it really is. The issue is one of also of one of health equity. Tobacco companies have historically targeted menthol flavored products to communities of color. As a result, 85% of adult African-Americans who smoke cigarettes are smoking menthol cigarettes compared to 29% of white smokers. Menthol boosts nicotine's effects, making cigarettes more addictive, and most African-American youth start smoking with a menthol-flavored product. Removing them from stores is an important step in reducing the disparities in tobacco-related mortality suffered by this community. As pediatricians, we take the long view on preventative health for our patients. Flavorings and in tobacco products pose a danger of lifelong nicotine addiction with all the associated morbidity and mortality that we've, we have fought so hard over the past couple of decades to eliminate. Please support this common sense legislation to protect our youth. Thank you. Thank you very much for that testimony. Really appreciate you taking the time. Um, are there any questions from the committee members? Seeing none, thank you and have a great evening. Thank you so much, you as well. Um, next we have Ruth Kenobi. Good evening, distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. Um, my name is Ruth Canovi. I'm the Director of Advocacy for the American Lung Association in Connecticut. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. We've submitted written testimony on three bills, um, Senate Bill 115 about tobacco-free pharmacies, Senate Bill 288 around indoor air quality in schools, and Senate Bill 326 removing flavored tobacco products from the marketplace. The COVID-19 pandemic has placed increased attention on lung health, and I commend the committee for your prioritization of the policies so cl clearly linked to our health. We support all three of these bills, and I'd like to spend the majority of my time on Senate Bill 326, which we strongly support. The need is clear. Even in 2021, tobacco use is a very present and real issue in Connecticut, impacting too many. 4,900 Connecticut residents die annually due to tobacco. Tobacco costs Connecticut more than $2 billion annually. And considering the presence of COVID-19 and the numerous tobacco-caused diseases, it is imperative to prevent youth from starting to use tobacco and to help everyone quit. So why address flavors? Flavors are one of the main reasons kids use tobacco products. 
The National Youth Tobacco Survey in 2020 revealed that teens made several notable changes in how they used e-cigarettes. When very limited federal action removed a small number of pod-based um, flavored e-cigarettes from the market, youth followed the flavors. And disposable e-cigarettes, which can still be flavored, use, the use skyrocketed, skyrocketed by 1,000% among high school e-cigarette users and 400% among middle school e-cigarette users. But it's not just about e-cigarettes. And so we need a comprehensive approach and not pick winners and losers of public health protections based on the method of nicotine addiction. We must treat all tobacco products the same. The health disparities we see with tobacco use and tobacco related disease are some of the reasons the Lung Association supports prohibiting the sale of all flavored tobacco products. Continued proof of the impact of flavors a recent study showed that while overall cigarette use declined by 26% over the past decade, 91% of that decline was due to non-menthol cigarettes, showing just how impactful flavors are because the only flavor that is allowed is menthol cigarettes still. And flavored cigars are a growing issue. Sales of flavored cigars have increased by nearly 50% since 2008. I've heard a lot today about the need to educate. We learned a great deal from our policy successes with traditional combustible products. The Lung Association has long advocated for program funding for tobacco prevention and cessation programs, in addition to policies that limit access, like pricing, addressing social norms, like where you can and cannot use these products, raising the legal age of sale and removing flavors from the marketplace. Connecticut is surrounded by states that have taken action on flavored tobacco products, and we have the opportunity to do this right and protect all young lives from the toll of a lifelong addiction to tobacco. Thank you for your leadership on tobacco for a long time in this committee, and I'm happy to entertain any questions you may have, but I really thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, and thank you for the work you do on behalf of the people of Connecticut. Appreciate it. Um, are there any questions or comments from the members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for being here and for your testimony. Thank you, have a good evening. You too. Um, next, we have uh, Michelle Parente, number 104, followed by number 108, Linda Alderman. Michelle Parente, are you with us? I see you there, but you're on mute. Michelle Parente. Okay, we'll move on to Linda Alderman. Linda, are you with us? I am. Great, thank you so much. Esteemed members of the Public Health Committee, my name is Linda Alderman. I live in West Hartford and I'm a volunteer with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. I'm here to testify in support of Senate Bill 326 and I thank you for the opportunity. Connecticut's children need your protection right now. The US Surgeon General has stated that 56,000 children alive today in Connecticut will die prematurely from the effects of smoking if changes are not made to modify current behavior. More than 80% of teens who have ever used tobacco and more than 95% of teens who have ever used e-cigarettes started with a flavored product and the use of flavored products make it much harder to quit. Flavors are a marketing weapon, which the tobacco and e-cigarette industries use to target young people for a lifetime of addiction. A significant percentage of youth who use e-cigarettes do not even know that these products contain nicotine. A typical jewel cartridge or pod, however, contains about as much nicotine as a pack of 20 regular cigarettes. Approximately 25% of high school students in Connecticut currently use e-cigarettes, and over 70% of these students use flavors. Further, almost half of adolescents who smoke use menthol-flavored cigarettes. And the tobacco and e-cigarette industries don't only target our children. They target racial and ethnic minority populations as well. And smoking in underserved communities has further exacerbated the health disparities that these marginalized groups already experience. Menthol tobacco products are more heavily advertised to Black Americans and low-income populations, 
and 85% of all Black Americans who smoke use menthol cigarettes. My family was directly and detrimentally impacted by the targeted marketing of the tobacco industry. My father, who enlisted in the US Army Air Force in 1942 at the age of 17 to defend our country in World War II, quickly became addicted to cigarettes because the tobacco industry targeted the military to create a generation of cigarette smokers. Although he desperately tried, my father was never able to break his addiction to nicotine and he eventually died of lung cancer after years of suffering. He often told me that his addiction at such a young age led to his inability to quit smoking. The tobacco industry is targeting our state's young citizens and vulnerable underserved communities by flavoring tobacco and e-cigarette products so that there will be yet another generation of nicotine addicts, addicts to buy their products. I'm here today testifying because my father cannot be and I'm asking you to protect Connecticut's youth and underserved communities from being the tobacco and e-cigarette industry's easy mark and from a lifetime of addiction, health problems, and from a potentially early and painful death. Please pass Senate Bill 326 and end the sale of all flavored cigarettes, tobacco products, electronic nicotine delivery systems, and vapor, vapor products. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Alderman. Thank you very much for your testimony and for sharing your personal experience as well. It's really My pleasure. Meaningful. Um, are there any questions or comments from the members of the committee? Seeing none, I'm going to thank you and say have a nice evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, next, we have uh, 110, Mary Jordan followed by 111, Maggie Cleary. Mary Jordan, are you here with us? Yes, thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Daughtry, Daughtry Abrams, Representative Steinberg and all the members of this public health committee. I'm a teacher certified in social studies and French and the president of the Norwalk Federation of Teachers. I'm also divisional vice president of AFT Connecticut for pre-K-12. Our members include more than 15,000 teachers, paraprofessionals, school nurses, and other school personnel across the state. It is on behalf of certified educators in AFT Connecticut that I reach out to you today to support SB 288. This legislation would establish reasonable standards for air quality and requires communication about complaints regarding air quality. COVID of course makes air quality issues even more important than ever since effective ventilation reduces risks significantly. We would like to see the gymnasium temperature standard applied to the rest of the school as well in Middletown, Wethersfield and Norwalk as it has been mentioned previously today. There have been temperatures um, on all ranges of the spectrum including this winter hovering at around 50 degrees that lasts for three or four or more hours or even full school days. It's not okay. Problems are not confined to old buildings. In Norwalk, in a building that had a $75 million renovation in 2005 with good hardworking maintenance staff, we have employees getting sick for years due to mold, dust, humidity, and air quality issues. Um, there are incidents of rashes, headaches, burning feelings, swelling in skin, eyes, uh, and lips and throats, chronic unexplained hair loss, serious respiratory infections related to building conditions. People have had to leave early, call out sick, take leaves, and even retire early due to poor health, all in ways that have been documented to be related to the building conditions. Since 2015, in this building, we've had floods of water and sewage, mold, mold remediation, OSHA inspections, citations with recommendations and requirements. We had a Yukon Occupational Health and Environmental Medicine study with recommendations. We're still waiting on some of the recommendations to be implemented when one study follows another. The union has had to file FOIA complaints to obtain air testing results. And we really have never been able to get good, uh, good records of air filter changes. That's something else that was mentioned earlier today. Troubling conditions and health problems persist. Occasionally we have great cooperation from the district. The reporting and notification in this bill is important and will really help very significantly in this issue. School employees all over the state work in environments of excessive dust, 
humidity, mold, heat, cold, and poor ventilation. Better and more regular information with clearly established standards for air quality and notification of building complaints will contribute to more informed decision making locally and can help build better relationships between the parties. This legislation promises a good improvement in our ability to understand, discuss, and address air quality in buildings in an informed manner while we safeguard the health of our students and staff. We request that funds also be made available. That has been discussed. We would definitely need to support this with funds um, to support the needed improvement. Thank you very much for your time and service to um, this issue and to Connecticut's residents. Thank you so much. And I just have to say, as I've been trying to say to all the educators who are here that you have all gone above and beyond. And I'm just so proud to be a retired educator myself. And, can't imagine what you've all done during this pandemic. So I thank, I you. thank you so much. Um, are there any questions or comments from the members of the committee? I don't see any. I think you know from listening that there's a lot of support for this bill and, and um, so I hope we can move it forward. Thank, thank you, you very much. Um, next, we have Maggie Cleary followed by Michelle Parente. Hi, I'm here. How are you? Good. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, Senator Doherty Adams, uh, Abram, sorry, Representative Steinberg and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Margaret Cleary, and I've been a registered nurse at Danbury Hospital for three years, and I'm the legislative liaison for Danbury Nurses AFT Local Unit 47. I'm here to testify against Senate Bill 285, an act allowing medical assistance to administer vaccines. Though administering a vaccine may seem like a simple task that anyone could do with minimum, minimal training, it is more complicated. It, is, it involves knowledge of the pharmacolo pharmacology, anatomy, and most important, assessment skills to evaluate for reactions or contraindications to the vaccine. Assessment skills are not part of a medical assistant training and therefore they do not have this competency. There is a reason that registered nurses go through extensive training to enhance their ability to constantly assess their patients. It is a patient safety issue to allow medical assistance to administer vaccines. According to the Premier Safety Institute, improper use of syringes, needles, and medication vials during routine healthcare procedures, such as administering injections, have resulted in more than 50 outbreaks and 150,000 patient notifications in U.S. hospitals and non-hospitals setting, settings with transmission of bloodborne viruses, including hepatitis B and hepatitis C virus, to more than 600 patients. This proves that there are considerable risks involved in vaccine administration. Additionally, it is inappropriate and inequitable to be placing higher levels of burden and responsibility on a less educated and extremely lower paid professional without increasing their pay and education along with the added responsibility. The average RN in Connecticut makes about $38 an hour. And on the other hand, a medical assistant on average makes about $18 an hour. These wage disparities are based on the amount of education required for the position, as well as the significance of their responsibility. Um, the wage disparity shows that it would be unfair and unsafe to give a highly technical task carrying higher risk to a person with less training and less compensation for their expertise. I understand that it will be argued that this bill will aid in a swift administration for the COVID-19 vaccine. While we all agree that we want the vaccine distributed as quickly as possible, it must be done safely. This is a new vaccine with many known and possibly unknown side effects, which create even more need for a highly skilled professional to administer the vaccine. It is also not necessary to increase the amount of people eligible to administer the vaccine when there are over 11,000 licensed nurses and other healthcare professionals who have volunteered on the COVID-19 vaccine registry to help with the vaccine. While this is anecdotal, I will offer that I received an email asking if I would help administer the COVID-19 vaccine in Connecticut and responded that I would. I have heard nothing back regarding this. Additionally, Danbury Hospital, where I'm employed, has not asked me or, to my knowledge, any other staff nurses to assist with administering the vaccine. We need to be focused on mobilizing qualified professionals and allocating funds to pay them rather than allowing underqualified and underpaid professionals to administer exceedingly important medical care. Senate Bill 285 will put patients at greater risk by allowing underqualified and underpaid individuals to administer life-saving vaccinations and is not necessary in order to distribute the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions or comments from the members of the committee? 
Senator Kushner. You're on mute. I just, it takes me a minute to unmute, but um, I, I just appreciate your testimony here today. Uh, being uh, the Senator from Danbury, I have a great appreciation for the nurses and all the medical employees at the hospital. You've done an amazing job to keep us safe and to treat people who have had COVID. And, and you know, I've had the opportunity to meet with you all before and tell you how much we appreciate your service. Um, but I thought I would take this opportunity publicly as well. Uh, you know, I, I, we have had a lot of testimony on both sides of this issue today. And um, I guess I'm, I'm interested in your experience as a nurse and what the adverse reactions are that you have seen that you're able to identify and what your training is to be, that puts you in a position to have that expertise and to be able to have that within your scope of practice. Absolutely. Thank you for your, your thanks. Um, I would say that, you know, first you have to assess the vaccination site. You need to find the correct muscle to put it in, make sure it's getting in the right space. Um, I've heard with this, for particularly the COVID-19 vaccine, um, the anaphylactic reactions and things like that to react to. Um, there can be muscle, um, there can be like site reactions. Um, there can be immediate reactions to the vaccine. And then you also have to, throughout the process, maintain like sterile technique and stuff, stuff to make sure that the bloodborne illnesses and such don't happen while administering the vaccine. And thank you for that answer. And I know that this bill, the way it's drafted, is not just uh, particularly for COVID-19. And I know that, you know, from what we've been hearing, there haven't been a lot of reactions, particularly to the first vaccination that people receive. Um, but are there other vaccines that uh, this bill would allow uh, medical assistance uh, to administer that uh, could have a higher rate of uh, reaction? And, and so was that something we should be concerned about? No, oh, I'm not 100% sure on the um, reactions to other vaccines and such. I don't personally do tons of vaccinations. The only one I've really experienced is the flu shot, which is a less higher acuity one. And I haven't done many other vaccinations as um, a hospital nurse, so I can't really speak to that. Okay, thank you. But thank you for being here to testify and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I don't see any other questions. And Ms. Cleary, I just want to say thank you so much for your work throughout this pandemic. We know what our healthcare workers have done and it's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Have a good evening. Um, next, we have Michael Briscoe, number 112, followed by number 114, Christopher Algo. So Michael, are you with yep, us? Yep. Thank I you. am. Right ahead. Thank All right, can you, can you hear me? Awesome. Yes, we can. Good. To the honorable co-chairs and member of the Public Health Committee, we the undersized opposed uh, raised uh, Senate Bill number 326, which would ban the sale of flavored tobacco products. We, oppo we oppose punitive laws that disproportionately affect African-Americans. Senate Bill 326 includes menthol cigarettes, which is the preferred choice of the over 80% of African-Americans who choose to smoke cigarettes. A ban on menthol cigarettes would give police another reason to interact negatively on the retail level or the individual citizen for a low level nonviolent offense. At a time in which we know the interactions between law enforcement and young men and women of color lead to all too often tragic results, we should be looking at a way to lessen any negative encounters in our community with law enforcement. All Connecticut residents under the age of 21 are already banned from purchasing any tobacco products. Prohibiting adults from being able to purchase menthol cigarettes in an effort to address the sale of tobacco products to minors will principally affect African-American smokers. We believe Senate Bill 326 creates another racially, another racially discriminatory public policy and will lead to increased crime, target enforcement, unfair treatment, and illegal street sales. Emphasize illegal street sales. It is for these reasons we oppose Senate Bill 326 and urge you to vote no on this measure. Thank you. Thank you so much for that testimony. Appreciate it. Are there any questions or comments from the members of the committee? 
Seeing none, Mr. Briscoe, I'm gonna thank you and have a good evening. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have Michelle Parente. Michelle, are you with us? Yes, I am, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So sorry about the technical difficulties earlier. Um, I am Michelle Parenti from Parenti Laurel Funeral Home. Uh, we've been in business since 1940. I am third generation funeral director and uh, current operator and part owner with my father. And uh, we are opposed to the uh, act concerning food and beverage in funeral homes. And uh, permit me to kind of speak for the heart. I will not have so much as uh, percentages to give you, but basically as licensed funeral directors and embalmers, uh, we wear many hats. We were therapists, we're lawyers, and sometimes we're even florists, but um, our facilities are really not built for catering. They, I mean, our building itself is almost a hundred years old. And uh, serving food in an establishment that's not originally built to handle that is quite the task. Um, I really also feel knowing a lot of the owners of catering halls and restaurants personally, I think this bill would actually take away from their opportunity, you know, other small businesses to make money in such, you know, hard times during a pandemic you know, the food industry suffers enough. And quite honestly, funeral homes, we've also suffered. We um very underappreciated at the moment, I think. And uh, it's really sad, but, um, you know, we adhere to all these laws and, and we do them gladly because it's our job. And, you know, I think we feel a little left behind and a little, um, it's kind of like a slap in the face to have this bill come up out of nowhere in the middle of a pandemic with on top of everything else that we do and we do it gladly do not get me wrong but to have to serve food and beverages is just right now not a good idea considering we can barely have anyone in our funeral homes to begin with so and you know everyone's required to wear a mask gladly and to serve food and beverage just makes no sense. You literally have to take your mask off to eat or drink. In fact, we don't even let anyone use our water fountain right now because that requires taking your mask off. So, you know, a funeral home is just that. It's a place to conduct funerals alone and um, facilities like ours, are they're a place of worship uh, where you can go and you pay your respects to a loved one you've lost and um, you, pay, you pray for their soul. And um, traditionally, a repass is done after the funeral is over. So I think for most people to have to come back to the funeral home after they've just been there for two days, sometimes three, and to re, you know, hash up those horrible feelings of being in the funeral home, it's not a pleasant place for most people. So I think going to a actual restaurant or catering hall is a better option for them. And I, I also feel that this bill is like devoid of public safety entirely. Just, especially now during a pandemic, it just makes no sense to me. So, and I will leave it at that. <laughs> and thank you very much for allowing me to speak and for your time, everyone. No, thank you for being here, Ms. Parente. Really appreciate you taking the time to um, give us your perspective. Um, thank you. I do have some questions for you, sure. Senator Moore. Yes, Senator Moore. Senator Moore. We can't hear you, so just so you know. Senator Moore, are you there? Give your hand raised, but you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. There you go. I said to uh, Ms. Parenti. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I know them very well. I grew up on Washington oh. Avenue. <laughs> Hi, how are so you? So I, I know the Laurel Parenti Funeral Home. And you know, when I heard this bill the first time, it just struck a chord like I couldn't understand. I've been to a lot of funeral homes. Um, yes. Uh, and I don't, I mean, and you've got a really nice one there on Washington. And I know you've improved the parking lot and you have a, a, a beautiful location. Thank you. I just don't understand why anybody would want to be at a place where you just had a funeral and then go eat there. And who has yeah. the capacity? It's got to be a very small number of people who have the capacity to host an event. 
Yes. Yeah, that's another thing, capacity. Okay. Yeah. So yep. I didn't understand where this was coming from. I, I don't think it's a good idea. I do think about the health implications also. But also yes. the aesthetic yeah. of having food in a place where you're having uh, uh, a, uh, any type of funeral, you know, even if it's a short one. Um, yeah. But I was wondering how many large funeral homes do you know of that could really handle a capacity of 100 Honestly, people? off the top of my head, probably just a handful. I mean, I know, and that's just Fairfield County. That's all I know. But I mean, I'm sure in other counties, there's probably, maybe there is bigger funeral homes, but... Yeah, I mean, the majority, you know, we're still, a lot of us are still family owned and operated. So we don't really have the capacity. And like you said, we do have the capacity, but we're still opposed. <laughs> and then I look at the other side of this, that there, there's a, I think some of this is about etiquette and where you would go to eat. And I know that repast people start to become to go to a place of celebration. Yes. Not mourning. And, um, I just see it as, as a strange request to try and turn it into a, a funeral home into a, a catering A party. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And so, it's, you know, you. funerals are very still, even though we're during COVID and everything, we still do a lot of very much traditional funerals. And a lot of people do not appreciate a party in the funeral home. You know, it's a time of somber, unfortunately, but that's just what it is. Well, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Moore. Um, I don't see any other questions. So thank you very much, Ms. Parente, for your testimony. And thank you for the work that you're doing. I know your industry has been thank you. hard during this time. So thank you. We thank appreciate you. that. Thank you. Um, thank you all for everything you do, too. I've been watching this since 9 o'clock this morning. and all the bills that are up and running and and it's been oh, an eye opener i'm gonna i'm sure. gonna hold you one more minute because representative oh, okay. jenga has his hand up representative jenga did you have a question for miss Bronte? yeah uh, to her point about this bill coming up uh, during the pandemic this bill was uh, heard last year and actually went through public hearing and okay it's my it's my understanding that it's optional it's not a requirement so, well, so there's a very fine line with optional because in order to keep up with competition per se, if the other guy or woman offers this, then you kind of have to offer it too. But I see what you're saying. Okay. Uh, also, I'm not sure, but I remember from last year, there were many other states. Do you have any idea how many other states allow this? I think we are one of the two last states that don't allow it. And okay, to so that, and to that, I would say, you know, if they all go jump off a bridge, do we go jump off a bridge with them? <laughs> I don't see the analogy, but. Well, I like to think that, you know, Connecticut, we're very, uh, you know, it's New England, it's Connecticut. So maybe we are a little more traditional than everybody else. And maybe we should stand strong on some points and not just fall in line with all the other states. That's the beauty of our government. Each state is different. Uh, you're on mute, Representative Jenga, you're on mute. I don't know how that happened. Sorry about that. Uh, but it was my understanding that it could be as a, like a, a particular day like this where people are offered cookies and coffee, not a particular catering. That could be allowed if, but I don't, I don't really see people who uh, would, as you said, want to have a, a meal in a, in a funeral home. No. Well, I think we're allowed during arrangements to give packaged foods. So yeah, maybe them, some coffee and some cookies, but I find it hard to believe that anybody wants to eat. During arrangements, people come in, they, they're not thinking about food. They're thinking about their deceased loved one and how they're gonna handle sure. this all and you know, how they're gonna pay for it. The last thing they're thinking about is food. But so, this would be a choice. This would be a choice. 
it, it would be another option, sure, but I, I just, I don't, I don't think it's a good option. And like I said before, I think it, I think it takes away from the catering halls. There's some really big catering halls, especially around us. And for them to not use their hall, yeah, they can ship the food to us, but guess what? Then they don't get the charge of charging for using their hall. And I mean, they, they're gonna, they're gonna lose out. I think restaurants, they've lost out quite a bit so far. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. I, I, it Thank hasn't you. changed my mind. I appreciate okay. it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll start Representative Jenga. Yes, I am. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Representative Cook. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Michelle, I just, I have a couple of questions. Are you, are you believing that this bill is for full-blown catering? or just for the family members to have some food if they're standing there greeting um, visitors that are paying their respects to a loved one that has passed on? I believe it will turn into full-blown catering. Yeah, you're opening the, a door, you're opening Pandora's box to right, full-blown catering in a funeral home during COVID. But that's, not, but that's not what this bill does as it reads right now, correct? Uh, I, uh, uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I just know that serving any kind of food or beverage in the funeral homes right now is just not a good idea. So I think that as, so I come from Missouri um, okay. and, and we have had for as long as, so 51 years old, so as many funerals as I've been in for my 51 years, there's always been the ability for a family to have um, some type of nourishment in the back room, not for the general public, um, to be able to keep up their stamina to greet the visitors that are paying their respects to the, the loved one that has passed on. Um, I'm not right now advocating one way or another for whether this bill should or shouldn't pass, but it's for, it's for conversation as to the bill's merits. I do not believe in any way, shape, or form this legislation is about a full-blown catering option um, or pitting restaurant against, if you will, a funeral home. Um, the way that I, the way that I interpret this is this is about when my father passed away, there was 850 people that came through the receiving line at a funeral home. We were there for eight and a half hours. And if I went by, and it was in Missouri, but if I went by that policy here, I would have had to have missed some of those folks that were paying their respects, or I would have had to have in my world left the respect that I was doing for my father and my family to leave the premises to go get something in my body and not go without something in my system for over eight hours or even my children at that point. So yeah, that's, my that's question, a very long funeral. <laughs> Usually yes, they're not that not, long. <laughs> but that's not uncommon for folks that have lengthy stays. I think we have to get past the COVID pandemic because there will definitely be life past COVID. And so what I'm asking is, do you find it to be a problem for a family member or for families, if they have food in the back room, not a catering event, because if my understanding is right now, you're not even allowed to have coffee or tea. It's only supposed to be water. Um, do you have a problem with coffee, tea, and small so, for not just not the family like member and not the bus, But people are gonna do what they want, even in my facility, I cannot control everyone. And they bring in what they want when they want, anyways. So there's really the not right much right I can though. do about that. But yeah, right now I have the right if they try and bring in 15 platters of, you know, food that is going to make a complete disaster of my funeral home. Sure, I have the right to say no. Chances are, and I'm probably not just speaking for myself. I'm not the only funeral home that won't say no. But guess what? I have that right, and this bill takes away that right. I don't believe the bill takes away the right. I think it the will. bill gives the option. I think the bill gives the options for family members for facilities that choose to offer a family, only a family. In my world, I believe it's only a family, not the general public. It's just the folks that are there in the receiving. Well, line. then try try controlling that. <laughs> I mean, it just this just it just opens Pandora's box. I don't know how else to explain it. That's just my point of view. No, that's, that's fine. I just was, for clarification, I, you know, we're, we're one out of two, I believe, states that do not offer this. 48 other ones or 47 other states offer this. Um, yeah. 
So I'm just, you know, and I've had I've had uh, funeral home directors on both sides of this aisle reach out to me. So I was just curious as to what your interpretation of the bill was because the actual bill I don't believe has anything to do in its current form. And I think that's very important that we are honest about what the bill states in its current form. And in its current form, it does not say anything about catering for the general public. Um, to my knowledge, I believe it's only for the family members that are paying. Yeah, and, and, and that'll be extremely hard to control. Well, I mean, and that's, you know. that's to each his own. I'm not going to debate that, but I just yeah. wanted for clarification. Okay. So sure. thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you for your thank you. Um, indulgence. Thank you, Representative. Representative Terziak. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to associate myself with Representative Jenga's comments. I think there's nothing wrong with having some Lorna Dunes and hot chocolate and diet <laughs> soda for the family, to, whether it's a long or it's a short um, visitation, whether there's anybody there or not. Uh, I myself was first introduced to this issue I asked the young widow if she would like anything. And she said, yeah, I'm dying for a Diet Coke. I went to see if they had Diet Coke instead of Diet Pepsi. And it turned out they had nothing because we don't allow them to serve anything except for water. Um, there's, you don't have to go too far in America to get a Diet Coke. So everything worked out. But I think that along with Representative Cook, there's space here to be nicer to the family. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, to be nicer to everybody who comes in, really. A plate of cookies, some hot chocolate. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. I don't see, you've been so patient, Ms. Conte. Thank you so sure. much for your time and, and no for problem. your comments and uh, answering all the committee's questions. So thank you Absolutely. so much and have a good evening. Thank you, you too. Take care. Um, next, we have number 114, Christopher Aldu. How are you doing? I am a gas station owner and convenience store owner in both Massachusetts and Connecticut. I would like to speak to you about why the flavor and menthol ban would be detrimental to our business and community. Since I have gas stations and convenience stores in Massachusetts, as well as Connecticut, I'm in a unique position to discuss what the menthol flavor ban did to our business and community. First off, it is important to understand that the tobacco category on an average convenience store makes up about 60% of our total inside store sales. And of that 25 to 30% is menthol and flavors. Keeping all of this in mind, the average tobacco customer does not just buy tobacco. They buy gas, snacks, coffee, beverages, and lottery. When Massachusetts banned menthol and flavors, we lost that customer, but we didn't only lose the sale of a pack of smokes. We lost the customer who bought other basket items, sending our average store sales down 25%. What's worse is we also lost gas revenue. Due to this loss, I had to cut my employment in some of my stores over 50%, simply because we did not have enough business anymore. Currently, I'm considering closing at least one of my three locations because it is not profitable anymore. I believe that this is a federal issue, not a state issue. Banning the sale only pushes buyers to surrounding states, having the unintended result of hurting our local business. In Massachusetts, most of the customers we had for menthol are flooding the New Hampshire border and buying cigarettes at half the price and reselling to our community. Things are so bad in Massachusetts that it's currently considering rescinding the menthol ban. They have a bill up for vote, amended, Amendment 224 of Senate Bill 4. Currently, it is illegal to sell cigarettes to anyone under the age of 21. Also, many have talked about selling Lucy's. This is also illegal. Please do not punish us for people and stores that break the law. We are trying to make a living and service our community lawfully. Our stores are essential as COVID-19 has shown. It boggles my mind that the state would consider legalizing weed, but wants to ban menthol cigarettes. What's next? Are we going to ban flavored liquor or Hennessy because it's a minority drink? Where do we as a society draw the line? This bill is aimed at protecting youth it is important to know that the cigarette and tobacco use by youth is at an all time low. In fact, in the past decade, cigarette usage has gone from 15.8% to 
to an all-time low of 4.6%. It looks like what we are doing is correct. We are carding. We are doing the right things. In summary, how can something that costs jobs and destroys small business be beneficial to the community? How can lost customers, lost revenues to the state be helpful to our community? Small business is under tremendous strain, rising rents, minimum wage, property taxes, not to mention the devastation from COVID has destroyed years of hard work from an average business owner. In some cases, small business owners are taking in more and more debt to survive. Are we? We need, to, we need you to hear us. We need you to understand. Passing this bill will destroy us. Thank you. If you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Aldo. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, are there any questions or comments from the members of the committee? Seeing none, I'm going to thank you so much for your testimony. Oh, you. I'm sorry, just a minute. Representative Jenga. Hi, um, thank you for your testimony. I, I see that you have businesses in both uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut. Yes, I do. Okay, what is the law regarding this in Massachusetts? Massachusetts, they've banned all flavored tobacco as well as menthol cigarettes. All? All flavored tobacco and menthol cigarettes. So now we're losing customers in New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, and New York. Because people are just flooding the borders. How has that affected your business overall? So as I indicated in my testimony, we are down 25% in sales. And I've had to basically lay off 50% of my workforce in some of my stores that are high menthol or flavors. And I'm also considering closing one of my locations because it's not no longer profitable. No longer eating. How many locations do you have, if I could ask? I have three, three locations in Massachusetts. Okay, thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Representative Jang, I think I guess you're all set. Um, seeing no other questions or comments, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank and for you. Taking the time to let us know your perspective. Thank Appreciate you. It. Um, next, we're going to move to Chris Ferrugio. Chris Ferrugio, are you there? Thank you. Welcome. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. Uh, my name is Chris Ferrugio. I'm a licensed general director in the state of Connecticut for over 20 years. And I have the pleasure of uh, working in the Greenwich, Stanford, and Monroe communities. Um, I know it's been a long day for many of you, so I want to, I've been here with you for a lot of testimony, so I want to clarify a few things. The CFDA has taken a neutral stance on food and beverage. Uh, there are many members that would like to see this bill passed, and there are many members that feel that it should not be passed. Another thing to clarify, we are the last state to have this bill passed. So 49 states have passed this bill, we are the last state. Um, everyone has spoken about having small funeral homes. So my question to them is, in 49 other states, are there not small funeral homes? Yes, there are. This is an option. This is not something that every funeral home has to do. This is absolutely an option. This will give family members a chance to have when they come in the morning, coffee, a bagel, a muffin. It will be in a separate room, not with the decedent, not prepared by the funeral home, not in the kitchen at the funeral home. It will all be brought in and catered. That is the very important key to this bill. Um, I always think about how in all religions and all different parts of the world, people gather around food. And that's very important for a lot of people. And many people have spoken about that they would like to have food 
during their funerals. Just that's just so important for so for so many people to be able to have a bite to eat, to offer something to their guests. Again, we are not looking to take be a full blown catering hall at any of funeral homes. If a family wants a choice to have and go to a preferred catering hall of their choice, they're going to go to that funeral hall. I mean, to that to that catering hall of their choice or restaurant. People have their favorite restaurant. This is just another option for funeral homes to be able to serve their community. And that's uh, that's basically everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank your you. testimony. And as I've said before, I know that this pandemic's been particularly hard on your industry. So I thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments from the members of the committee? I think we've had a lot of testimony to this. Becna, yours is very much valued, um, but Thanks. I think people have a clear understanding, I think, of what it is. Uh, Senator Wong. Thank you, Madam Speak uh, Chair. And it indeed has been a long day, but I, I wanted to ask Mr. Perugio, um, uh, your um, company, it's uh, Leo Gallagher, right? In, that in is Renegade. correct, yes. And is it a, uh, we've heard many of the family owned businesses like Shaughnessy and, and the Parentes. Um, is your organization a family owned local business or is it part of a larger entity? We are part of a larger entity, that is correct. Uh, of how many organizations? Uh, uh, is it a regional or nationwide? It's, it's nationwide. It's over okay. 2,000. And uh, from your other entities, maybe, as you mentioned, many of the other states, is uh, serving, providing food and catering an integral part of your current business model? Uh, it, it helps families. I wouldn't say it's an integral part of the business model, but when we're able to offer families something uh, additional, it is families do accept it and, and they, 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 they like it. In most other states, this is not something that is new. Uh, Representative Cook uh, mentioned earlier in Missouri, this is a very common thing in, in most other states. And in a state like New York, they who passed it just several years ago, they can't believe that they didn't pass it sooner because every funeral home, even the small funeral homes have been so welcoming to this fact that they are able to offer someone something. And we can't offer anything right now. And, and that's, that, that's really the, the, the key part of this. Okay. Uh, can you repeat that statement again? You, you said every funeral home where? Uh, in New York State. Almost every, every funeral home in New York State, they passed the bill about three years ago, three or four years ago now. And every funeral home in that state is extremely happy and satisfied that they passed this bill. Uh, then, now I appreciate that and clarify it's New York State. Then what would you say to many of the uh, family owned small business funeral homes that have spoken out today and, and quite passionately and, and quite patiently since we started this at uh, I believe it was nine or 10 o'clock, I've lost track. Uh, what would you to say to many of them that have spoken very vocally uh, and passionately uh, about uh, their opposition to this? Uh, I, it seems to be uh, a difference of opinion. I would say it, it's very clear that it's an I'm option. sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. It, it is an option. They do not have to offer it, but if they choose to offer it, I think that the families would be very appreciative of it. And it does not have to be, it's where no one is looking to have a full blown meal. People are just looking to all be able to offer families something when they, when, when they need it. And, and this is a time during grieving that people are, they're not eating, they're hungry, they haven't eaten for days. And if we're able to help them you know, to nourish them and, and to give them some energy to get through this, I think that's, that is very important. And no, maybe not right now during the pandemic, but things will, we all know things will get better. We hope that they will get better. And we want to be there for those families that want to continue on with their services. No, I, I appreciate your thoughts. And 
And um, we also heard from some of the homes in regards to older buildings and, and uh, in some cases, very significant historical landmarks in, in prominent areas in the community. Um, and they have spacing questions. Do you have excess space that could very easily be used to adapt uh, to some aspect of catering within your uh, current entity? Uh, not necessarily, no. I mean, it's, it's a matter of finding the space. And like I had said earlier, in 49 states, there are many small funeral homes that were old homes at one time, converted to funeral homes. And if they're in 49 states, if they're able to find the space senator, I think that many funeral homes are, are able to find the space here. And there are many, many independent funeral homes that would like this bill passed. There are. That is why it's this, the Connecticut Funeral Directors Association has taken a neutral stance because there's arguments on both sides. Well, that, that, uh, that's another topic of interesting conversation, but uh, I, I'll leave it at that. The day is long, but I, I do appreciate your perspective. And, and I'll just simply close by offering a perspective that um, in these days of, of the COVID, uh, the important role that you have in all of your um, important organizations that do what you do um, to give people a peace of mind and, and comfort during this important time, that that is very much appreciated. Number two, um, and, and also in the COVID of social distancing and space being a huge premium. I, I think you're right. I think you even said it, uh, maybe not right now in this COVID environment, should we be considering it? And maybe I'm not putting words, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, that there is a particularly acute sensitivity that social distancing, not having enough space, that if we statutorily make that change, it puts the additional pressure that may take away from the first and foremost priority to, to do everything you give you can to give comfort, support, and, and safety. Um, you know, maybe it's not the right time right now to consider the proposal of this bill. So I, I really do appreciate your, your thoughts and, and an opportunity for me to thank all of the funeral homes that, that are participating today, that you do an important job in these very, very difficult times and, and we applaud you and, and thank you. So thank Great. you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Senator Wong. I always appreciate that you throw it back to me because then I know when you're done. So thank you for doing that. Um, Senator Moore. So thank you, sir, for your testimony. Thank this you. is really quite interesting to me, this, this shift. So I want to ask you, do you represent small or medium size? I'm just thinking Connecticut size of funeral homes? Well, I represent, for, for myself, I think I represent all funeral homes that are in favor of passing this bill. So and what is the size of them? Are they small business or are they large? Well, I, I guess, so, so one of my funeral homes, my funeral home that's located in Greenwich is, is very small. Uh, it's, it's a old, you know, at one time an old residence uh, it only it has two two viewing rooms and you know that's set up in a, in a lounge a lounge setting and, and people feel very comfortable in in that setting. So, in if this bill were to be passed, the family would greet friends in in one room, and there could be something to offer guests and the family in in the other room. Um, you know, a, a lot of people are not having the traditional funerals as as we've had over the years and they're having more celebrations of life. They are choosing um, cremation as a form of disposition more often maybe than, than burial. Uh, that's, you know, our, in our state, cremation is at a, a, a 50% um, chosen rate for many families. And so many families choose to have cremation and they have an urn present for the service. So they don't have maybe a traditional calling hours, as many families do. And during this time, that would give people an opportunity to gather and be able to pay their respects to the family, maybe have something small to eat, and then, and then leave, or the family would be able to have something small to eat. So that's, that's kind of where, where we see this. Um, if this bill was passed, that's where we, we see uh, this going. So I just think about the funeral homes that I've been in. They're mostly small businesses not, with not the capacity to handle 
many people and they're doing virtual funerals. And I've seen a lot mm -hmm. during COVID or virtual and some people deciding just to go directly to the cemetery, right? Or um, even if it's at a church, uh, it's been, you know, limited the amount of people. I was thinking about what Senator Wong said, you know, maybe at another time, I would think that this might be something to consider. I, cons I think about COVID, the last thing I want people to do is to stand around and eat. And I understand people, you know, uh, who's lost a loved one wanting to have a little something to eat, right? But I also don't see funerals lasting a very long time now. I see them, you know, doing the formality of having it and, and people moving out. Uh, and maybe it's, a, maybe it's a discussion for later, but I don't think it's, a, it's from right now during COVID, I just don't think it's an appropriate time to have something like that. And I, I try to be open to think about not how we've done things before, but what's, what the future looks like and considering people uh, who are going through grieving. And, and I can't seem to wrap my arms around understanding why this would be important right now, or even at a la later time, how it could be important, unless you had a facility where people could step out someplace and go eat. And the places I think are very small. And I don't think anybody would wanna be eating in front of other people as they're coming through a funeral or step. they could step away, but I've been, I, I listened to uh, what Representative Cook, I went to a legislator's um, funeral where the block was around the corner, right? And I think it's, and it could be that I'm old school. I just think it's to be respectful of those people. I don't see people having anything other than water or, or coffee or tea or stepping out for a moment to get out of the line uh, and letting another family stand there. So I'm gonna continue to listen, but thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Well, well, Senator, as of right now, you cannot even offer coffee or tea. You, I, you, I, you, I just said water. I could see somebody yeah. getting water so mm -hmm. they didn't, and it's overcome and you, you just want to give them a little sip of water or something like that. I'm, but I'll continue to listen. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I believe that you have answered all the committee's questions. Thank you for your patience and for your testimony this evening. Appreciate having Thank you. you. Have a good evening, everyone. You too. Um, next is 119 Giovanna uh, Mozo. I'm probably mispronouncing your last name. Giovanna Mozo. Good evening. Thank you. Yes, Welcome. Thank you for having me. And yes, you said my name correct, my last name as well. <laughs> Some people do mess that up. I don't know how, but they do. Uh, but good evening, members of the Public Health Committee. I know it's been a long day. It has been a long day for me as well. So I'm going to make this hopefully short and sweet and to the point. My name is Giovanna Mozo. I'm the director of the Hub. It's a division of RISAP, Regional Youth Adult Social Action Partnership here in Bridgeport. We are the designated Regional Behavioral Health Action Organization, RBHAO, as we are called, for Southwestern Connecticut, and a member of Connecticut Prevention Network, CPN. Um, CPN is the coalition of the five RBHAOs who are focused on substance misuse and mental health um, pre prevention efforts. I'm here to support today the bill number 326 an act prohibiting the sale of flavor cigarettes, tobacco products, and electronic nicotine delivery systems and vapor products. According to the FDA, menthol cigarettes lead to an increased smoking initiation among youth and young adults, greater addiction, and decreased success in quitting smoking. Whether smoking traditional cigarettes, chew, or smoking out of a battery operated device it is leading preventable cause of death and disease in the USA. Addiction is serious and can lead to lifelong health burdens and premature mortality. 95% of adult smokers began before reaching the age 21. Menthol cigarettes increase youth initiation and half of youth who have ever tried smoking initiated with menthol flavored cigarettes. Between 2010 and 2020, it was estimated that 2.3 million people would start smoking because of menthol cigarettes. In 2018, the U.S. Surgeon General first called youth e-cigarette use as an epidemic. Flavored e-cigarettes continued the tobacco industry's long history 
of targeting kids with flavored products such as cotton candy, bubble gum, and even mango flavored. Tobacco companies continue to talk, target kids with other flavored products, including cigars in hundreds of flavors, including methyl cigarettes. Similar to national and state trends, vaping is increasing dramatically in Southwestern Connecticut. In 2017, uh, one of our youth surveys in a local suburb determined that there was a 25% of freshmen and sophomore, sophomores and 45% of juniors and seniors reported vaping during the last month. In 2018 and 2019, youth surveys in the region found that teens perceived vape to be far less harmful than cigarettes. Approximately one in four high school students in Connecticut use e-cigarettes regularly. Research shows that flavors play a key role in youth use of tobacco products, including e-cigarettes. From 2019 to 2020, the proportion of current e-cigarette use users using flavored e-cigarettes increased by 20% from 68.8% to 82.9%. Nearly 3 million youth use flavored e-cigarettes, including over 1 million who use menthol flavored e-cigarettes. Recent national data suggests that the popularity of vaping is leading to an increase in cigarette smoking, reversing decades long of prevention work. Teens who use vapes are four times more likely to smoke cigarettes. In our role as members of the CPN, we provide indirect services relating to prevention of substance use issues. That includes collaborations with a wide variety of community coalitions and statewide organizations for educational initiatives prevention strategies, and legislative advocacy. Community coalitions have recently been work making efforts toward the prevention and cessation of vaping among youth in our region, which is an important focus of our work. I'm available to answer any questions and I am thankful and happy to be here tonight. And thank you all for all the work that you're doing, especially during this, uh, this difficult time with COVID being on our hands. Thank you so much. Um, do you have a question for you from Senator Wong? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Giovanna, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I am wonderful. I, I just want to publicly uh, do a shout out for the effective and invaluable job that, that you and all of your counterparts, um, just unsung heroes in, in support and counseling and education in regards to addiction services and uh, uh, the many programs that we've done together on opiate addiction and, and the proliferation of that from a, from a substance abuse and the devastating impact on individuals' lives and, and their families' lives is, is really remarkable. And, and uh, um, I, I thank you for your testimony, but I, I just wanted to, to do a big shout out to you and all of your colleagues that Thank do you. the remarkable job of supporting those that have been impacted and, and caught into the web of addiction and uh, one to prevent that from happening in the future, but also those that have been caught up in it to, to, to get out with, with support and, and kindness. So um, I can't say enough about the great work you all do. So thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. It takes a village. Thank you, Senator Wong. Representative McCarty. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I too would I, like to echo the comments of Senator Wong, but I did have a question. I know the uh, regional behavioral health organizations are doing a great job, but I was surprised in one of the, I believe it was one of the community surveys that went out that the parents themselves, and we heard testimony today from a number of parents that they're really unaware in many cases of that this vaping and with our high school students and even middle school that it's uh they're not aware that it's existing they they say that they're opposed to it but is there anything more that you think we can do to educate the parents i i think that so we try our best to reach out to many of the parents in our communities our local prevention councils do a fantastic job However, we don't reach everyone, right? I think that um, when we look at prevention dollars and how we can um, 
have dollars go toward prevention and specifically the um, the education piece. I think it, it, that's something that we should be working on is putting those dollars to prevention to have a, um, uh, more people on, on the grassroots uh, going out to communities and really focusing their efforts that way. Um, prevention dollars just need to be um, increased, to be honest. Okay, again, thank you for your good work. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Representative. I don't see any other questions or comments. So thank you so much for being here and uh, for your testimony this evening. Thank you so much. Have a good night. You too. Um, next, we have 121, Mary Blankson, followed by 122, A.D. Nieves. So Mary Blankson, if you're... Yes, I'm here. Great, thank you, welcome. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Darty Abrams and Representative Steinberg and the distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. Uh, my name is Mary Blankson. I'm a family nurse practitioner by training and the Chief Nursing Officer of Community Health Center, Inc. Um, I have worked at the health center for many years and have supported over 100 medical assistants, 50 registered nurses, and 12 licensed practical nurses for years and have testified on various bills to support medical assistants' uh, scope of practice to include any amount of medication administration. Um, so I'm here today to actually testify in favor of SB 285. Um, again, uh, I recognize many of your faces because I have been here every single year uh, for every single bill. Um, this year, though, in the midst of the global COVID-19 pandemic, allowing medical assistance to administer vaccines takes on unprecedented urgency. With the support of the state, CHC has stood up three mass vaccination sites, including the state's largest at Pratt & Whitney Runway in East Hartford, which I'm actually at this location right now. And we're in the process of putting more states, uh, more sites online. One of the largest constraints to adding more sites is staffing. Uh, so allowing medical assistance to administer vaccines is critical to the state's ability to uh, vaccinate the percentage of population necessary to achieve herd immunity. On December 7th, the Department of Public Health actually implemented new regulations that allowed EMTs, paramedics, dentists, dental hygienists, uh, even veterinarians and podiatrists to be able to engage in COVID-19 vaccination uh, with some additional training, uh, many of whom I have trained myself uh, you know, making sure that they understand the landmarks, uh, the vaccines, uh, where to administer them. Um, and of course, I think one thing that you have heard from many other folks testifying on this bill against this bill uh, really unfortunately shows the lack of understanding of the actual vaccine process. Um, again, this bill does not in any way support medical assistance to assess or to make the decision to vaccinate. That decision solely belongs to the licensed clinician even for dentists, dental hygienists, and all of the other team members uh, that we've been allowed to train, the, de the decision still lies with that licensure one group, not with the second tier of individuals uh, able to vaccinate. Also, the surveillance or the monitoring post-vaccine is also not uh, in the scope of practice or on the table for this particular bill for vaccination. Uh, what is on the table is for medical assistants to be able to adhere to a procedure and a protocol to be able to implement this process, which is actually much like many of the procedures that they do every single day, delivering uh, clinical wave tests, doing uh, finger pricks, phlebotomy, and other types of things that do involve using sharps on the human body. Um, I think, you know, with primary care, although I know that this bill is not just for COVID-19 vaccines, I want to point out that in primary care, we deliver this care in a team-based setting, which means we all work together um, and we all make sure that each one of us practices to the top of our license, certification, or education. Um, and so to really exclude medical assistance in the original regulation that came out on December 7th, I actually see as very insulting to this wonderfully trained group of individuals that went to accredited programs that include uh, you know, specific curriculum focused on medication administration and specifically on injections. I personally have hired many medical assistants that have come from many other states across the oh, country. Sorry. Excuse me, uh, you hit your three minutes if you could conclude okay. your remarks, thanks. Yes, I will. Um, I will just say that 
um, part of helping individuals to practice to the top of our license means making sure that every member of the care team has that honor and that privilege to do. We know medical assistants are trained to this if they attend uh, accredited programs and are certified. And so I implore you this year to please bring this bill to a vote, get it to where it needs to go so that we can access this group of individuals. Thank you so much. Um, Representative Steinberg. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your testimony today. I have only one question. Do all the other nurses know that you've gone rogue? Yes, I often uh, say that I'm probably one of the most hated nurses in Connecticut, but also one of the most loved. I've worked seven days a week since this pandemic started pretty much. I myself will go on the front lines and vaccinate when I'm short vaccinators. Um, uh, you know, I have looked high and low. I have interviewed so many individuals. I am bringing on all kinds of team members. If you have granddaughters or nep nephews or nieces who, um, you know, want to work on vaccines, please let me know. Um, but again, I, I have no plans uh, to reduce my nursing workforce. I continue uh, to build it up, but I really want my nurses uh, doing what's even more value added, which is that care management, right? The pandemic is one thing, but we still have diabetics that haven't come back into our office since COVID. We have hypertensives that still haven't achieved control. We have folks who are being treated for hepatitis C that need additional support to make sure that they maintain medication adherence, our HIV patients, I mean, so much more. Um, you know, our nurses, there's, there's no risk of nurses losing uh, jobs or losing workforce time. Uh, we simply are saying, you know, even if I could just get uh, more help with COVID-19 vaccines or flu vaccines, it would really free up a significant amount of highly skilled, highly uh, expensive also, a uh, time of my registered nurses to make a huge impact to our chronically ill, uh, Ill constituents. Well, thank you. Uh, your testimony is very refreshing. A uh, real shot in the arm, so to speak. Thank you very much. Hey, Senator Abrams? It's Representative Parker. I was trying to, I don't see the Zoom raise hand. Um, do you mind if I? Oh, sorry, Representative. Are you going under participants? If you open that list um, and then look at the bottom, you'll see raised hand. Do you see that? You know, I don't, I just see invite or mute me, which maybe I should just mute. And me. no, <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> and no raised hand, huh? Okay, well, well, um, Representative Pettit was before you, I think, and then I'll, and then I'll call on you. Thank you. Representative Pettit. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mrs. Blakeson for your excellent testimony. I agree with uh, co-chair Steinberg. You brought the argument back to reality. Uh, people kept on bringing up spurious arguments that MAs weren't going to be able to assess who needed a vaccine to assess them afterwards. And the issue was to allow them to administer the vaccine, not to make the decision about who needs one and what kind of therapy they need after. So thank you for bringing us back to, to reality in terms of what the intention of the, the bill is. And, and thank you for all your service uh, over these last uh, 11, 11 months. And hopefully you will submit testimony because when we just looked online, we didn't see it. Uh, on thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Pettit. Representative Parker. Thank you, Senator Daughtry Abrams. I just um, wanted to, to thank Ms. Blankson for sharing. She's a constituent here in the 101st. I admire your work and uh, thank you for bringing this point of view. And just to be clear, there are no suggestions that you would uh, make to the language of the bill as it stands to improve along the lines of what we've heard before. You think that what is presented is, is a strong option? Absolutely, absolutely. I do think, you know, for any organization that does allow uh, medical assistance to uh, then administer medications, I do think, you know, we have to make a decision about our own employees and sort of when, uh, like, for example, if they graduated 10 years ago, I certainly, of course, am going to train in competency, even if they graduated six months ago, I'm going to train in competency. Uh, you know, have the protocols in place. But I think the bill as stands is a strong bill. And I know that medical assistants will be able to do this. Um, when you look at uh, some of the other testimony, again, opposed, uh, most of the articles that are presented are really around acute care. It's around IV medications or other types of things, which is not what this bill is asking for. So um, again, you know, should the language be modified later on for only flu and COVID or only other things? Heck, I will take what I can get. 
Um, but I, I really, I would love this committee to even just invite me to be a part of even piloting this if, you know, if that were something that the state would be interested in uh, to show you what a robust program of training and supporting of medical assistants doing this can really do uh, in terms of tracking outcomes or, or other information. So, um, and I certainly invite you all to come and visit Pratt and & Whitney and, and see MassVax in action. Uh, it's pretty, pretty incredible. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Um, is there anyone else who has a question? Representative Madam Chair, Claire, uh, Representative Claire Dietria has not had a chance. Thank you. Representative hey. Claire Dietria. Thank you, Madam Chair. My hand, raise hand feature is not working either. So Really? Well, thank you for texting and letting us know because we would like to hear from Otherwise, you. I'd be waving my hands. Um, <laughs> Mary, thank you for your testimony. I echo what a bunch of the other legislators said. You finally put it into perspective. Um, hopefully other people have been listening and they're taking everything that you're saying to um, to heart because I think it's it's an important thing to get our our um, medical professionals on the same page and not have it be a turf war and just do what we need to do to get people the help that they need and that's it <clears throat> excuse me at the end of the day so thank you very much for your testimony thank you madam chair thank you representative I'm sorry that you had a problem so just Text us so we know, because we can't see everybody all the time. Um, so I think that's it. If anybody else is having a problem, please text one of us and let us know so we can get you on. But I think that that might be the end. So thank you very much for your testimony. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good evening. Um, next is Adi Nieves followed by Thomas Bryant. Thank you. Greetings, co-chair Senator Mary uh, Doherty Abrams, co-chair Jonathan Steinberg, vice chair Saul Danois, vice chair Julie Kushner, vice chair Julian Gilchrist, Senator Moore and esteemed members of the Connecticut General Assembly Public Health Committee. I am grateful to you for your, pub for your public service on this committee and to your constituents and our state, especially during COVID-19. I urge you to pass SB 326 to ban the sale of all flavored tobacco products statewide. As a mother and a new grandmother in Bridgeport, where I serve as president of the city council, I believe that we must do everything we can to protect our kids' health. And that means all of our kids' health. Public health is the people's health it is the community's health. We must take real steps to reduce health disparities in a state where the census tract you can grow, where the census tract you grow up in can mean the difference of 19 years in your life expectancy. The pandemic has only magnified such a shocking reality and inequity. That is why I'm helping to lead the passage of a similar policy in Bridgeport to ban the sale of all flavored tobacco products here. We we can't wait any longer, especially at the time, especially at a time when COVID-19 continues to disproportionately devastate the lungs and the lives of my community. Getting these products out of our community will make a meaningful difference in reducing health disparities and making our communities health, healthier and more productive for generations to come. The tobacco industry's products are the leading cause of preventable death in our, in our country. To please, to please its shareholders, Big Tobacco must find and hook replacement smokers. Flavored tobacco and e product cigarettes exist to do just that. When we talk about flavored tobacco products, let's not forget about the granddaddy of them all, menthol cigarettes. For decades, Big Tobacco has targeted menthol cigarettes at predominantly black neighborhoods so that now 85% of African-Americans who smoke cigarettes are smoking menthols. At the same time, African-Americans are dying from heart disease, lung cancer, stroke, other tobacco-related diseases at the rates far higher than non-African-Americans. Roughly 45,000 black men and women are dying at the hands of big tobacco every single year. I hear it from parents, educators, and coaches, despite Tobacco 21, the kids still have easy access to flavored tobacco products. When you have a product like favorite tobacco, whose whole purpose is to hook kids, you can't expect the limitation on access, access to prevent them from getting their intended consumer. 
you have to eliminate their availability. That's what we're trying to do here in Bridgeport. And what I'm hoping you would do statewide by passing SB 326 to protect all kids in our state from these tempting and addictive products. We are going to do our part in Bridgeport, but I encourage you to take this effort and make it stronger. I don't want kids from my city to be able to get these products from friends or families or retailers in other cities 10 miles down the road. The sale of flavored tobacco or flavored e-cigarette products should be prohibited everywhere in our state as they are in Massachusetts, California, and more than 100 municipalities across the country, across the nation. Doing so will have a powerful and lasting oh, impact. Uh, you, you hit your three minute mark if you could conclude your remarks. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm great. Doing so will have a powerful and lasting impact in reducing both, reducing both youth teen addiction and tobacco related health disparities. Thank you. Councilwoman Nieves, thank you so much for your service and Thank for your you. dedication to the young people of your city. Um, you. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, Senator Moore. Senator, uh, go ahead, Senator Moore. Good evening, Heidi. Good evening, Senator Moore. I didn't see you on there. I saw you earlier. I'm like, she left. I didn't- I'm hiding. <laughs> Nice to see you okay. again. Thank you for your testimony. Now, I, I, you know, earlier today, um, several people of color have come on and spoken about how this is going to harm black and brown children. That, you know, I think they're talking about the police accountability and police abuse, which mm -hmm. I think is a whole separate issue. Uh, can you speak to what this means really to, to our children who? often suffer the highest disparity in health, uh, and especially now, and especially during COVID, when you see many of their parents who were smokers now having lung problems um, as a result of being diagnosed with, with uh, COVID-19. Can you talk a little bit about what this means to our children? Well, I, in, in a city like Bridgeville, we already have a high rate of youth with um, asthma, who already have predisposition breathing problems and family members who have predisposition even as adults and part of part of that also goes through obesity. I mean, when we're talking about these e-flavored cigarettes, you can go to the corner store and pick it up and it's something that they see in front of their parents so they realize that it's okay to smoke, right? It's a norm and we want to start to begin to talk about healthy lifestyles and the fact that um, health inequities and we're seeing that the health inequity in the combination of smoking, asthma, and the density of in the community in which you live have all an impact. And to begin to ban this for the children, we'll have healthier children who can run outside and play. We'll have healthier families um, who will be able to last another 10, extra 10 years because you can be from Bridgeport, but you can go down the road of at least nine, 10, 10 or 15 miles and that changes, right? Longevity and we're talking about mortality rates. Um, and the care, the care factor that goes on after someone who has smoked, who started smoking at the age of 15, at the time they're 40, they look like they're 70 sometimes. And I've seen that in family members and in parents at my school, I worked in the educational facility for a long time um, as a school secretary. So I saw the impact of what it was like when a parent still smoked and the child had asthma and the, the problem of having a parent quit and the struggle with that and the impact of what that means for care, asthma, for aftercare, for both family members when cancer becomes an issue. And it's, it's really hard when you are, my grandmother died of lung cancer about 10, 15 years ago, and she was a smoker for a very long time. She, she was smoking from when she was a young girl. Uh, this is my father's mom. And I didn't know that that's what she had and she was a smoker for so long, but it was already too late because she had smoked all the way up until her 60s. So the impact of cigarettes um, is very near and dear, even more so because I'm a grandmother, but because I work with youth and I volunteer a lot and we need to start changing our lifestyles, especially in urban centers where health inequality is very, um, is very rampant in, in accessibility, especially now with COVID-19 and the long-term lung impact that COVID-19 is gonna have on our children and their families. Thank you. You know, I smoked from the time I was 16 to 40. I know everybody thinks I'm 41, but uh, 
long-term effects of that on my lungs. I always worry about what's going to happen later because it doesn't have to be current. It could be 20 years later. But I smoked Kohl's and Salem's and Virginia Slim's because I couldn't handle palm oil or camel. They were just too strong. So it was more attractive to have that Virginia Slim, that long, yes. pretty cigarette as you're smoking, right? Not understanding um, how bad it was for you. But also, I don't think at that point that the addictive drugs were in it. But when I think about people, what they've named um, some of these additives, uh, why would you not attract children? And it's done intensely to attract children. So I thank you. What is your ordinance going to do in Bridgeport? So what the ordinance is going to do, and, and that was one of the concerns, it's not about criminalizing. It is just like uh, Tobacco 21 at the same time that they're doing the checking for tobacco. Um, it's to make sure that there aren't any products there. Um, give them, as, as they've done in Massachusetts, they gave about a six month period for, for businesses to remove the product from the shelving to get it done. And we don't want to criminalize this to say like, this is going to be enforceable by the police department. It's more of a health and social services enforcement through the DPA of, your, of our local municipality, just as they're doing in Tobacco 21. And then uh, impose the same type of fines that, um, that Tobacco 21 has. And those fines would be to the seller, not to the child. No, they're not to the child, no. to the seller. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Moore. Um, Councilor Nieves, I don't see any other hands raised. So I thank you so much for your time. And um, this bill would be just what you're describing, which the onus will be on the seller and it would not be a penalty for use or possession. It would just yes. be selling of it. So um, I wish you luck in your endeavors and thank you so much for taking your time to be with us this evening. Thank you very much for having me. I have a great evening. You too. Um, next, we have Thomas Bryant. Mr. Bryant, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Madam Chair. Welcome. Go right ahead. Co Co-Chair Abrams and Steinberg and committee members, thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. I'm speaking on Senate Bill 326. My name is Thomas Bryant, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Association of Tobacco Outlets, which has retail store members in Connecticut. Connecticut has a regulatory structure for tobacco products to ensure that taxes are collected and are only sold to legal age adults. This bill would move those products from a regulated environment and into an existing illicit market that would grow exponentially. Why? Because adult prohibition failed in this country before. Adults will simply turn to an unregulated illicit seller or buy products online or in a neighboring state. The end result is that the health related purposes of the bill will be undermined because adults will continue to use these products. According to the 2020 National Youth Tobacco Survey, current tobacco use by high school students is at historic lows and declining. Cigarette use is at 4.6%, smokeless tobacco at 3.1%, pipe tobacco at 0.7%, and electronic cigarettes at 19.6%. Any debate about banning all flavored tobacco products needs to differentiate between the appeal of flavored electronic cigarettes versus traditional tobacco products. The data on youth tobacco use does not support the wholesale banning of all traditional tobacco products. This is not to suggest that electronic cigarettes should be banned, but only to emphasize the problem with treating all tobacco and nicotine products the same. If Senate Bill 326 was introduced because young people use electronic products, the FDA and Congress have taken significant actions to remove many flavored electronic products from the market and to curb youth accessibility. Last year, the FDA adopted a ban on flavored cartridge-based and pod-based electronic cigarettes, except tobacco and menthol flavors, which are preferred by adults. Then, the FDA required manufacturers of all tobacco products that were introduced after February of 2007 to submit marketing applications to the agency by September of 2020. The health aspects of these applications are critical because the FDA must determine for each application and each product that the product is, quote, appropriate for the protection of the public health, close quote, in order to authorize the manufacturer continue to continue to marketing the product. If it's not approved, it has to come off the market. Also in December, a federal law was expanded to include electronic nicotine products and now requires online sellers to verify a buyer's age obtain a signature of an adult upon delivery to a home and collect state taxes. 
As a further detriment to the public health, this bill would remove two products from the market that have received a special FDA modified risk tobacco product determination, which means they have a lower risk to the user. Since they're flavored, those products would also be removed. An option for the committee to consider is a study to research the youth appeal issue, understand FDA and federal actions to curb electronic cigarette use, and reconcile statewide regulatory policies. Thank you for your time. And I urge you to read my letter, which has more detail. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Brown, for your testimony. Are there any questions or comments from the members of the committee? Just in a moment. Seeing none, I'm gonna thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, next, we have Ron Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Yes. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Go right ahead. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, very much. My name is Ron Kennedy Bailey. I'm an um, uh, adult child and um, an adolescent, actually, a uh, psychiatrist doing clinical work and forensic work and research work here in Los Angeles now. Uh, and I'm really asked to speak today in my role of past president of the National Medical Association, one of the largest group of African American physicians really focused on healthcare disparities in the black community for African American physicians uh, and their patients. I missed that role about eight years ago and then I went onto the board of trustees of our Cobb Research Institute where we do work looking at how to lessen racial and ethnic health disparities. I'm been paid for my time today. I'm a forensic psychiatrist. I've uh, been asked to share some of my thoughts uh, by the company RJ Reynolds. Uh, really the issues I think being raised are pretty straightforward and others have kind of talked about it. So I'll tell you my comments for pretty brief today. We're really addressing the proposed ban on cigarettes, pretty all forms, and how in the past that has been shown have a disproportionately adverse impact on African-Americans. Uh, some comments you've heard today, uh, but as a doctor, I share that I spent 30 years of my career since Mr. Mayor's University of Texas in 1990, working with patients with all forms of behavioral uh, challenges, um, trying to persons with addiction, stop drinking alcohol, let alone stop smoking cigarettes, and other uh, high risk behaviors. And the reality is um, laws such as these, often in my experience I've seen, can have the unintended consequence of actually causing further danger and injury, although we actually started off you know, with, with pretty good intentions. I comment that, uh, particularly the case I think in the black community, where very often the motivation uh, for these audiences are, are strong and are good, and effective, in part because there's been such uh, adverse negative uh, impact uh, very often on the health perspective in these communities. But the, the struggle that we regularly see and we're seeing in other judicials as well is that very often how they're implemented uh, by the, the reality of how very often law enforcement interacts with the black community uh, leads to young black and brown men disproportionately, I think, impacted by being in our jails and prisons. Um, so really the issue I think is the grave danger lies in the enforcement. And how can we actually address that? So I'm really here to speak for our education. I think when we've had education in the past, uh, we've actually made the point to individuals uh, that they shouldn't smoke because of the healthcare consequences that can actually impact you. My experience has been asked a much more effective strategy, a pro-education model. Uh, as many states have, were, were funded, I was talking about money earlier to do, uh, I think we should uh, relook at that. I guess that's probably a bit of a uh, direction to go in because I think the other process, the legal process, this creates a framework, I think very often at the lower level, very often to harass individuals uh, in the, um, at, at the street level. I'll point out that I'm aware that the ban is directed at retailers, but the fear I think for doctors like myself in forensic medicine, when you go to jail and prison and see individuals with these struggles, is how enforcement very often is enforced differently uh, by I think local law enforcement settings. They use it as a pretext just to uh, harass and confront. I think one of your speakers today, but perhaps actually even commented about how the, the things actually start off in one way, like in the Eric Garner case, and then they end up in some other kind of difficulty. You get somebody who spoke about law enforcement in the background who spoke in that regard. So I'm only about simply saying it's not remote, whether it's Eric Garner or the case in California, the young man was kind of beaten by the policeman, uh, the 14 year old. These issues are real. I think we have to address issues regarding uh, tobacco use and, and other forms of behavioral uh, difficulty that difficult to affect certain communities. But I think that criminalizing it in this setting, even though unintentional, has the adverse impact, I think, that hurts community more than helping it. It should be focused on education. I think we can work together and do that in a fairly effective way going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Greatly appreciate it. Um, are there any questions or comments from the members of the committee? OK, 
Okay, seeing none, I'm going to thank you for being here this evening um, and I appreciate your input. Have a good evening. Thank you. Um, next, we have Saeed Sami. Two twenty, uh, one twenty-five, number one twenty-five. Yeah. Welcome. Can you see me? We can. I cannot. Uh, now I can. There you go. Good evening, everyone. I'm speaking in opposition to SB three twenty-six. My name is Saya Sami. I'm the proud owner and operator of approximately twenty-five gasoline service station throughout the state of Connecticut. More importantly, I'm a part of each and every single one of these communities where these businesses are located as well are my employees. With that said, my businesses are not ones which we were built overnight and they are not businesses which I hold to low standards and low accountability when it comes to the sale of age restricted product. I would like to offer my experience as a reasonable compliant community retailer of both non-flavored and flavored tobacco product. When retailer received a license to sell tobacco, we willingly agreed to state and federal standards and laws and to the penalties for non-compliance, including the fines and penalties up to an end, including a loss of license. The worst penalty and the greatest deterrent is damage to our reputation in our community. All of my stores have system in place where of any age restricted product are scanned into a point of sale terminal, the transaction cannot proceed. And without the individual data of birth and age being verified and ID scanned in order to proceed, and any new hires as well as current employees are extensive, extensively trained, refreshed and reminded of this policy throughout each transaction of age restricted product. I believe the ban of this product is derived from good intention and I have no doubt about that. Unfortunately, the demand for this product will go Go away will not go away, and those who are seeking such product will find other ways to purchase them, whether it be online, where, where there is no way of uh, checking the age of the individual making the purchase, product being purchased outside the state of Connecticut, or something far worse. The black market demand this will create. The demand for these products will not simply disappear, they will be. They will be fulfilled by non-compliant, unregulated sales and distribution. This would pose a greater risk to the health and safety of not only the consumer of those products, it will provide medical and health professionals and with less information of what chemicals and additives are being consumed by users. More strain on law enforcement tasked to survey, enforce and prevent the sale of such black market products, which at the time do exist. And with the legal ban, we are equipping these illegal and unregulated products to expand the range of consumer without being able to pinpoint whom is responsible for supplying and getting them into the hands of the community members. I conclude with if this bill passes, I and my business will survive, but it will force me to let go of many employees due to the loss of sales of not menthol and flavored cigarettes and vapes, but the adult customer who purchased other products at my store in addition, such as groceries and other necessities. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Sammy. Are there any questions or comments from the members of the committee? Seeing none, I'm going to thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Um, next, we have Stephen Cousins. 126 followed by 127, Matt Bailey. Mr. Cousins, are you here? Mr. Cousin here? Okay, I don't think so. So let's move on is, um, 127, Matt Bailey here. Bailey. No. Oh, hi there. Hi, and and you are Mr. Bailey. I, Welcome. I am. Thank you Thank so you. much. I had a pullover. I was driving, so I, uh, okay. I'm glad it glad it worked out. 
Um, I'm glad to uh, be able to, to speak with everyone today. Um, and I, I've been uh, working throughout the day, so I haven't been able to watch all the testimony, but I did get some, some feedback from some folks. And I just want to address real quick. Some people have, it seems, made some assertions that those of us who are in favor of food and beverages uh, being able to be served to the families that we serve are part of a rogue group that are trying to undermine our state association and that nothing could be further from the truth uh, from that. If, if CFDA wasn't neutral on this matter, our friend uh, Mike Dugan would be walking the halls making sure all of you knew about it uh, and, and they have voted to, to be neutral. I served on the executive board of the CFDA when this first conversation uh, began some time ago. Um, and I'm proud of my role within funeral service uh, here in the state of Connecticut as a family owned funeral home, as a fourth generation funeral director and part of one of our longest serving uh, funeral home families in the state. Um, and I'm proud of the work that we do. I'm proud that NFDA asked me to serve as one of the mentors last year for their Meet the Mentors program for 50 newly licensed and young funeral directors. Uh, I'm proud of the work and the trainings that I have done for all big three associations in our trade uh, profession. Uh, I'm proud of, of all of these things. And, 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 I, and it takes umbrage at the allegations that uh, we are trying to undermine or do anything different. And I have to say a couple of words as well about some of my colleagues who work for companies um, that are run by publicly traded companies. I'm a small family owned funeral home, but I do not think that my colleagues who work uh, for a larger company care less about the people in their community that turn to them. Um, people they go to Rotary with, people they go to church with, people they coach Little League with. Um, they are consummate professionals, and I don't think we should undermine them because of who it is that employs them. I don't think that's fair. Um, I understand that some of my colleagues do not want food and beverages in funeral homes, and, and I respect that, and I, and I have empathy that they feel differently. Um, the difference is that I am not trying to have the state of Connecticut implement through statutes um, policies that force them to embrace the opposite approach. Uh, they are trying to get the state of Connecticut uh, to force through statutes, those of us who are in favor, to not be able to do so. I think it is far past time that Connecticut joins the 49 other states that prove every day that this is something that is effective, that is popular, that people want. Um, we, we see it. The, the arguments that I have heard against food and beverages in funeral homes are being demonstrably proven wrong every single day in 49 states where it is successful, where it is embraced, where it is safe, uh, and where people are doing it. The reality of the situation is we've had food and funerals every day in Connecticut for years. They're happening in churches. Um, but as our society is changing and culture is changing, and the second largest faith community we see in the nation is what they call the religious nuns, uh, people aren't able to have those opportunities and those options necessarily any longer. They're not part of one of those communities. I was so appreciative last year when this committee listened attentively to the arguments that were made on both sides. Um, I think uh, the chairman made a, an excellent point and observation last year when he observed that um, some of the uh, language against it seems just to come from an anti-competitive nature of people who are trying to hold back um, their colleagues from, from doing things that they don't wanna do. Uh, and I hope that uh, the unanimous support that it received last year is something that we see again this year as well. And I know it's a long day for all of you, so I'll try to be uh, brief with that. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. And I appreciate your comments. I, I have such respect for the entire industry and all you've been doing particularly during COVID. And I understand that there might be some disagreement around this issue, but it does not take away from the good work that you all do. So thank you for making that comment. Are there yeah. any questions or comments for Mr. Bailey? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time. I'll get back on the road, thank you. <laughs> um, next we have, uh, Number 131, Bakul Shah. Bakul Shah, I see, you, I see you in the list. You're, you're on mute if you don't know that. You have to take yourself off the mute, I believe. Okay, now can you guys hear Now we can hear you. Welcome. Thank no, you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk tonight. Uh, first of all, uh, actually, I own and uh, operate a convenience store uh, in Connecticut for over 20 years. And uh, I sell uh, tobacco products uh, for a long time. 
let me just tell you one thing that even though I have been selling tobacco for 20 years, I'm not a smoker. I, I, I sell a lot of liquor I don't drink. So my point is that, you know, it's the education, it's the values that leaves a permanent impression uh, for, for prevention. So we sell basically legal uh, tobacco products to the people of 21 years of older. The tobaccos are being stored in the back of the store where nobody have an access to it. We check an ID to everybody who comes in to buy the tobacco and we only sell it to the person who are 21 years or older. On and off the FDA comes out and do an inspection. And uh, these are a few of the, the reports that I'm showing that inspection reports that we passed inspection successfully. So, you know, there are several of that. So we are doing a very important job here to prevent the, the tobacco uh, being uh, handed out of to uh, the young, uh, young, young kids. So what I have seen that Massachusetts recently passed is, uh, you know, flavor ban, and uh, the effect of that is uh, very devastating, not only for the state, for, but also for uh, the businesses that have been selling tobacco. So uh, since the Massachusetts banned this uh, uh, flavor uh, tobacco, which includes the menthol, their sales dropped 24%. New Hampshire, the neighboring states, uh, their sales went up 65%. Uh, this data is based on uh, the stamp that uh, each state sells to their uh, retailers. The rural sell went up 17%, and the mental sales alone in New Hampshire went up 91%. Rural and mental sales went up 40%. So what, and also, you know, I have read quite a few reports recently and found out that there is absolutely no effect on, on the smoking. People are still smoking the way they have been smoking. So uh, banning something is, is, doesn't really help uh, the health uh, you know, crisis that we are, we are facing. It is more uh, that they have to put in more efforts into educating kids, educating people. So um, we provide an important shield that prevents the tobacco uh, gets into the wrong hands. And just removing this shield will have a devastating effect uh, on the people's health because now nobody's there to check an ID. Nobody is gonna do a follow-up on you know, uh, who's selling what. You know, and definitely uh, uh, this menthol and uh, other flavors being a very hot commodity will push everything into a black market where the product may come from anywhere around the world. People can uh, have an access to internet. And uh, I've seen a lot of uh, people buying from uh, across the border, and, and there is no way to prevent that from happening. So if somebody wants a tobacco product, they will get it eventually anyway. So, and I mean, I see every day that in my store, uh, you know, people talk to one another saying that, hey, you know, I'm going to New Hampshire. Do you want any card on the cigarettes? Do you want anything? Uh, they talk to one another, and we see, we say that every day. So my point is that, you know, if you really, uh, uh, this uh, ban uh, is, is not going to have an effect that uh, that everybody sees, and uh, we 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 are in, we, we see customers uh, on everyday everyday basis. So, uh, and we talk to them, and so we provide a very valuable feedback that you know just you know, for an example that if somebody's uh, hurt, you know you don't really cut their hand, you know you just provide a treatment to that you know uh, for the problem that they have. So, uh, and, and for me, I mean, I would say that from my experience that, you know, this ban uh, will not have an effect uh, on, on the health uh, uh, and, and of the concern that a lot of people have. So, um, excuse me, sorry, I just want to let you know that you've uh, passed your three minutes. If you could just uh, provide a closing statement, thanks. Yeah, so from uh, my uh, vast, you know, uh, long time experience, I would uh, say that, you know, it's going to have an adverse effect on uh, the small businesses, you know, that uh, uh, is going to get economically affected. But at the same time, the ban wouldn't have any uh, a positive uh, 
uh, results that uh, I know uh, the lawmakers want to see. It. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Shah. Any comments or questions? If not, thank you again for your uh, testimony and for hanging with us all evening. Uh, we really, really do appreciate it. Thank you, sir. I, thank you. I understand that somehow we missed Ingrid Gillespie, uh, Ingrid, uh, followed by Dorian Furman. Hi, Representative Steinberg and other members of the Public Health Committee. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to keep it very brief, end of a long day for, for everybody. I'm here representing Connecticut Prevention Network, and I'm Director of Prevention for Liberation Programs and speaking in support of Bill 326. Basically, I've been listening for the last few hours to the testimony, and I certainly want to reinforce about the fact that the flavors do um, establish and entice use. They simply are a marketing tool designed to increase sales and use, and they're definitely working. As many people have said, 81% of youth who start vaping start with, because of a flavor. I've also had the opportunity this year um, to go into the schools a lot and do vaping presentations and teaching with the kids. And I can tell you unequivocally to the quite a few hundred that I've taught now that whenever we ask about why kids start, they will consistently say it's the flavors. Throughout the testimony that I've heard today from many people, retailers, physicians, et cetera, it's, there's a distinction between youth um, initiation use, which is what we're talking about with these flavors, and in terms of you know, what's going on with that versus you um, smoking cessation, which I totally understand. And I've taught that a lot also. So I get the distinct difference, but what we're talking about is how flavors are impacting a new generation of smokers, which tobacco companies, they do need a new customer base. If this was flavors was strictly about smoking cessation, which is a declining base, you know, we would be having a different conversation. So I can also empathize with the retailers. And I think this committee and other committees as we move forward in this new era, we need to look at a new way of doing business. And we have some ideas uh, certainly around that to be able to address that. But I think basically what we're talking about is stopping youth initiation. That is the biggest target population for flavors by far. Um, certainly menthol cigarettes, as many have talked about targeting adolescents and racial minorities, of which many um, tonight have identified other issues related to that. But I just wanted to certainly reinforce um, what the data says, what we're talking about, youth initiation, stopping a new population of smokers. And to Representative Steinberg's earlier comment, Yes, we do need more education. And yes, we do need to advocate for tobacco health trust fund dollars to be going towards that. So thank you very much for the opportunity just to be able to share those points. I've put a lot in our testimony. Oh, I did read, by the way, I pulled up that study from Yale while I was waiting and there are some clear limitations to the study by Friedman. So I highly recommend reading that study. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to congratulate you for coming back. And uh, I think being near the end gives you a chance to summarize and put things <laughs> in context. Uh, your last comment, though, with regard to Dr. Friedman's work, you said there were some uh, issues yes. with it. Could you just uh, well, give us context? So I, I just pulled up the report and under, you know, the study where it talks about limitations, it just says one of the sentence statements is that the analysis does not establish a causal relationship between flavored e-cigarette use and smoking initiation or cessation, which was a point brought up earlier. Um, they have enough other limitations. With any study, I try to get a copy of the survey questions to see couldn't get that with this one. So that might be a point too, so people can look at that particular piece. But they're not to say that he didn't have concerns, but that study he kept referencing does have some limitations. Well, thank you for pointing that out. Perhaps we can reach out to her and see if she can 
uh, share with us uh, the background material. Right, yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you, any other questions or comments? If not, thank you once again for resurrecting <laughs> yourself in this context. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for take, letting me speak. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, next up is number 133, Dorian Furman, followed by Mary Consoli. Hi, um, thank you so much for having me here to this evening. Um, I'm speaking in favor of SB 326 because flavors hook kids. In 2018, I co-founded Parents Against Vaping e-cigarettes with two other moms. But what began as three moms sitting around the kitchen table has turned into a national grassroots movement of parents who won't stand by and let big tobacco target our kids. You've heard many Connecticut PAVE volunteers testify today and share their deeply personal stories of youth nicotine addiction. We are all volunteers. We are not paid to be here. I would like to respectfully point out that the doctor who just spoke is paid by RJ Reynolds to oppose a ban that would save people, a page straight out of the big tobacco playbook. There has been a lot of information shared today and I will veer from the written testimony I submitted to address some of these issues. Many of the store owners who are speaking out against banning flavors have seen their revenue and staffing increase one tenfold as a result of flavor bans in all of Connecticut's neighboring states, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island. All these states have banned flavored e-cigarette products and Massachusetts has also banned all flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes. Kids and adults are crossing state lines to purchase these products, resulting in a boom for Connecticut store owners who are putting profits over the health of our kids. There was mention of online sales. Why ban flavors when kids can just buy them online? Actually, Congress just passed a bill that would prevent the United States Postal Service from shipping any kind of vaping product. And UPS and FedEx have also committed to not shipping vaping products. Education has been mentioned, and this must start at a very, very young age. You heard a pay volunteer talk about her son who started vaping at the age of 10. While not common, we have heard of young kids vaping more often than we would like, but there must be parent education as well. And we do that, PAVE does that. Many vaping companies like Juul and Views, both of whom are owned by Big Tobacco, Altria, which invested in Juul is Philip Morris and Views is RJ Reynolds, targeted kids on social media and still sponsor concerts and race cars. The products are small and easy to hide and parents are often unaware. The youth vaping epidemic took many parents by surprise but education cannot take the place of a full flavor ban. It must work side by side. Menthol alone is used by over 3018 e-cigarette users. That number, however, is likely much, much higher. The current teen favorite is mentholated iced flavors, such as blueberry ice and lush ice. Kids who vape are four to seven times more likely to begin smoking traditional cigarettes. Since the teen e-cigarette favorite is menthol, it is logical to assume these kids will migrate to the only flavored cigarette left on the market menthol. Tobacco companies have used menthol cigarettes to target African Americans for decades. Menthol cigarettes are highly addictive and more dangerous than regular cigarettes. One in four high school students here in Connecticut are using e-cigarettes and the frequency of use has steadily increased. Among current e-cigarette users, youth e-cigarette users rather, there has been a 1000% increase in the use of flavor disposable vapes. We will simply be playing an endless game of whack-a-mole in the absence of federal cohesive federal guidelines. And until Connecticut, like its neighboring states, bans all flavored e-cigarettes and other flavored tobacco products. And that must include menthol cigarettes. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, just to be clear, you stated that menthol cigarettes are considered more addictive than non-menthol. Is that because of the uh, flavor? Yes, it's absolutely because of the flavor and the mentholated. And we've noticed that among e-cigarette users, more and more are using menthol because, you know, the flavors themselves are the most highly addictive part of the um, of the e-cigarette. And it, you know, it, it I'm sorry, it prevents teens from perceiving harm and they start using because of the flavors and then they become addicted because of the nicotine. So. Um, yes, and flavor, you know, the, the government banned all flavored cigarettes in 2009, except for menthol cigarettes. So those are the only flavored cigarettes left on the market. Thank you for your testimony. I too hope the federal government will do the right thing, but uh, I for one have gotten tired of waiting. Well, we for can't them. wait, exactly. Any other questions or comments? If not, thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Next up is Mary Consoli, followed by Ann Hulick.
You ready to go, Ms. Consoli? Go ahead. Hello. Uh, good evening, uh, Senator Doherty uh, Abrams and uh, and you, uh, Repre Representative Steinberg, and the members of the uh, Public Health Committee. I too will be uh, cut my testimony down because it is late. Uh, I'm Mary Consoli. I'm a registered nurse with 50 years of experience. I'm retired but hold an active license, and I am volunteering to give vaccinations. I'm here to testify against Senate Bill uh, 285. I feel this was granting the unlicensed person uh, the ability to practice nursing without a license. I'm definitely uh, opposed to this. I've listened to a lot of the testimony. You can, mine is, is submitted and you can refer to that. I wanted to uh, address the educational for medical assistance. There's not consistent training. There's no uniform certification. And the certification is not by the state. It's the, uh, the AAMA certifies them, but that's not the state. That's like the uh, schools of nursing certifying and licensing the uh, RN. It should be done by the state. They, uh, some of the MA programs, are, there's a two year 80 MA program, and then there's a 10 week MA program and it's uh, just inconsistent. I also wanted to address the concern about no volunteers. There's 11,000 volunteers that had signed up and I am chair of my uh, parish nurse program. It's now called Faith Community Nursing. And we had a meeting and two of the nurses that attended volunteered for their towns and they were told they were not needed. I have another friend that signed up for the paid program with the state and she has not heard back. So I don't know where this person is not getting their uh, volunteers from. The long lines, when you go to the facilities, there's certain COVID setups that they have to follow. So maybe that's part of the reason why there's long lines, plus a lot of people want the vaccinations. Not so much the number of stations that set, are set up. That's all done based on COVID standards. Uh, in my testimony, I said, there's two people that spoke, one from the um, Hartford Hospital Healthcare System and one from Yale. And their problem was the vaccine uh, is not available. The gentleman, the doctor that's head of their program from the Yale New Haven said they could vaccinate 20,000 a day if they had the vaccine. So I don't know uh, where that it is. One of my big issues with this bill is everybody, people that have testified said under the direct supervision. This bill doesn't say that. It says under supervision or con control and responsibility. It doesn't say direct. And the other thing is other settings. What are the other settings you know, that they uh, refer to? This is what my concern is. You know, where, where are they going to be giving uh, practice in? There's not doctor's office here. And that's what I'm uh, very um, uh, uh, concerned with in this bill. It says, a medical assistant may administer a vaccine under the supervision, control, and responsibility of a physician. What does that mean? And um, then it says- I just wanted to make you aware that you've uh, reached your three minutes. If you can go ahead and give a closing statement. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, all right then. I uh, just wanted to, uh, and this is my last comment that they said the 40 other, uh, 48 other states have this. And I said, well, as we can tell by the previous testimony of the subjects, there are many laws that other states have that are not in Connecticut. I could think of like in capital punishment, you talk about, um, recreational marijuana, but I just think that um, that there's many issues, and I think that need to be addressed. And um, having MAs give injections is not the way we want to practice nursing in Connecticut. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. And uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, just to be clear, and I want to be very clear for the maybe three or four people who are still watching us on television. Uh, we be, need to be careful not to conflate what's going on with the COVID emergency and availability of volunteers with this bill. Uh, 
the use of volunteers has been enabled by uh, the governor's executive order. We're talking about a permanent change to uh, ability to uh, administer vaccines. So I just want to be clear on that. Senator Kushner, followed by Representative Terziak. Uh, I just want to uh, thank uh, Mary for her testimony here today. Mary is a constituent in uh, my district, and you know I've known you many years, Mary, and your service to the community, and particularly your medical. You know, being a nurse that so many people love and appreciate your whole life career uh, in nursing and in helping our community. So I wanted to recognize that and thank you for being here today to testify. Uh, thank you, Julie. And if I may, there was a comment, otherwise you asked about the um, what's needed for the assessment skills with the vaccine and actually not just the um, vaccines for COVID, but any vaccine when you get in to have to have the reaction, you have to be able to assess if the patient's having any respiratory distress. That's probably the most um, earliest sign and the one that's most dangerous because they do develop rashes, but it's the early signs of respiratory distress going into anaphylaxis. Any swelling of the body, especially upper respiratory system, that's what you have to be able to be trained uh, to watch. And I can appreciate they're saying the other uh, person that testified saying the medical assistants would just give the injection and the nurses and trained personnel work after, then um, I can appreciate that. But I wanted to address uh, your concerns and your question. Thank you for, for asking that. And I just wanted to address what's needed. Thank, Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative Terzia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Generally, I have a policy against speaking to greet people. Um, these meetings have to end somehow and we have some responsibility, but I'm going to break that tonight and not for a constituent, but for Mary. Um, thank you very much for all that you have done. A uh, fine example of a career spent at the patient's side making the same making the journey with the patient and for though having known you a lot of years i'm not surprised to hear how you're active and useful in accomplishing so much right now thank you very much thank you very much mr chair thank you thank you uh seeing any other questions or comments no thank you very much for your testimony for your patience this evening uh, and Hulick followed by 136, Geraldine Lapp. Hi, good evening. Good evening, and please go forward. You're a lovely shade of purple today. I'm not quite sure. I know, I'm sorry. I don't, it's the lighting here, I, I apologize. Um, so good evening, Representative Steinberg, Senator Abrams. Uh, vice chairs, ranking members, and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee. I'm here tonight um, representing the Connecticut Nurses Association. Um, you all, like many of you, I wear a couple of hats. Uh, I am not only the Connecticut Director of an environmental nonprofit organization, but I uh, also have been a decades long member of the Connecticut Nurses Association and I serve as their government relations liaison. Um, so I am submitting, or I'm speaking on behalf of that association this evening. Um, it's no surprise to you that CNA does not support uh, raised bill 285 as written, but we'd like to offer some recommendations. Um, we understand the complexities uh, of a changing workforce. I've been here all day. We've listened all day to the very compelling testimony on all sides. We appreciate the, um, the issues that you all are grappling with. And I wanna thank Representative Steinberg uh, for his comment a moment ago about, this is not necessarily about COVID, this is about a longer term policy and practice change. So thank you for that representative. Connecticut Nurses Association understands the changing workforce needs, the goal of maximizing access to care and the challenges faced by licensed providers in managing a busy practice. 
The Connecticut Nurses Association's primary concern is always ensuring the public's health and in providing safe, high quality care. We know you all share the same goal as do the physicians, APRNs, and PAs in those practices. The primary concern of the association with medical assistance administering vaccines really does center around the variability of the education um, of the programs in Connecticut. In reviewing these programs, um, we've learned that some are as short as 10 to 12 weeks for certification. Others can lead to an associate degree. Um, the curriculum varies, but generally includes focuses both on administrative functions as well as clinical tasks, ranging from scheduling, billing codes, filing, to taking blood pressures, EKGs, and doing other procedures. All of that has been talked about at length today. We also agree that all members of the healthcare team should practice to their full scope so as to maximize quality, efficient, and accessible healthcare. The medical assistant is an extremely valuable member of the team. However, uh, we still believe that giving an intramuscular injection is not a simple task. It requires a level of assessment, understanding of anatomical landmarks, muscle size, needle length, et cetera. Um, we understand that the licensed providers are ultimately accountable here in this bill for the delegated work, but we still believe that consistent standards for education and practice not only serve the medical assistants and the patients, but the licensed providers as well. For the past three years, CNA has collaborated with faculty, medical assistants, licensed providers, nurses, and have submitted recommendations that we believe might assure the highest level of patient safety for all. Again, just wanted understand to let you know you hit your three minute mark oh. if you could go ahead and, and wrap things up. Thank you so much for speaking today. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to conclude by saying we really want to work with all the members of this committee, with the MA programs, with the physicians, and the Department of Public Health to assure consistent and the highest level of standards. We know the workforce is changing. We accept that. We'd like to be uh, have a seat at the table in helping make sure that we get the best outcome for the patients, the providers, and the medical assistants. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne, and I'll take you up on your invitation to uh, participate and help us see if we can find a path to, as you say, recognize the changing landscape, uh, but we do want to assure quality and safety. Uh, I have half a mind to ask you about uh, what are quality in schools, but uh, anybody with half a mind shouldn't probably be asking questions. So I'll have to save that for another day. Uh, any other questions or comments? If not, thank you for your time as always. Much appreciated, all your good work. Representative Steinberg. Oh, I'm sorry, I must have missed yep. it. Uh, you, didn't miss it. You, you didn't miss it, uh, but I haven't been able to find a, uh, the ability to raise my hand. I guess it's off my uh, phone. But well, if I may, go right ahead. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for your testimony. Um, thank you. I've listened to most of this for uh, virtually the whole day. And I put myself in the position of a, uh, everybody's talking about patient safety, having the highest quality. We all want that. We're all wishing the same thing. If I were a doctor, I'd be hard pressed to believe I would allow somebody else to administer a shot if I did not have confidence in their ability to not only do it, but know what they're doing. So can you explain to me the need to, or, or the reason for not allowing the doctor to use their discretion to somebody who has been trained uh, in doing that? Can you enlighten me as to why that would be a unsafe or bad idea? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's really important and I think the association's position is that certainly we don't, you know, we, we have the highest respect for physicians and licensed providers, APRNs, et cetera. Um, and it's not about their ability to 
um, delegate appropriately or train appropriately. I think it's more a recognition and an understanding of the, the general busyness of these practices and wanting to assist, frankly, it's not, not trying to be oppositional, it's wanting to assist to, ele to make sure that the medical assistants are all on the same uh, level in terms of education and practice standards so that when they're entering the workforce, um, all of the providers can be assured that everyone has the same level of competency, I guess. It's kind of like as when, when we graduate from nursing school and go through, uh, you know, our licensure exams and uh, competencies in the practical setting during our orientations, where we are, you know, there's some level of baseline standards that are in place that we're required to meet as we get hired and, and we are uh, accountable to under our license for the, from the Department of Public Health. So I don't think it's in any way to your question, Representative, that um, you know, we certainly understand and, and admire and respect the physician's level of expertise and delegation, and they, they should have every right to do that. Um, we just want to make sure that we have some consistency in terms of the standards of education for the people coming out of those programs. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Any other questions? If not, and thank you for your testimony today. We look forward to your future contributions. Next thank up you, is Geraldine Lout, followed by Dale Cunningham. You're still muted, Gerilyn. Thank you for your patience. My name is Gerilyn Lott. I'm president of Glastonbury and I'm on the board of directors for Ampi, one of the five regional behavioral action organizations. I'm also a certified tobacco treatment specialist and prevention professional. Needless to say, I'm here in support of SB 326. We as a country are shattered by the loss of the number of lives due to COVID, but tobacco, or as I see it, the tobacco industry has been killing that same number of people every year for many years. 480,000 people across our United States with 5,000 in Connecticut. Before me, I have a copy of the Surgeon General's report issued in 2014, 50 years of progress. This is the supplement, another 1,500 pages combined. This report was issued 50 years after the first Surgeon General's report in 65 that linked tobacco with related death, disease, and disability. I'm afraid that we're going to have a similar report regarding vaping, but it may take years for that report to happen. And in the meantime, we're gonna have lots of lives lost, lots of innocent victims lost. Please don't wait to deter youth from adopting a lifelong addiction to nicotine that alters their brain chemistry to such a degree that a homeless person chooses cigarette over food or someone facing a terminal illness will still continue to smoke or a pregnant young woman here the risk to her child will continue to smoke cigarettes. Nicotine is the power to addict people to the degree that they will do something that they know is harmful, but they can't stop. I've worked with numerous people in recovery from heroin and alcohol addiction that quit smoking. Many die trying. Nicotine alters the brain chemistry to make people more susceptible to other drugs. Please do what we can to make that not happen to our future young people today. Um, if you're concerned about health equity and racial disparities, menthol is definitely killing more people. Banning menthol is intended to protect minorities, not harm them. Thank you for your time and for being here all day today. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I agree with you, uh, 
there's so much we still don't know about vaping because we ha haven't completed the research. So uh, there are a lot of unknowns out there. Any other questions or comments? If not, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for hanging with us all day today. We really appreciate it. Next up is Dale Cunningham, followed by Kevin O'Flaherty. Good evening. Um, my original testimony said good morning, but um, I appreciate being here uh, and listening all day. I, I uh, have gained a new appreciation for all of you to listen to and multitask many bills at one time. Um, my name is Dale Cunningham. I reside in Ledger, Connecticut. I've worked at Lawrence and Memorial Hospital for the last 30 years. I'm a neonatal nurse. I've been a nurse for 45 years. I've been a union leader at LM for 20 years. I'm president of the nurses um, union at LM under AFP Connecticut. And I uh, represent over 600 nurses. Uh, we have come several years in a row on a similar bill. Um, I'm here talk uh, not in favor of SB 285, allowing medical assistance to administer vaccines. Uh, I'm not gonna read my testimony. I'm just gonna comment on all that I've heard today. I hear, it appears to me, it seems to be nurses versus physicians today. Uh, quality of care versus efficiency of care. Um, licensed personnel versus certified personnel. I have not uh, very vague on what vaccines will be administered. There are many vaccines. As a neonatal nurse, I'm exposed to mostly pediatric medication. Um, the vaccines change constantly. Um, we have to, ver uh, even uh, doing this for 40 years, I have to verify the new medication, the manufacturers change, um, many uh, facets in the administration of a vaccine to a baby or a, uh, a neonate or um, a pediatric patient. I have not heard a lot of comments on that today. So that is a big concern of mine. Um, I uh, did not hear how the verification process would be. When I give a medication now, I have to double check it. If I'm not familiar with the dose, I, I look it up in, um, in uh, the resources we have available. Um, I, I didn't hear any of that mentioned today about the certainty of what medication is being administered. It seems like it's just thought of as a task to give a vaccine to someone. So I don't look at it way. Um, uh, I, I, I just want to point that out. Um, as a personal note, I'd like to say when I was 19 years old, I received um, an injection and I've had permanent nerve damage from that injection. So it, is, it does take a qualified individual to administer medication through a syringe and needle. Um, the other thing that wasn't mentioned a lot when we um, when we take an order from a physician and then we go to administer that medication to a patient and um, in these days we have as a, as a neonatal nurse I have parents so the doctor talks to the parents about the medication then they leave the room and um, we have to give the medication. Well, the parent then starts asking questions about the medication. I recently was at my physician's office and I said to the MA, um, you get the vaccination, the COVID vaccination. And he um, proceeded to tell me that he was fearful of the vaccination and um, he didn't know enough about it to get it. Um Ms. Cunningham, no, no, you've no, reached no, your three minutes. I just want to let you know you reached your three minutes. If you want to go ahead and give your closing statement. Thank you so much. Okay. So I, I just basically have many concerns about the vagueness and um, the process 
of administration of vaccines, especially children. Um, and uh, I just want to quickly mention that there's lots of nurses over 50 that w appreciate the low stress environment of giving vaccines. Thank you for your testimony. I think you did raise a number of points that we hadn't discussed earlier. I do hope though that uh, the situation is not quite as oppositional as you describe it. Uh, I'd like to believe that uh, uh, parties can agree to disagree, but also find common ground. And if there are ways in which we could make this piece of legislation less vague uh, and more appropriate, uh, we'd be glad to hear from you on that. Are there any other questions or comments? If not, thank you for your testimony. We really appreciate it. You added some good points. We really needed there. We have Kevin O'Flaherty followed by number 140, Lindsey Stroud. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman, uh, Chairperson Abrams and Chairperson uh, Steinberg for uh, your leadership on this issue. And thanks to the rest of the committee for being here and giving me the opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Kevin O'Flaherty. I represent the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids here in Connecticut. We rise in strong support of SB 326, which would ban the sale of all flavored tobacco products, as well as SB 115, which would prohibit the sale of all tobacco products in pharmacies and healthcare facilities. I've submitted written testimony, but I wanted to take my time uh, this evening to address two arguments that the industry keeps bringing up. One is the so-called failed experiment in Massachusetts. To be clear, the only party who's, who see this law as a failure are the tobacco industry and their retailers who opposed it all along. The legislature and its leadership were strong report supporters of the law, and they remain so. Governor Baker, who is a bit more conservative than the legislature there, has publicly said that they should not delay the law and remains in full support of it. That's because the goal of the law wasn't to actually reduce smoking among adults. The goal was to reduce smoking and vaping initiation among youth by getting these products that are designed to addict kids out of the stores where the kids see them, out of their hands, and frankly, so far, there is zero evidence to suggest that the law has not been effective in that regard. The fact that many adults have bought tobacco in other states after the initial implementation of the law does not mean that it hasn't worked. On the contrary, the percentage of tobacco products that are sold to or used by kids is actually very small. Um, after all, there are far more adults at any one time in the country than there are teens. So that's expected. It's also important to note that Massachusetts fully anticipated tax revenues declining as a result of this law, and that so far the actual experiences that they've seen are in line with the projected revenue impacts that they expected. The legislators in Massachusetts made a choice to put the health of the Commonwealth and protecting their kids above the financial interests of retailers and their own state revenue. And we can do the same here. And I have to just say that to sacrifice generation after generation to tobacco addiction, in the name of making it easier for older generations to keep using the very products that hooked them in the first place when they were kids, or because we're afraid to lose revenue from those sales, is reprehensible. Uh, I think it's time to stop that from happening in Connecticut. Secondly, this law will only be enforced through health departments or similar entities against retailers, not by the police or any individual or against any individual persons. It doesn't criminalize the purchase, use, or possession of these products. To suggest that making these products less available to kids by taking them out of the stores while not criminalizing their possession at all, to suggest that that is somehow going to in increase interactions between law enforcement and persons of color is both deceitful and insidious. And I say insidious because to take a false argument and use it to play into very legitimate fears that exist in the black community that persons of color have about law enforcement and then exacerbate them in a way that actually does more harm to the very communities that they're claiming to protect. Um, that's why the NAACP, the Urban League, the National Medical Association, and many other organizations that see firsthand the impacts that the industry has inflicted on black and brown communities support this legislation. And most of the folks who are against it are either people who profit from the tobacco products or who have received money from the industry. Please don't let them fool you. There is no evidence of increased police enforcement, gang violence, or anything along those lines that are attributable, attributable to these policies in Massachusetts or in any of the hundred plus other cities who have implemented a comprehensive ban on the sale of flavored tobacco. Thank you very much for your time this evening and the opportunity to testify. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, and again, coming late sometimes affords you an opportunity to uh, 
uh, have perspective on what's come before. And I also take your point that I, I was disappointed to hear that the verdict was already in on Massachusetts after such a short period of time. Uh, typically, we like to give people at least a couple more weeks before we decide whether or not they've been a success. So uh, I think you make a good point. And uh, I also appreciate the fact that you've kind of refocused uh, really the goals of the legislation as opposed to some of the things we've heard today. Are there, oh uh, yes, we have a number of questions. Senator Anwar fellow, followed by Representative Zupkis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Kevin, for your testimony and, and your strong arguments. I, I, I think um, if you can allude to the fact um, that the, the time it has been since this law was enacted in, in Massachusetts, because a lot of people have come in and, and uh, con tried to convince us that Massachusetts is a failure. Um, and I, I think um, uh, the, the two parts that I think is worthy to mention is that we are looking at the future while we're looking at the current times where there's a future. And then the other part is uh, the, 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 the use pattern change uh, that is there and, and who's studying and how soon can we get real data rather than anecdotal uh, industry-based videos and so on. Right. Well, that's a good point, Senator Anwar. All we've really seen of the so-called ex so-called exploding black market in Massachusetts is some some homemade selfie videos of some people, you know, perhaps buying cigarettes. That video, uh, you know, could have been taken before. Like, you know, these transactions occur. They always have. They always will. Uh, and and to to your to the point I made earlier, those there's no evidence that we're seeing increased gang violence. Or, or any kind of criminal activity around this uh, that, that's actually damaging communities in Massachusetts. But I think to the point that both Representative Seinberg and yourself are getting to, you know, we've never tracked youth tobacco use rates by sales. I mean, you can that gives you a sort of an aggregate look at, at how many people are buying products, but that's not what really tells you whether youth rates are going up or down. That's from, you know, nationally led by the CDC and other federal government agencies, as well as state agencies surveys that are administered every one to two years. Uh, and that's where we'll really be able to tell whether the use rates are going down. Um, but to the, to the point of all these lost sales, again, you know, the, the vast majority of, of sales, of tobacco sales are to adults. Uh, and so the fact that a big chunk of adults might still be buying these products and uh, might be getting these products in another state doesn't mean that the, the Fact that these products are no longer in stores, kids don't see them, they don't see the advertising for them, and it becomes much harder for them to get. It doesn't mean that, that the, those youth rates aren't going down, and, and we fully expect them to. The, the evidence shows that flavors are a big part of why kids ever get in, hooked on these products, and if you make them unavailable and make them less available, um, we'll see those results. Uh, to that point as well, we think it's important that that we do start taking a regional approach and not wait for the FDA so that if Massachusetts does it and Connecticut does it and Rhode Island expands their band from just flavored e-cigarettes to all flavored tobacco products, et cetera, that, that the, the cross-border, uh, the ease of crossing the border to get those products will go down and we'll see an even larger impact. And, and, and Kevin, uh, another part is that somebody was trying to convince us that uh, a small uh, segment of the adults may bet, get benefit in smoking cessation from the flavored products, and therefore the flavored vapes should continue to be used. Um, but if you were to look at, let's say, first of all, I question some of that data, but, but let's say if it's accurate for a second, even if it's accurate, the broader impact on the well-being of the next generation of our children um, how does that play into the, the spectrum? And, and also, can you comment on the Attorney General, uh, the state of Connecticut's Attorney General's position? How does that impact our uh, situation in our state? Well, I appreciate those questions, Senator Anwar. Um, so, so first off, the, 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 the strongest study, which came out of England, that showed that, that um, e-cigarettes could be as effective or slightly more effective than just using NRT, uh, the, the product that they actually gave to the individuals to start using that to try to help them quit was not a flavored product. It was just a tobacco flavored e-cigarette product. So that, and they use that evidence, but they, they then try to say that that means we have to have flavors for adults to quit. And that's just not true. There's no evidence uh, to show that, 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 they, that they need flavors to quit, that the people who really wanna quit and that vaping might help them quit um, would, would, would be able to use a, a non, a non-flavored product, a, a tobacco product as well. But I think the bigger point or the bigger answer to your question is if you look 
at the day, you know, what the, 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 to paraphrase a well-known uh, quote, you know, the plural of anecdote is not evidence. And sure, there are some people who are using these products to quit, but you're making decisions not about individual health. That decision should be made between a doctor like yourself and their patient. You're making decisions to, to benefit the public health. And when you look at what has happened uh, you know, in the country with the advent of e-cigarettes, um, what we've seen over the last six or seven years is this huge explosion in the sales of e-cigarettes. And, and then if you plot a line of what the youth use rates were during that time, it directly mirrors that increase. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'll show you a quick graph here. And I'll, I'll share this with the committee. The blue mountain is actual sales of e-cigarettes. The red bars are youth use. And so you see that that has gone up dramatically. But what you also see is that when you look at that same mountain of sales, you may have a hard time seeing this. Those little red bars at the bottom are the adult use of e-cigarettes. And they stayed steady between 3.2 and 2.8% going up and down. As, the, as those sales increased dramatically, adults were not part of driving that increase in sales. And then I think most damning of all is that when you look at this, this is the adult smoking rate. And as you can see, again, with that mountain of sales, the rate went down, but only at the same rate it was going down before those sales increased. This is the background smoking declines that have passed because of the tobacco taxes that you've passed in the past because of smoke-free laws and other policies. So from a population data perspective, the evidence does not support that e-cigarettes are being used to help adults quit. Those sales are on the backs of kids. And that's what we're trying to stop here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. And I want to congratulate you for being able to use visual aids in a challenging environment. And perhaps you'd be willing to share those with us so we can look at them at our leisure. Uh, Representative Zupkis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, good evening, uh, Mr. O'Flaherty. Um, a couple of questions for you. Um, you made a comment a minute ago about health department police are not going to be uh, monitoring this. This is going to be the health department, so they could go into a uh, store and find the store. Is it, did I hear you correctly? Yeah, the only the only target of these laws, if you want to call it a target, is licensed retailers. We're trying to get these products out of the stores, so. It, it might be the health department, it might be uh, the Department of Taxation, whoever enforces the tobacco retail licensing laws in the state, when they go in to do their normal inspections, or if they get a report that a retailer is selling products that are now prohibited to be sold, then they would be cited for carrying products and attempting to sell them uh, that, 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 that they're no longer allowed to. This law doesn't penalize people on the streets who happen to have a prohibited product regarding, regardless of their age. Uh, it's only about getting these products off the shelves so that they're not so easy for kids to access. Okay, because I'm not for health departments doing giving fines. I may be another group that the tobacco, whoever. But um, so do they, um, is that how it's done in other states? Matt, it okay. is. That's right. Uh, in Massachusetts and the California law, which hasn't gone into effect yet, but is very similar to the Massachusetts law, uh, the, the users of these products are not penalized. It is, it is only saying what retailers can and can't sell in that state. Right. Okay. And then speaking of Massachusetts, someone um, before you, prior to you, a couple, a, could have been the last speaker or speaker before, um, mentioned that in Massachusetts, there is a law right now, a proposed piece of legislation to rescind their legislation. Are you, is that, are you familiar? Is that true? I am. That bill was introduced last year as well in 2020. There were uh, several bills. One would have delayed implementation for a year. The retailer said, oh, this is a fine law. We just want you to delay for a year because of COVID, which I think is probably disingenuous. I think their goal is to repeal the law. And then there were, as another bill that would have repealed the law in general. They also asked the governor to use his executive authority uh, to delay implementation of the law. Uh, those bills did not move. They died in committee. Uh, those bills have been reintroduced. Um, I know last year that that bill in Massachusetts, uh, a constituent can basically ask a legislator to introduce a bill and legislators are sort of obligated to in introduce it, but they don't necessarily request a hearing for it or anything like that unless they agree with it and believe in it strongly. 
I believe that was the case with these bills last year in Massachusetts. I'm not sure if it's the case with the bills this year. The leadership is strongly supportive of this, as is the governor. Uh, there is no appetite in Massachusetts to repeal this law. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the financial um, revenue impacts have been exactly what they expected. Mm -hmm. So it's not like this has thrown the budget out of whack. And I'm not, I will not sit here tonight and tell you that the state will not lose revenue if you pass this law. You will, uh, you know, and, and I, I, you're not going to lose as much as the industry says you're going to lose, but some people, you know, will actually quit smoking as a result of this, which is good. Some adults, some will cross state lines. Most of them will probably just switch to non-flavored products. And yeah. Then so, so I was just, I was just curious because I had heard in a prior speaker that that, and so it is back on the table. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens. So maybe they'll do something with it. Maybe they want, but it is back. Um, People will always try to do that. Yes. Well, oh, it, with everything. <laughs> yes. Um, and so could you just briefly, um, I have not heard of your organization. So how, how long has it been in existence and exactly are you targeting just tobacco? with kids? Yeah, we, we have been around, I think now for 24, 25 years. Um, we started, we were not funded by money from the master settlement, but we started around that time uh, to try to really uh, increase the ability of the public health community and other advocates uh, to be able to pass policies that would help reduce tobacco use. We are strictly a policy advocacy organization. Okay. We support programmatic work in communities, um, but we, we that's not the work we do. We try to pass laws that would reduce tobacco use among adults and kids. So you don't educate children or anything, you strictly are policy driven. That's right. We do okay. support funding for tobacco prevention programs at the state level uh, as well, but, but we don't do that work ourselves or take any money for that. Okay, just my last quick question. So it's just tobacco. Are you, are you gonna come out on recreational marijuana? What we, we are not. We are we are focused strictly on reducing the impacts of tobacco use uh, on uh, our nation in general, but especially on our kids. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Just to uh, also uh, comment on your one of your previous questions, if you recall the Tobacco Twenty One Bill we passed two years ago, administration and enforcement is uh, allotted over uh, several agencies depending upon the specific uh, uh, task at hand. So uh, I would not worry about the Department of Public Health having responsibility for this. It will likely follow the same framework that we instituted two years ago. Representative Carpino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. O'Flaherty, you, you had some charts, so I'm hoping you might be someone who can answer a question I've had since early this morning. How long um, can we as Connecticut policymakers, um, or how long do we need to wait to find out the implications on either use, access, or sale, because let's be honest, it happens, otherwise we wouldn't be having these conversations, um, to our youth as a result of raising the age of tobacco to 21. Yeah, I mean, it, I'll, I'll be, it'll be interesting to see what happens now that it's a national law uh, to see if they're able to sort of, and I'm not a researcher, but I, I, I sometimes can speak well uh, to, to things that are uh, discovered through research uh, in this field. Um, because there's a lot of noise in the background now um, with all these different policies that have happened, whether it's the states reducing, uh, increasing the age at different points, tax increases, which while they um, definitely reduce uh, tobacco use among adults, they have an even stronger impact on kids, et cetera. But my, would, my guess would be that in the next year or two, we'll be able to see some clear results of what that impact was uh, from, from NCI and other national organizations that will be looking at that. Thank you. So you think it's another year or two to see what our, uh, the implications are of what we've already done? I think that's probably right. Um, but, you know, again, I think you do see the implications overall in terms of youth use going down in general. Um, again, the e-cigarette um, problem, if you want to just call it that, is also adds noise to this because these are products that came on the market, especially with Juul in 2016-2017, and totally create, created this new incentive for kids to want to start using tobacco products that they didn't have two or three years earlier. And, and so it, it's hard to you know, separate all of that out, but my guess is that brighter people than I are, are looking at that and, um, and, and hopefully we will have some clear indications of it uh, you know, again in the next couple of years. 
No, and I, and I appreciate that because regardless of where this bill goes, I'm just looking for facts. And it's very hard uh, to determine how successful we are if we don't know uh, what our starting point is. So I, I thank you and I, I thank you for giving us your time tonight. Thank you, appreciate Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, again, thank you for your testimony today. Um, really much appreciated. Thank you, Representative. Moving along, number 140, Lindsay Stroud, followed by Margaret Guerrera. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, all right. Uh, members of the Public Health Committee, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify today regarding banning the sale of flavored tobacco and vapor products. My name is Lindsay Stroud. I'm a policy analyst with the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, and I did submit testimony, um, but I would just like to kind of highlight a few things. Um, one, youth in Connecticut are not overwhelmingly using e-cigarettes because of flavors. According to the 2019 Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which the state does in conjunction with the CDC, when high school students were asked for the main reason on why they used e-cigarettes, only 5.2% of them responded because of flavors. Conversely, 12.9% cited friends and family members and 18.2% cited other. This is similar to data that you find in other states, including Rhode Island and Vermont. There have been adverse effects of flavor bans. They've been still are new in states, but in localities that have done them, there's still been increase in youth vapor use as well as combustible cigarette use. For example, San Francisco banned flavored e-cigarettes in 2018 and between 2017 and 2019, vapor product use among high school students increased by 125%, but worse, combustible cigarette use increased by 38.3%. I would like to point out that the numbers that the previous speaker brought up as in regards to e-cigarette sales do not include vape shops or online stores, so they don't really grab the big picture. I've been actually looking at uh, data from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, which actually looks at adult um, behaviors, and actually e-cigarette actual use actually um, correlates with stronger uh, reductions of smoking rates among younger adults. Between 1998 and 2008, 10 years after suing tobacco companies, smoking rates among current smokers in Connecticut aged 18 to 24 years old decreased by 43.7%. 10 years after e-cigarettes market, market emergence between, between 2009 and 2019, young adult smoking rates decreased by 70.8%. Further, e-cigarettes were associated with a larger decline in average annual percent decreases. Between 1998 and 2008, the percentage of current smokers aged 18 to 24 years old decreased on average 2.42% each year. Between 2009 and 2019, annual percentage declines average at 7.52%. Perhaps... Problem some, problem, deeply problemsome with this, um, it, it, this ban is that Connecticut spends very little funding on tobacco control. In 20 years of time, Connecticut allocated only $36.4 million in tobacco control programs. During that same time period, the state received more than $6.2 billion in tobacco tax revenue and $1.885 billion in tobacco settlement payments. Further, between 2017 and 2020, during the so-called youth vaping epidemic, Connecticut dedicated $0 per year in tobacco control funding. Rather than imposing bans, lawmakers should utilize more existing tobacco dollars towards prevention programs and work with public health, educators, and tobacco and vapor retailers to address youth vapor and tobacco use. Thank you for your time, and I'm available for any questions. Wow, that was really fast. Uh, Sorry. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, Senator Haskell, again? Just kidding. I think this is the first time you've actually uh, raised your hand. Please go for it. Go ahead. It is the first time. Thank you, Representative uh, Ch Chairman Steinberg. And Ms. Stroud, thanks for your patience today. I have a few questions. Um, you were moving quickly, and I didn't quite understand one point that you made. You said that um, evidence seems to show that young people aren't drawn to vaping because of flavors, but for some other reason. I just, it, it strikes me as implausible. I worked at a convenience store all, all four years of my college experience, and uh, Jules came into the store when I was a freshman, nobody bought them. Then there was a mint flavor sophomore year, they became more popular, but it was only when mango hit our shelves that uh, we started to sell out a, each and every single day. So I guess my question for you is what was the study you were referencing that young people are vaping because of family influences and not flavors? Could you slow that one down and, and walk me through it? Yeah, absolutely. It's actually um, multiple state studies with the Youth Risk Behavior Survey um, that is done every other year with the Centers for Disease Control. So not every state actually asks this question, but some of them do. And they ask, what is the main reason why you use e-cigarette products? And they only, some can 
say as many as they like. Some of them don't actually let you can only choose one of them, but there's multiple options, including friends or family, other because they're available in flavors, they're less harmful, they're easier to get. And overwhelmingly, you're seeing the first top two answers always friends or family members or other flavors usually consistently is like third in line as far as a reason to use it. Interesting. It, it doesn't sync with my experience at all being behind the counter or the young people I know who are vaping, but I, I will I will look, dig into the study. Uh, I saw that you were testifying in uh, or earlier in the day, and I saw that you were for the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. I did, I don't know, maybe 20, 20 minutes worth of Googling and couldn't find how the Taxpayer Alliance, uh, Protection Alliance is funded. Could you provide any details on the, the funding for that organization? Um, I'm brand new, so I actually don't know. I just started in January, um, but I don't think they actually disclose any of their funding, um, but I can get back to you on that one. I'll talk to the big bosses. It's correct that they don't disclose any of their funding, although it has been reported. It, and I'm, I'm wondering if you could confirm that the Taxpayers Protection Alliance is funded by the Koch brothers. I cannot confirm that. Understood. Well, I was really moved by a story. I, I, I will wrap up with this question, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the indulgence. I was really moved by a story uh, earlier today about a, a mother who actually saw her uh, adolescent son become so addicted to nicotine, which we know and has been proven time and time again that nicotine has a chemically addictive component that an otherwise healthy young person was driven to suicidal ideations. Um, it struck me as unusual, but uh, granted, I serve on a bunch of different committees and don't spend all of my time I, I invested in this particular topic. So uh, I was surprised when, again, in doing some digging, trying to find out more about the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, I came across your Twitter and earlier today during this hearing, you said, I've heard this story in several hearings. If your kid is threatening to kill themselves because of nicotine, this is beyond e-cigarette or big tobacco. This is a mental health issue or lack of control. Is it accurate to say, and I understand you advocate on this issue in many states, you've heard that story in multiple hearings. Is this an issue that young people are actually driven to suicidal ideations in, in many different contexts all around the issue of nicotine addiction? I've heard that particular story, different iterations of it from the same woman in different uh, testimonies. But you don't overwhelmingly see, you know, vaping, nicotine addiction, especially, um, you know, in the throes of the opioid epidemic, especially right now. Well, that's a relief. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for the indulgence. Thank you. And don't be a stranger, Senator. Uh, any other questions or comments? If not, thank you for thank your you. testimony today and for your patience in waiting so long. Thank Next you. up is Margaret Guerrero, followed by Philip Gardner. Good evening, Senator Dougherty Abrams, Representative Steinberg, Senator Summers, Senator Wong, Representative Pennett, and members of the committee. The Connecticut Society for Respiratory Care appreciates this opportunity to provide testimony concerning SB, Senate Bill 285, an act allowing medical assistance to administer vaccines. My name is Margaret Guerrero, and I'm the current president of the society. After reviewing the published testimony related to this bill this past week, we noted that a medical assistant suggested the addition of nebulizer therapy to um, this bill. Uh, in listening to some testimony this evening, I also heard um, medication administration done by medical assistants. It's been our past experience too that similar bills that have been proposed considered adding nebulizer therapy. So I'm here today to testify on that in that regard. Let me tell you a little bit about the CTSRC. We're a professional organization that represents respiratory therapists practicing in the state of Connecticut. There are over 1,700 licensed respiratory therapists living and practicing here. Respiratory therapists are employed in various settings, including acute care hospitals, rehabilitation and extended care facilities, home care and physician's offices. Our education and training are specific to the cardiopulmonary system and includes rapid and focused assessment of acutely ill patients. Our profession is well regarded by our colleagues and our value during this pandemic has been equal to that of our nursing and physician colleagues. While administration of medication by nebulizer is done in the home by many patients and their caregivers, this patient population is typically considered stable and in their normal state of health. When nebulizer therapy is administered in other healthcare settings, 
such as a physician's office or clinic, these patients are often acutely ill with breathing difficulties, and many times their next stop is the emergency room. Therefore, it is critically important that the treatment is administered by a healthcare practitioner who's trained in cardiopulmonary assessment and who can identify deteriorating conditions and medication side effects during the treatment. In addition to this, the treatment is only as good as the person instructing the patient on the breathing technique necessary for optimal inhaled deposition of the drug. This too requires the skill of a well-trained practitioner. We hope that this helps the committee understand the level of training required to perform what may seem like a simple procedure on the surface, but when combined with an acutely ill patient is not. It is our belief that medical assistants do not have the educational background to administer nebulizer therapy to acutely ill patients, nor do they possess the skills necessary to identify and react to deteriorating patient conditions. The CTSRC is opposed to medical assistance administ administering nebulizer therapy in any healthcare setting, and therefore opposes the addition of the administration of nebulizer therapy to this bill, should that be considered. In addition, the CTSRC is also supportive of vac vaccination administration by licensed healthcare professionals, such as respiratory therapists. The CTSRC supports it adding appropriately trained respiratory therapists to the list of healthcare providers who are currently allowed to administer vaccines. We feel that this is especially important during the current mass COVID-19 vaccination program. Thank you for your consideration of our position. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? If not, thank you for your time. Uh, moving you. on, we have uh, Philip Gardner followed by Andrew O'Bright. Um, good evening. I'm Dr. Philip Gardner. I'm the co-chair of the African-American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. We're a national organization that's been fighting for menthol, um, get menthol off the market since it was left on by the FDA, by the Senate and the FDA in, um, in 2009. I've listened to most of the testimony today, and I must admit, I want to bring people up to date on what menthol actually is and what it actually does in the body, so that this is a theoretical question. Um, menthol is the chief constituent of peppermint oil. Um, it masks the harsh taste of smoking. It has cooling sensation. It activates taste buds. It actually activates the same taste buds that capsaicin does, which is the active ingredient in hot sauce. It increases throat breath. And basically, not basically, that's what it is by definition, menthol is an anesthetic. It allows for easier and deeper inhalation the more nicotine you take in, the more addicted you become, the harder it is to quit. Also be aware that mentholated cigarettes inhibits nicotine metabolism. When nicotine enters your liver, it becomes cotinine. And if it has menthol in it, menthol slows down the metabolism, meaning it stays in your body longer. Um, menthol also, um, what we say, activates neurotransmitters in the brain. If you smoke a menthol cigarette, it will attract more nicotine receptors in your brain than if you don't smoke a menthol cigarette. We've known this for years. This is why the tobacco industry puts it in there. It increases what we call salive. It increases transbuchal drug absorption. What that means is if you're chewing tobacco that has menthol in it, it crosses the gum barrier much more effectively. And, and, and probably most problematic, um, menthol in cigarette smoke leads to greater cell permeability, meaning if there's menthol in the smoke that you inhale, it goes into the cell much more effectively than if it didn't have menthol in it. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of um, talk here this afternoon about um, menthol being harder to quit. Actually, there's a number of studies on this. What's most interesting to me is that menthol smokers try more often to quit while at the same time they're less effective at doing it. We have study after study after study and it's because of these number of things that go on. There's another thing you should know about, um, um, about menthol and nicotine. The darker your skin means the more nicotine is stored in your body. This is melanin and nicotine. And if you are an African-American who are disproportionately smoking menthol cigarettes, then you're saving me menthol in your body, which is problematic at best. Let's be clear that the idea that, um, I'm just gonna read you this. 
be appraised that 85% of African American adults and 94% of Black youth who smoke are using menthol products. These striking statistics are because of predatory marketing in our community. Predatory marketing, we mean there are more lucrative advertisings, there are more promotions, and I guess what is the main thing that pisses me off is that they're cheaper in the Black community. It's cheaper in poor communities to get flavored tobacco products. I think that the, the, the tobacco industry has something to do with that. Let me just say that um, there's some groups going around that are funded by the tobacco industry saying that- Sorry, excuse me, you've hit your three minutes. If you could conclude your remarks. I'm gonna conclude right now. Thank you very much. Let's say these are our cigarettes. Nothing could be further from the truth. These were pushed down our throat by the tobacco industry. And we would like to get the tobacco industry, get these death sticks out of our community. I'll answer any questions anybody has. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Doctor. I would have thought after 12 hours of testimony that we'd heard uh, about all we needed to hear, but uh, you've just shared a lot of information about the science of menthol that uh, I was not aware of, and I'm, I'm hopeful that you will be willing to share uh, the studies that you refer to. Uh, this is uh, uh, new insights for us, so we very much appreciate it. Clearly, you've done uh, a lot of research on this subject over a period of years. Uh, Representative Pettit. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. So in summary, we've heard a lot of testimony going both directions in terms of the, the Black community. To, to sum up what you said, you, you think the advantages of banning menthol and other flavors would actually be in total a benefit to, to the Black community as opposed to a, a negative. Precisely. Um, the main killer of Black people in the United States historically and today have been tobacco products. Black folks die disproportionately from lung disease, heart disease, and cerebrovascular stroke. Um, there are folks that are out there that say, what about the, I heard a, the, one of the doctors earlier say, what about the unintended consequences? Let's think about it for a minute. What are the intended consequences of smoking? Half of the people that use cigarettes die from them. The tobacco industry has to replace these people every year. They don't care about black people. They don't care about any of this stuff. The other thing that came up, and I, I appreciate the discussion that went on earlier, um, we should decriminalize, <clears throat> and it seems like this bill does, decriminalize um, commercial um, tobacco products. There should be no reason for people being arrested for possession use or purchase of these products as I think was pointed out by Representative Steinberg, um, there's other ways to deal with this. We don't need people with guns and, and, and hoses and sticks beating up kids because they have a cigarette. I, I, I just have to say that. Um, you know, and then lastly, still other groups um, in the black community put out the thing um, that, um, this thing, and I, this is where I wanted to end, that this is our cigarette and that we're being racist and discriminatory. Look, let me just be as frank with you as possible. It's very hard when a black person says to a white um, <clears throat> legislature that you're being racist because you're taking my cigarette. And we go, oh, I don't wanna be racist. But the point is, this isn't our cigarette. For 50 years, and I, you know, much longer presentation, um, we could go through this. But for 50 years, you might look at it this way. In 1953, 5% of black folks smoked menthol. By 1968, it had almost tripled to 14%. By 1976, it had tripled again to 42%. By the mid 2000s, we were over 80%. And as I read to you earlier, 85% of African-American adults and 94% of African-American youth used these products. Where did that come from? How did this become our cigarette? because they were pushed down our throat, they were cheaper, they were marketed more. That's how it became ours. So when this argument comes up again, we have to stand up to it. Hopefully, I, I was there in, um, and I appreciate Kevin O'Flaherty's point, I was there in Massachusetts to help pass that law. We were in California and helped pass that law. The African-American Tobacco Control Leadership Council is a nationwide organization, even though we're based in California. We're working on this same discussion is going on in Maryland right now. We will testify on Wednesday at another hearing. 
So I, I want to applaud um, Connecticut in the midst of this pandemic. There's nothing that could be done that would be more helpful in protecting lives, and particularly Black lives, than getting menthol products and flavored tobacco products off the market. Thank, thank you, Dr. Gardner. Thank you, uh, Chairman Seiberg. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Any other questions or comments? If not, again, Doctor, thank you for your testimony, and I really do encourage you to share your research with us. Uh, I did send a letter to the committee, um, but the amount what 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 I've been reading from are a number of powerpoints that I've done. I think we will send another letter to you guys with even more detail. Um, but do look for the letter from the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, um, signed by myself, um, and we go into the whole, whole e-cigarette thing. We just didn't have time to go through it here today. Look, thank you very much. Thank you. We all recognize that uh, three minutes is not enough to cover the waterfront much much of the time. All right. Uh, next up is Andrew O'Bright, followed by Bright Johnson. Boy, Bright to Bright. That's what are the odds of that? Andrew, hey. go ahead. Uh, thank you for having me, esteemed uh, members of the Public Health Committee. Uh, good evening. My name is Andrew O'Bright. I'm the president of the Connecticut chapter of the Smoke Free Alternative Trade Association. Um, I am here representing the small and micro vapor businesses in the state of Connecticut. Um, our association has been part of um, these talks for the last seven years. Um, we have uh, been more than willing to work with this committee uh, at, at every turn. Uh, and unfortunately, this particular uh, bill, we just cannot get behind uh, bill SB 326. Um, if this bill were to pass, we would not have an association next year to come and talk to you all. Uh, this is extremely important because we are the gatekeepers at the end of the day. 99.8% uh, of the FDA warning letters that went out for underage use over the last three years were outside of our purview. Um, only 0.2% of underage warning letters went to vape only stores. Um, so we obviously know something that somebody else doesn't know because we've been doing it right. Um, if this were to happen, not only would our association be disbanded, but all of the stores that do this would be disbanded. So you'd be handing effectively the entire industry over to Big Tobacco, which you claim to, to dislike. Um, and also over to the gas stations and convenience stores that are unfortunately, obviously selling underage. Um, they're the ones that are getting cited daily by the FDA. And so we have to look at this, um, you know, from a different perspective. And, and we have to look at it federally too. Um, the FDA, I personally have sent millions of pages of information to the FDA over the past uh, six months to prove um, that these products are appropriate for the protection of public health. And they're in the process of understanding what flavors are and are not appropriate for the protection of public health. Um, so we need to leave this up to, um, you know, the people that that we trust for, you know, the, the one year vaccine, you know, for for the, the place that we go to, um, to understand what is right for public health. Um, and then we also need to talk about enforcement. Our state spends zero dollars of our tobacco tax to um, enforce these, these Tobacco 21 laws. And we need to look further into this. Um, you, if you remove us, you remove the good players and leave only the bad players. Um, so, you know, let's, let's spend, you know, a million dollars um, over the course of the next year and just send enforcement officers to, to start slapping wrists. Um, we, we just don't do it enough and it's very evident. And that's why you see FDA warning letters all the time um, to, these other, to these other establishments. Um, I'll take any questions now, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony and for hanging in there. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank uh, you. Next, we have uh, 144 Bright Johnson followed by Yad Jamal. Good evening. My name is Bright Johnson. I am the Connecticut Government Relations Director for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. 
where you've submitted longer written, te written testimony in support of SB 326 and SB 115. So I'd like to use my time to hit on a few, of a few main points. Tragically, 4,900 adults will die in Connecticut from smoking this year, 13 per day. Meanwhile, there are 56,000 children who are alive now who, that will die prematurely due to smoking related disease. Connecticut incurs 2.03 billion in healthcare costs every year directly caused by tobacco use and another 1 billion due to lost productivity. Flavors are a marketing weapon used by tobacco manufacturers to target youth and young people to a lifetime of addiction. Flavors can improve the ease of use of a tobacco product by masking harsh effects, facilitating nicotine uptake and increasing a product's overall appeal. Products with flavors like cherry, grape, cotton candy, and gummy bear are clearly not aimed at established adult tobacco users. Furthermore, youth report flavors are a leading reason they use tobacco products and perceive flavored products to be less harmful. The most popular flavor, menthol, acts to mask the harsh taste of tobacco with a minty flavor and by reducing irritation at the back of the throat with a cooling sensation. Decades before cigarette companies started adding fruit and candy flavorings to cigarettes, they were manipulating levels of menthol to addict new young smokers and then specifically targeting and marketing menthol products to communities of color. A shocking and telling proof of their success is that only 5% of African Americans who smoked used menthol before they became targets of big tobacco in the 1950s. Today, that number is 85%, while comparatively only 29% of white smokers use menthol. Realizing there are additional mitigating factors around revenue and savings, in fiscal year 20, Connecticut was projected to receive 485 million in combined revenue from tobacco taxes and from the master settlement agreement, which amounts to $55,365 every hour of every day. However, Connecticut incurs 2.03 billion in annual healthcare costs related to tobacco use or $231,000 every hour of every day. The cost of tobacco is 175,700 more per hour than we receive in revenue every hour, every day. Tobacco use is a tragedy for the people of Connecticut. We should be doing everything we can to help people quit and prevent people from ever starting to use these products. We shouldn't be making it easier to become addicted. Very briefly regarding SB 115, healthcare facilities and pharmacies are in the business of helping make people healthier. They should not be pushing a product that can lead to addiction and make people sick. Thank you and we urge your support. Well, thank you, Bright. That was very swift and covered a lot of ground. Uh, I'm sure you would have preferred to go hours earlier. That's the wonders of the lottery. Um, but uh, I think you, you would agree that we've uh, really discussed a lot of the things that you brought up. Uh, a lot of your points were uh, addressed in one fashion or another today. And we have uh, a task as a committee, uh, really uh, uh, filtering all the information we received and trying to come to a conclusion about this. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions or comments? Thank you. We really do appreciate your testimony, as always, and your uh, advocacy for this and for your uh, central role in the Tobacco 21 bill. Uh, if there's no further uh, questions, I understand Mr. Jamal is not here. Uh, Richard Marianos, followed by Akilia James. How's that? Can you see me and hear me? We can do both those things. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a long day since nine o'clock. What I'd like to speak to is I'm up in uh, opposition to Senate Bill 326. You've heard testimony throughout the day. I'm up to 146. Let me introduce myself. My name is Richard Marianos. I'm a 30 year law enforcement career veteran, retired assistant director with the United States Department of Justice ATF. I'm a member of the IACP and the Police Executive Research Forum. What I wanted to talk about today is the other side is the dangers of criminal trafficking with tobacco. In addition, try to address some of the false claims that you've heard today. Criminal tobacco trafficking and the sale of counterfeit vape is a $10 billion a year business uh, in the United States. It's a criminal enterprise along the East Coast right now that it, uh, is right now, we're just looking at 10 billion along the East Coast, if they can go around the rest of the nation. But specifically um, in, Canada, in Connecticut, if you're, if you're looking at this problem right now of criminal tobacco trafficking, you're looking at about $130 million loss. And, I, uh, and that's conservative. 
a example that I want to give you that I, I hope you can see that if you buy a truckload of cigarettes valued at three or thirty thousand dollars from Virginia and sell them in the street in Hartford, you can make well over three hundred thousand dollars, and it's quite profitable to criminal organizations. Prohibitions like this, the prohibition on flavors, have become the new face of organized crime, and they do fund gangs, they do fund terrorist groups, and they do fund high value targets. And I will give you examples because I, for one, have put handcuffs on these people. I have one supervised the investigations, and I, have, for one, have directed some of this stuff. It's not anecdotal information. I'm going to provide you with evidence. But some of these street corners around the country are making $5,000 a day selling Lucy cigarettes at $2 a piece. People that will support this prohibition are going to throw you all kinds of anecdotal information. I want to give you evidence here. What they will say that is correct is it's a criminal uh, epidemic that's getting bigger by the day. And it's an epidemic, all right. And there's many ways we can deal with it simply by looking at the flavors and the open source uh, machines that are selling to our kids. That's the problem here. And that's the issue where the kids are taking the marijuana and putting them in these devices and buying these bubblegum flavors and the stuff that's addressing to these children that's really quick that we can get rid of it in force rather than throwing the baby out of the bathwater here. Um, the current state of affairs in Connecticut is that the cops need to improve community relations. We've seen it all over the place. Um, we had a meeting with some people in the community last week where they talked about some of the social ills. The, the cops need to concentrate on crime, not on enforcement bans. And some the things that I wanna talk about is since like, I want to say 2000, or, uh, 1998, there's been zero dollars put towards the Tobacco Truth initiative, initiative towards education and training in Connecticut. Why is that, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, so many of these people today have talked about education and training, but as a state, you haven't put a cent in. And that's very, very important. We take, why should we take money out of other things and, and put it into this when we haven't done our due diligence? This 130 million dollars can be used for better training with police officers, citizens academies. Okay, excuse me, uh, you hit your three minutes if you could conclude your remarks. I'll conclude them very quickly. Mr. O'Flaherty talked about who, all these cases that haven't happened and I've given you examples where there are people that are doing these things. I ask on many of these occasions, when you get this anecdotal information, who have these people arrested? What have they done? And these videos that are out there, like the Massachusetts, it's insulting the police because those are crimes that are being videoed and you need to look at them because Massachusetts is a, a case where crime is increasing because of this. I'll answer any questions and uh, be happy to. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Representative Zupkin. Thank you. Thank you uh, for coming and staying so long. You mentioned about, and I was actually going to ask somebody prior, um, what I've heard tonight is that the children, kids that get caught with it will not be punished or anything, but I do believe it's going to create a bigger black market, which is what you were talking about. And I'm curious at what's going to happen to the sellers of that. So the, the kids smoking it might not get fined or, or what have you. But what are we going to do about the people that are selling it illegally? Well, you need to increase your laws and your penalties to those that are criminally trafficked. I mean, you need to set a threshold because that's where the problem exists, that they're put in the hands of these kids. And they're kids that are making $5,000 an afternoon selling Lucy's on the corner for $2 a piece. And again, not anecdotal, but evidence. It was a case in Chicago where an individual was shot and killed because he was controlling a corner, selling Lucy's with a nine millimeter in his waistband and got into a gunfight with police officers. These are real things that are happening. happening, And these are things that we jeopardize our children by allowing this type of criminal activity and not taking a hold of it and jumping on it. Um, the Latin Kings in New York in the projects have entire floors that are selling Lucy cigarettes. One floor sells cocaine, another sells heroin, another sells Lucy menthol cigarettes. If we don't do anything about these problems, it, it will grow and grow and grow. Specifically, when I was with ATF, we had cases where we, saw, where we were trading tobacco products 
for heroin and guns, which they were tithing Al Qaeda organizations overseas. This is going on right now. But when you have people from other organizations that want to try to put you in a position where, oh, it doesn't exist, it's not happening, uh, we don't want you to believe it. They never, I want to know who they put handcuffs on. Who have they locked up? Because I'm not trying to talk from a do doctor point of view. I'm not a person of medicine. I don't have a PhD, but what I do have is 20 years, 27 years of experience on this job of locking people up in this arena. And I can tell you it's the new face of organized crime. So, so what would you recommend? Because um, I, I believe you're right that we, and I mentioned this this morning, I think about um, Connecticut, we get all of this money from this tobacco settlement and we don't put it, it goes into our general fund. We do not put any money into educating on this. So briefly, how would you, what would be the best way to educate kids against vaping? I, I think we need to demonstrate to them the harms of these open systems. We need to demonstrate the harms of the counterfeit products that are going to be coming in after uh, the, uh, the bans. W when all this is going to be banned by the FDA, there's still going to be a counterfeit product coming in from overseas of the different flavors. But educate them on the dangers of it, the dangers of uh, the open systems, and explain to them that it's not just something to experiment with. It's something that can create lung damage and problems that can go on and on for a long time. If you infuse THC marijuana oil with Captain Crunch in an open system, the odds of a black lung disease are pretty, pretty high. Mm. It isn't, but it, a closed system that 